uh, which helps their growth, which helps them bring traction, and also gives them access to the market, which is around here. But being a real estate company, we sell space. The end model for us is that we are selling space. But the strength of our ecosystem has been recognized globally. Most of the companies that are coming over here are here because of the word of mouth that they hear from the experience and the growth that we have been able to help the entrepreneurs who are based over here. We've built an array of mentors, investors, mentors who are helping the companies advice, giving them advice and helping them grow, investors who are fueling the growth. And we've partnered with industry leaders at the same time who are continuously working with our members and giving them the inputs that they need. And we, are and we at our end are continuously forging those alliances as we progress and as the time goes. As of today, I, on behalf of Canary Wharf and Team 39, would like to welcome you all. And for those of you who are present here, any one of you looking at becoming tech entrepreneurs, which I'm sure that's exactly what you're evolving them into, you don't need to look beyond us. Or if you'd like to work with startups, you don't need to look beyond us. All the companies are based over here. Thank you, and enjoy the day, and have a nice day as it progresses. This is a, a really special moment for Code First Girls. In fact, we have not had the community together for almost two years. The last time we had the community together was at Twitter HQ. Uh, was, did anybody come to that event at Twitter? No. Oh, oh. I think I did. You think, <laughs> yeah. you, think you did? There's been so much COVID, you can't yeah. remember whether you came to an event. Or it just wasn't that memorable, one of the two. I think COVID, I think. You think COVID? Yeah. All right, it's been a really, really special year, um, special couple of years, very, very challenging. Um, but Code First Girls has just gone through an exceptional period of growth um, over the past two years. Uh, EdTech has in general, but I just wanted to, to make a couple of comments about the sheer scale of what Code First Girls has achieved in the past 18 months. We've really accelerated uh, the amount of learning we are delivering. We are also accelerating uh, the extent to which we're connecting those uh, women to jobs as well. Um, we have taught more women in a single year than we have in uh, Code First Girls' entire previous existence. So that's what we've done this year. And we've made more jobs this year than Code First Girls has in its whole existence previously. And uh, at the end of today, we're going to have an award ceremony and a nano degree uh, ceremony where the women are going to be called out and recognized for their achievements. Uh, many of these women have been placed into jobs. So a lot of what we're doing in the wake of COVID is trying to educate women in order to give them a fair advantage to get them into the work. So uh, without further ado, we're going to introduce our lead sponsor for today, uh, which is a vast Amazing, and I'd like to welcome on stage Emma Nola, who is the People Director at Avast. Yep. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, good morning everyone. It's great to be here at CodeFest, um, and I'm delighted to be here uh, as the representative for Avast. Um, as uh, Anna said, my name's Emma and I'm the VP for People and Culture within our organisation and I'm based here at our offices in London. I've been with Avast for just over 12 months um, and actually uh, it's incredible to say that last week I met my boss and my team for the first time. So it's been a crazy uh, introduction into the virtual world of uh, cyber security for me but a brilliant opportunity to meet the team last week. Previous to Avast, um, I spent seven years of my career working in a very different organisation, EasyJet, um, where again I, I held a number of different roles within the HR department. And while they're very different organisations, one of the challenges that they have in common is the ability to attract female talent into male dominated careers. In an airline, about um, uh, the, the role of a pilot is uh, dominated by men. In fact, I'm sure many of you have seen Top Gun um, and understand the stereotype that I'm talking about, which kind of tends to attract men and maybe put other women off. 
it's a crazy statistic that only 5% of the world's pilots are female. So um, I was very lucky to lead uh, an initiative at EasyJet called the Amy Johnson Initiative. And over the course of five years, we were able to step change our new entrant pilot intake from about 3% to 20% of our new entrant pilots being female by 2019. And that was an incredible achievement. So when I left EasyJet, I knew that I wanted to work for another organisation who placed the same level of importance and the same level of commitment and the same ambition towards changing uh, the representation of women in critical business roles. And that's exactly why I decided to join Avast um, and exactly why I'm here talking to you today. So let me tell you a little bit more about who Avast are because you may not uh, know anything about, you know, might have heard of us but you might not know what we do. So Avast is a FTSE 100 cyber security software business. And actually, we're one of uh, only a small number of tech stocks uh, on the London Stock Exchange. We provide over 435 million customers globally with next generation cyber security and privacy products, which help to keep their online experiences protected from cyber threats, or as we like to say it at Avast, to help our users beat the bad guys. It's our mission and our purpose to create a world that provides online safety and privacy for everyone. And this continues to be our strategic purpose and is even more relevant in a world where so much more of our time is spent online. As a result of this change in behaviour, the threat landscape which we operate within has continued to expand. And in 2020, on average, we blocked over 1.5 billion cyber attacks each month to protect our customers, which I just think is an incredible statistic. So how do we do it? Our security engine uses a combination of behavioral detection, cloud-based machine learning, and signature-based detection to drive best-in-class protection for our customers. Our brilliant threat intelligence teams can detect previously unknown viruses and malware as well as new variants of known viruses and malware that has been undetectable with normal definitions of virus signatures. We safeguard our customers' data, we protect their identity and their privacy and their digital relationships with the, with the organisations that they choose to visit online. And when we have sophisticated products that are engaging and easy to use whether they're on their desktop or their laptop or they're on a mobile phone or a tablet. Our role is to protect digital freedom and make the online world a safer place, protecting and enhancing our customers' experiences and giving them the confidence to enjoy the digital world. So let's talk about some hard-hitting but real examples of uh, the threat landscape that I've just been describing to you. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, that landscape significantly changed over the course of the pandemic. So let me start with a quiz. So after we locked down in 2020, what percentage increase in spyware and stalkerware do you think that we detected globally? So what percentage change do we think we saw? Any testers? Freddie, I'm gonna to come to you. Beat me to it, 200%. Uh, 200%. 200%. Any other takers? That's a good start bold. 1,000%. 1,000%. We can come back to that. Does Zoom count? <laughs> well, yeah, hi guys on Zoom. I forgot you were there. Uh, in fact, it was 55%, right? So actually, <laughs> well, well done. Well done. I'm proud of you. You can have a, an advanced something. We will find you something. So actually, uh, you know, if you think about that, right, a 55% increase in stalkerware over the course of just a couple of months. And actually, that's pretty frightening when you consider how unpleasant and dangerous stalkerware can be. It's often advertised as a way of monitoring where your kids are, um, or maybe um, employees or your loved ones to find out where they are so you can keep track of them. But the reality is that these kinds of software 
are actually often downloaded onto the victim's phone by jealous spouses, abusive ex-partners or so-called friends. So one of the very sad things that happened during the lockdown was the increase in domestic abuse uh, which occurred. And Refuge, uh, which provides specialist support for women and children experiencing domestic abuse, requested that calls uh, let us know that report, reports to their helpline had actually increased by two thirds in the first three months of the lockdown. And in fact, the visits to their website has increased by almost a thousand percent. Okay. And actually many of those reported issues relating to an increase in stalking during that period. In another example, more than one in five children in the UK admitted to having bad experiences online during the lockdown, with 72% of them receiving unkind or unsolicited or inappropriate content, and 71% of them receiving unwanted content from a stranger. We've also seen campaigns taking advantage of our increased use of web calls and Zoom that try to blackmail people into saying that they have been filmed watching adult content via their webcam. These types of issues are really frightening and we're exposed to them all. And they may have happened to someone who you know, they may even have happened to you. Cyber threats are all around us and perhaps they're not immediately obvious. So to analyze these threats targeting our customers, we need a diverse organization who understand the kinds of issues we're confronted with in today's disrupted world. So in cybersecurity, like in any other space and like in aviation, having a diverse talent pool in an organization is essential for obvious reasons. Our customers are diverse. They have different needs and requirements. We protect people of all genders, nationalities, young and old. The types of threat our customers experience are different, however. A guy sitting in a Starbucks working, or someone out here uh, on level 39. An elderly lady using internet banking. Your kid, or my kid, or my little sister using YouTube a small business owner using online, um, going on to online retailing for the first time. To understand the needs of our users, how they're attacked, and how they want to protect themselves, we need different perspectives. And so that's why, at Avast, we look to support talent that has traditionally not always had the help that they need to begin their career in STEM. We want to create a company full of many different people who are able to solve many different problems in many different ways. So we partner with organizations and professional networks around the globe, such as Codeverse Girls, so that curious minds from all backgrounds Fifteen percent uh, of our technology of Astian population is women. That's actually an increase this year of about three percent across both of those communities. So that's progress, but clearly there's significantly more that we need to do. So how are we trying to make change happen at EasyJet <laughs> at Avast? 
I don't know where I am. It's been a pandemic. Uh, so, so how are we trying to make change happen at Avast? Well, firstly, by days like today, okay? So we're here because this is something that we truly believe is important. And yet we've got some vacancies to talk to you about today, but actually what we're interested in is just helping to attract more women and girls into cybersecurity in general and helping to people un understand what amazing careers exist within our industry. We run many different internal awareness campaigns uh, and they're always great fun, but we will always get behind things like International Women's Day or Pride Month, for example. We offer many different learning and development paths, uh, including self-paced online learning uh, through our uh, online development portals, as well as facilitated learning and development, uh, particularly for our leadership and management populations to help to increase their awareness of uh, cultural issues, particularly within a global organisation such as our own. We're incredibly flexible and we support employees of all, at all stages of their lives and their careers, including parents going on to maternity leave or returning from, per from parental leave. I'm very, very happy that we have amazing benefits such as unlimited personal time off, flexible working relationships, work from anywhere contracts, um, and in our offices, uh, in some of our larger offices, we offer childcare, entertainment for the kids, and even coding courses for our Avastian children. And of course, we have many different employee resource groups at Avast, such as the Rainbow Alliance, Women at Avast, and Asians at Avast. And we make sure that they have the opportunity to voice their concerns and their, their observations uh, and the opportunities that they see within our organization with their executive sponsors. And last but not least, we put diversity at the heart of everything that we do. And we're committed to making sure that all of our people-related um, people programs have diversity at the core. But needless to say, there is still a huge gap in the industry. And that's why it's so amazing to see all of you here today and how amazing it is to hear about the stats that Anna said to talked about earlier in terms of bringing more uh, women into the technology industry. So I'm just going to move on to my final slide. Here we go. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hang on, let me go back. Um, so I've got some really good pieces of advice here for you from some of our existing Avastians who work within the organisation. Um, so I won't read it all, but um, there's some advice from Radka. I asked them, you know, what advice would you give to the, the, the people who are attending today? And she said, don't be afraid to ask. It's really important as it helps a lot. And there are usually so many people who are happy to help. Janine, who is here today, and I know he's going to be talking to you later, talked about it's all about progress over perfection. Take it one incremental step at a time. And Elnaz, do what you love and don't let others label you with stereotypes. And stereotypes are such an important thing for us to change. So uh, let me leave you with my advice. Um, at Avast, we talk a lot about the concept of growth mindset. It's, it's, and that's about constantly looking for opportunities to learn and not being afraid to fail. That's been a rule that I've tried to live my whole career. I also heard about some great advice once. Seek opportunities where you can do your best work and where your best work is important for those who you work for. Having the opportunity to drive DNI uh, in the organisations I've worked for has brought both of those things together for me and particularly Avast. So with that in mind, I hope I've been able to share with you how important the role of a software engineer is for us here at Avast and the critical role they play in ensuring that we protect digital freedom for everyone. And I hope I've been able to describe just why it's so important that people such as you are joining organisations today to bring different perspectives to the issues that we're facing in our incredibly disruptive world. If you're interested in hearing more about opportunities at Avast, I know Janine's going to be talking to you later, and I'm sure you'll have some brilliant questions for her. And Olivia, uh, who's one of my colleagues, is going to be manning our stand today if you're interested in finding about the opportunities that we have or in sharing your details with us. So um, I do hope that one day uh, we meet and that you join our organisation. 
But if we don't and you decide to work elsewhere, I hope that I've given you some ideas about things you might want to ask other organisations about their culture and about whether or not that would be right for you. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And I hope that you have a wonderful day here at CodeFest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. Um, and testament to that, um, Avast have got a number of graduates here today uh, from the nano degree. So the amount of active work that's taking place with Avast at the moment is really, really meaningful in terms of getting the Code First Girls community into jobs. Um, our next guest today, uh, you've got a real treat. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome on stage uh, a gentleman that clearly I coordinated outfits with this morning. Um, <laughs> Mr. Freddie DeCiba from uh, Revmo. Freddie, would you like to come up on st stage? Clearly, Anna did it better. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Super. Liberty. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anna, uh, and thank you very much to all of you for giving me a little bit of your attention today um, for something I am slightly unreasonably passionate about, data. So we're going to talk a little bit about storytelling with data, but first, I'd like to tell you a little bit, uh, a little story about the least interesting thing you're going to hear about today, <laughs> me. Um, I spent 13 years at Goldman Sachs, where I did a number of jobs, uh, the last of which was in our investment banking division, uh, where uh, we ran a small team of data scientists and software engineers to make the act and art of connecting people, uh, connecting our bankers to our clients, connecting our clients to each other, connecting people into companies that much more efficient and effective. When you're listening to what I have to say today uh, and trying to put me in a box, I realize that might be rather difficult. So let me just give you a nudge in the right direction. I'm a, first and foremost a software engineer. Um, I am also a, a data analyst, a data visualizer, a data scientist. And I am an apprentice CEO. Um, when uh, we heard, you know, ask uh, fr from Emma, you know, ask, don't be afraid. Uh, let me tell you that uh, it's definitely progress over perfection. Um, day one of incorporating the company, I knew very little about how to run a company. Um, and it's through your partnerships, it's through mentors, it's through uh, people who've been along the way that you learn how this works. Enough about me. Let's talk about data. What I want, what I want to leave you with today as we go through this presentation is that data visualization, data storytelling, is a superpower. It will supercharge whatever it is you do, and it's not hard. The fundamental takeaway is that clarity above all will make you an exceptionally powerful data visualizer. OK, so let's dig into uh, a little bit of proof. I don't mean this kind of proof. Don't worry, this is not a math class. But let's talk about a hypothetical example. We run a little software company, and we're pretty convinced that our app is getting more popular. That's a good thing. That means we can go out, we can hire more people, we can raise capital, um, we can eventually realize our dreams of being a unicorn. But how much more popular? Well, so we went and we looked at our web logs and we saw that le uh, last week we had 100 users. This week we have 119 users and 19% improvement. That sounds like a lot. But there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, the app has been in service for nine months. So um, is 100 reasonable? Um, are the periods that I've compared last week to this week really useful? I've talked about a, a metric called WAU, weekly active users. I showed that, didn't explain it. What does it really mean? Um, what's the trajectory? Was this a blip? Is this part of a gradual increase? Are we even measuring the right thing? Weekly active users, are they active? Are they using the app? Um, uh, do they come on, come off? Uh, do they come back week after week? Are we giving them something that is a compelling reason to continue using our platform? Um, what does active mean? Did they log in? Did they do whatever it is our app does? Did they engage with it for more than five minutes? Active um, is, a, is a term we probably ought to define. Um, okay, so we improved 19%, but is that because people were just at home because it's a 
um, uh, it's a bank holiday weekend or a school weekend and they're using the app, or is this part of a larger secular trend? You'll often hear people talk about secular trends, and that means absent seasonality, absent um, any other thing, just on its own steam, this is moving ahead. So let's make a small step towards a better answer. The number of unique users is actually growing 5% per week over the last nine months, which um, because that weekly uh, effort holds, we're growing 12 and a half times. I don't know about you, but a 19% change in one week is a little bit less compelling than our app is 12 times more popular than when, this, um, uh, than when we started uh, gathering some statistics. And on top of that, engagement's improving. Okay, but you throw enough percentages and enough numbers at people, and you lose their attention. Why? Because there's only so much we can hold in the stack that is our minds. So what do we do to get around that? We visualize. But I want to take a little diversion and talk about average. We hear average in many contexts. He's an average person. She's an average coder. The average user um, is on our site for 35 minutes. But average can be grossly misleading. There are a lot of different kinds of averages. And don't worry, I'm not going to take you on a painstaking course through each one of these. But if you talk to somebody about average, you're going to, uh, you're going to get at least one of these bubbles popping up in at least one of your audience members' minds. And talk, uh, you might be really smart and say, ah, yeah, but I've told you how much it varies. I've given you the standard deviation. Um, summary statistics can hide a lot of complexity in data. So these four data sets, which among we real data geeks are called Anscombe's Quartet, illustrate four data sets with the same mean, that is, uh, the, uh, the, amount, the sum of the amount of things divided by the number of things, the median, um, of all of the things in my data set, the one of the middle size, and mode, the most frequently occurring um, uh, data piece. And when we look at, uh, so if we were to look at these four data sets and we looked just at their averages and the standard deviation, i.e. how much do points vary on average, um, they'd be exactly the same. As human beings, when we look at this, we say these are four really different things. Um, uh, they all have the same trend line, they all have uh, the same statistics, and yet we can perceive that they're fundamentally different. This leads into, draw some pictures. So when you're encoding data, um, when you're drawing your pictures, you've got a number of tools, and we're going to step through each one of these to talk about how you can use them. You've got lots of different charts you can use. Um, the, the famous uh, and ubiquitous bar chart uh, or, its rotated uh, or its rotated cousin, the column chart. Uh, you've got a line, especially where time is involved, uh, or you've got lots and lots of measurements. Line charts are useful. A tree map. I've got lots of categories, and if I drew it all in bar charts, um, you'd lose the wood for the trees. A scatter. I've got some measurements, and I want to see if they're correlated. Um, a map. I have something to do with geography, number of uh, 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 where are my users coming from. A network graph, and we're going to uh, come back to network graphs because it's, uh, it's particularly close to our heart at Revmo. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have spent a little time as a business analyst, I'm going to throw some serious shade on pie charts. And then I'm going to justify it. So before we go into some practical examples, here are some things. Uh, when I talked about clear communication, here are some attributes of good vis visualization. One, perspective is everything. What do I mean with that? What are you trying to convey to somebody? And does your message shine through? A good visualization, it's, it has two objectives. One is to convince somebody of a fact or a hypothesis that you're putting forward. And the second, and arguably the more important one, and if I were to be really honest about my job description over, oh, the last 10 years, it was really this, generate more follow-up questions. Um, and then the third, uh, uh, you know, I, I harped a little bit on clarity. Um, label well, label often. Um, the axes should be clear, the labels should be clear, it should be really easy and take all, if you think about like your cognitive budget, how much brain space can you take with people? 
deciphering what your chart says should be as close to zero as humanly possible. Asking questions should take up as much of it as possible. So now we're going to do a little before and after. Um, here's a chart from my hypothetical app where I've charted two things. Um, I've charted the number of hits to my website and number of weekly active users. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't take a lot away from this. Um, would somebody, apart from the f small font size, which is entirely my fault, would somebody like to just throw out an opinion of, of what's wrong with this? Shout it out and I'll repeat it for our friends on the internet. You can barely see it. You're exactly right. You cannot see the weekly active users. Because my number of users is order of magnitude between 10, 100, um, and my number of hits is in the tens of thousands, I pretty much can't see it unless I break out my magnifying glass and go full Sherlock Holmes. That's absolutely right. There are a number of, uh, a number of other issues here. Um, one, I've got date there, but I have to think about what I'm showing. To those of you in like the back third of the room, that's going to look like blurry text. I don't care if you've got 2012 vision. Uh, there's no way you can read that. My labels are non-existent um, and a few other problems. So I, uh, I do my uh, Clark Kent. I jump into the phone booth, and I become a data, uh, a data superhero. Now, the fonts are still small, but a few things are going to pop here. First of all, I've labeled at the bottom. I don't think I have a fancy little laser pointer. So. I've, uh, I've labeled at the bottom the year we're talking about. Now it's relatively easy to see that we're talking about 2020 um, and that we span most of the year. Second, I've split the axes. Um, I've got my weekly average users on the left side. That's the thing I really care about. Um, I also made the line more visible um, than uh, my number of hits. Um, and I've put the hits and I've made it, uh, and I've done it in thousands uh, on the right. Um, I've told you exactly what I'm trying to convey. Uh, what is the user engagement for my app? Um, also, it's a line chart instead of a bar chart because uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to read a line that moves a little bit rather than 52 independent measurements. My brain just doesn't have to work as hard, and neither does yours. So we've labeled. Um, we've uh, encoded with color that we're talking about different things. Um, we've, uh, we've made our axes a little bit more sensible. We've made some inroads. I can now tell you that my app is getting more popular. And I can answer the follow-up questions. How much? How long? Is it persisting? Is it correlated to the number of hits? Um, and we can have a really productive discussion about how to turn my app into a unicorn. Let's look at another one. I have to point it the right way. <laughs> there we go. Um, so here I have an imaginary factory. Widgets, I make widgets, sprockets, and gears, and I'm looking at the number of units I've sold over the last year. Now, I remembered to uh, put my year down at the bottom because we're really only talking about one year, um, and I've labeled my axis. Surely, I'm a superhero now. Um, anyone want to venture uh, some things we could improve here? It's quite narrow. Yeah, it's hard to read. Um, my brain has to work really hard to figure out, um, gee, are we selling more sprockets than gears? Um, how much is that changing over time? I can just about make out that the blue line, which I go and I look and I see as widgets, that looks pretty regular and everything else is pretty volatile. Uh, a little behind the curtain secret, uh, that's because uh, I made widgets a fairly regular series and then put a random number generator in for the other two. Um, OK, so now let's look at how we could do this differently. And I've shown two different views depending on what you want to show. So we've, we've jumped out of our uh, Superman phone booth, and we've got two really useful charts. The first shows that I'm selling more stuff. So on, uh, yeah, on the left, uh, I'm selling more stuff. And now I see really clearly that widgets is growing regularly, and the other two are growing irregularly. But sometimes you want to know, how much uh, of, of my sales is driven by sprockets rather than gears? And so uh, the chart on the right doesn't show you that you're growing, but it shows how the proportion changes over time. Um, additionally, we've rotated the date axis so that we stand at least a sporting chance of being able to read it, um, as well as, um, uh, let's see, what else did we do here? Uh, a, a more clear labeling of the title. 
Okay, so I've shown you just two things, two examples of simplifying your data to get your message across. Now there are some things that are gonna get you. Back in the first chart we looked at, we were comparing two things of vastly different size, um, order of tens of thousands and orders of hundreds. And sometimes, right, when you're, especially when you're talking about sales or money or millions of hits, you're gonna fluctuate million, uh, by, by orders of magnitude, um, week on week, month on month, year on year, whatever you're looking at. And so sometimes the magnitude of what you're looking at um, will change and you should look at how you scale your axes. Now I've got two warnings for you. These are the kryptonite of every data superhero. Um, when you're looking at a trend and trying to th think what will happen next, until you ask the question, why? The past does not predict the future. So just because we sold 1,000 sprockets last week, 500 sprockets the week before, does not mean we're gonna, uh, uh, we're gonna sell 1,500 next week. Um, until you understand what's driving the processes you're exploring, it gets really hard to predict the future. Not impossible, um, and when you do it, you should have an, understand, an understanding of how wrong you are. One of my heroes, a great physicist turned Wall Street, turned disgusted with Wall Street and went back to physics, um, uh, uh, Emmanuel uh, said, all models are wrong, some models are useful. At best, any forecasting you do will be directionally correct. Um, that is to say, you'll probably guess whether things will go up or down, but you should know how wrong you're gonna be on the magnitude. The second cautionary tale is that correlation is not causation. Um, if, for example, we were to look at the volume of bow ties sold on German Street and the number of attendees at, Code, at CodeFest year on year, you might see that they trend in the same direction. It would take a real leap of the imagination to suggest um, that those two, th that, that uh, CodeFest is driving bow tie sales. I'd like to think that it would. It's probably not the case. Okay, earlier you ho heard me throw some shade on pie charts. I have an aversion to pie charts matched only, as my friends know, to my aversion to cheese. Uh, really odd for a, a half Frenchman not to like cheese, but um, yeah. Um, all right, time to back it up. Anna will probably conduct a survey uh, after this uh, conference, and one of the things she'll say is, um, you know, what do you think of the speaker series? Um, uh, or she might even, because uh, she really wants to humble me a little, say, what do you think of Freddie's talk? Um, and let's say it's a free text box as it comes in, or there's a little slider, you know, yes to no. If I get this as a pie chart, right, I've got a lot of different categories, um, and the coloring, uh, you know, so excited. The most amped and excited have the most neutral colors, but most of all, there are many categories, and here's the one reason why pie charts suck. The human eye has to work really hard to interpret angles. So if you're looking at one or two or three, uh, three different categories, well, not one, because that would just be a circle, um, two or three categories, uh, and they are quite different from one another, your eye doesn't have to work very hard. The more categories and the more fine the distinction between the angles, the harder your brain has to work, which means the less time it spends thinking about follow-up questions, which is the most important part of any data conversation. Okay, so if we took that and we said, um, let's group it by, uh, let's group it by, uh, well, let's show the same categories and color it by the, the quality of the reaction, blue being really positive, green and brown being various kinds of neutral, and red, clearly, um, uh, I didn't uh, please, I won't have pleased everybody. But we could simplify that yet further and say 65% of the, of, of the audience reaction was positive, which I think qualifies for at least an upper second in this country. Um, uh, Twenty-five percent were neutral. This wasn't a total waste of their time, but they're not going to go out and do uh, and be the next superhero, uh, Lois Lane. Um, uh, and ten percent were negative because uh, who the hell does he think he is wearing a bow tie? So, if you remember nothing else from this talk, what I'd like you to take away. So, one of my favorite stories um, uh, to read to various nieces, nephews, godchildren, and indeed to myself when I'm in a childlike moment is Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's uh, The Little Prince. 
that author said, perfection is achieved when there is nothing more to add, not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Your best friend as a data analyst is the delete button. Um, visualization is an iterative process. Viz early, viz often. Um, get familiar enough with your tools that they feel like an extension of you, and your data will move at the same speed of your mind, which for each and every person in this room is lightning bloody fast. And then the third, of course, is 3D char uh, pie charts are strictly useful for bamboozling the audience. Um, so uh, with that, I'm just going to take 30, less than 30 seconds to tell you about Revmo. Um, Revmo uh, is the startup I left Goldman Sachs to co-found with my uh, co-founder, Ben, who is up at an ungodly hour in New York watching this talk, probably burying his face in my hands, um, and in which my number two, Margot, who's uh, 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 right in the front row, um, I think recording a little bit of this for posterity, oh God, um, uh, came together to, to create. So what do we do? We make it really simple. Um, to connect with the people you want to connect through your network. What does that mean? I know Margot, Margot knows Anna, Revmo can make that happen. We do graph data science, we do um, data visualization, we have a stack in uh, Python, uh, we, we do uh, a lot of really cool data analysis. So if you're passionate about data, if you want to see something happen, come and work at Revmo, revmo.app slash dataviz. I think with that, I'm probably way over my time budget. Um, so please, question and answer on, uh, I'll take any questions, and then Anna's got her hook ready, probably to kick me off the stage. No, no, not yet. <laughs> Freddie, everyone, let's give Freddie a big clap. <laughs> Freddie, we're gonna take some questions. We're gonna have questions from the audience, and we're also gonna have questions from YouTube and social as well. Amazing, with the power of technology, we're gonna beam them into the room. All right, who's first? Did I start with software engineering or did I start with data visualization? Uh, strictly speaking, neither. Um, I was uh, really, if you were gonna put me in any category, uh, fascinated by computer hardware and computer networks. Um, that led to information security and it was in trying to summarize the complexity of information security uh, that uh, I learned about data visualization and began to use it. Uh, now, while I wrote some code in information security land, um, I wouldn't have passed my own job interview as a software engineer. At best, we were doing a little scripting and data massaging. Um, so I'd say, don't worry about where you start. It's much more about where you want to go. Any more questions? Okay, so is and it just... And do you like pies as well, Freddie? <laughs> so uh, let me answer the most important question first. Yes, I love pies, but sweet <laughs> and savory. Um, uh, so is it 3D pie charts or is it everything? Um, uh, and then what do I think about tree charts? Was that right? Tree maps. So, so um, and what's my favorite? Um, look, I've, I've made a rather stark claim and, uh, uh, and I seem to be pretty dogmatic about it. The truth is, if you're showing a small number of categories where n is less than or equal to approximately four, there's no reason you can't use a pie chart. It's just for extra confusion um, because depending on the way you rotate it, um, you can make 43% of, uh, uh, of a category look like nearly 75%. Uh, so a plain pie chart is better than a 3D pie chart, but there are other great options. Sometimes a pie chart is the right tool, but that's rarer than I think we all think. What do I think of tree maps? So tree maps, uh, I had one earlier, but I didn't use it in an example, is where you draw a chart that's usually a rectangle or a square that has lots of squares inside of it. Um, well used, they're fantastic. They're a great way to show hierarchy. Um, what does that mean? Uh, if uh, I sell um, cars, and I sell cars and car parts, there's usually a natural hierarchy, like um, sports cars versus trucks versus small cars, and then inside of that I might have individual models. So where you've got some structure and you want to show, you want to give people intuition 
about the structure and its relative size, tree charts can be really useful. Um, what's my favorite kind? Um, probably a network graph, but that's obviously me talking my book. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Oh, wow. Fantastic. <laughs> I've either really irritated some of you or, um, so Anna, with your permission, we're going to go from the back and work yeah, our way up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, column, uh, second column in in the back. So you're gonna have to shout. Shout! I'll hear you and repeat the question. Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, I just said it was a great talk. I'm also a data visualization developer, so really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to know more about diversi diversity and inclusion at Revmo, if you could expand on that, please. Um, that's a great question. Um, so how would I answer that? Um, I'd say look at, look at our workforce. Um, uh, half, one less than half of our software developers are women. Um, thank you, Anna, by the way, uh, both through the graduates and the extended Code First Girls Network. Um, we're very lucky to have you. Um, uh, so look at our numbers for where our aims, principles, and values are. Um, what do I think about it, having come from both uh, a large corporate world um, uh, and also being in a young startup? Um, diversity of perspective, diversity of work style, diversity of aims and goals are the most valuable thing a company of any size can have. I want to you know, echo Emma's statements. At a small startup, um, and, and many startups fall short here because we're running around trying to build a product that's like one third built and get it out to market and ship software. That's no excuse. Um, uh, so we, we live by this, the same principles. Um, what matters more than anything this is in our screening, this is in any company, is your drive, your intellectual curiosity, and your ability to work in a team. It doesn't matter if it's a two-person consulting company or a 20,000-person bank. Those three things, um, we can't teach you. You have to come with them. Um, and beyond that, anything that helps broaden the, uh, the, the pool of talent is fantastic for us because selfishly, as a founder, the more great people we can hire and the quicker we can bring them onto the team, the more we can do as a company, the more we can do together. Um, uh, I think that's all, I hope that's a, a real answer and that's a candid answer. Um, so yes, like any decent company, um, you know, we, we certainly don't do any of the things you shouldn't do. We also take active steps. Um, to make sure that we've got the best and broadest personalities. We've got a humanities, a physics, a business person. We've got people who didn't go to university, people who are much more educated than me, um, though that's not terribly difficult. Um, um, so yeah, I, I would just say in, in all kinds of diversity, um, really think broadly and think about what you're trying to achieve. I think we have one, question for, one more question from the audience, then we'll take some from social. Oh, oh uh, you're the boss. I feel like I'm picking people. This is. Can you stay during the break? Of course, I'm going to be here. I'll, I'll be here. Got somewhat of a fan base here, and we're not going to be able to get through uh, everyone. I'll be here all day. Uh, la <laughs> that lady there. Thank you for picking me. You're um, what was the gap in the market, and why did? Because you said you left Goldman Sachs, and that's a massive institution. What was the gap that you felt? It, that you it really is, had? and I had a great time there, where I did a number of different jobs and worked with some truly brilliant people. Um, the gap in the market, um, both internally. For, for my former employer um, and out in the broader market is every professional networking tool has been aimed at turning eyeballs into money. Um, and what do I mean with that? Um, privacy doesn't matter. Quality of connection doesn't matter. Um, uh, and, and internally, nobody wants to give up their contacts because none of the systems um, that, you could, that you find anywhere are um, uh, uh, are remotely secure enough for people who, for whom their contacts are the most precious uh, asset they can find. Um, so we, uh, so within a large enterprise, the the difficulty was uh, building it and adopting the right tools. In the broader market, um, uh, the gap was there was nothing aimed at 
professionals. We're going to take one from social now. I've just been told we have got time for one more question from the audience. So one from social. Yep, so we've got Sally Hughes saying agree. Pie charts suck. Uh, love to know more about why you took the jump to launch your own startup. Um, okay, so this uh, delves slightly into the realm of the personal, but um, uh, I would say for me, Sally, uh, and for the rest of you, uh, it came down to um, having an idea, having a team, somebody I could partner up with, um, uh, somebody I could partner up with and, and get into the trenches with. Um, and then on a much more personal level, um, I hit you know, mid-30s, single, solvent, and sane, uh, and figured that those three were not likely to, to co-occur. So if I was ever going to tap into natural risk appetite, that this was going to be the time to do it. I've experienced that. Um, <laughs> anyone, anyone else from the audience? Yes, let, lady straight up. Uh. Um, so you've talked about how data visualization is choosing what data you put in a particular format and you're presenting it to people. How do you kind of reconcile that with having to choose what data is important and why? And does that kind of transfer that role into data analysis? And kind of how do you do that all together? Tough question. Mm. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to answer the last question first, last in, first out. Um, yes, it's deeply intertwined with data analysis. How do you choose what to show? I'd love to just chicken out and say it depends. Um, but I think about um, I think about what additional data sets, what additional columns um, really convey a, a clear message that the data say to you. One of the great traps you can fall into um, as a data analyst and as a data visualizer is, um, we think things are growing, make me a chart that shows that. Um, and then you turn around and the data don't show that. Uh, in fact, um, uh, accounting for all factors, you're flatlining. Um, and uh, you're all of a sudden in a position where the data don't agree with what you're saying. And the first thing I do is make sure that you're using the right assumptions and that you've really looked at the data from every angle. And the second thing is, um, of course, you can selectively fil filter and torture data until it tells you what, what you want it to tell you, but don't. There's no code of pra practice in this. There's no code of ethics, but even Superman, um, had some things he wouldn't do. Um, even Lewis Lane had some things she wouldn't tolerate. Um, and I'd say that in clearly communicating results, you want to be as authentic and as truthful as you possibly can. Um, but yeah, how do you know what to include? Um, I'd start with this fundamental question, does this make it, um, I, does this make my conclusion clearer or less clear? Um, and go from there. Take one for social. Yep, so we've got one from Renee. She says, does Revmo offer positions to British citizens who want to work remotely? So, remote work. Interesting topic, and I'm definitely now out over my skis. Um, in theory, it's great. Um, it's really hard when a company is young and still defining its vision. So the answer is a very, very, very qualified yes. Um, uh, in that if you're already an expert at what you do and it's just a matter of folding you into the team, it works super well. I'd love to be like totally pandemic and say that um, we'll hire anyone who wants to work anywhere and it's gonna work perfectly. The truth is um, real remote work is new outside of consulting. Um, and when your business is new too, um, you keep one foot on the ground. So. While we're absolutely flexible about people, uh, you know, most of our employees work three or four days a week in the office, it's really hard for a young startup to take on people who um, have a lot to offer but aren't there um, day to day. As the tooling improves, as cultures grow, that maybe becomes easier, but it's really hard for us right now. Freddie, everyone, I, th I think we've reached hook. time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and, and Freddie, you're going to be staying for the break? Yes. Amazing. So if you've got any more questions, which I feel like there was a lot of questions, particularly at the back, uh, which is fantastic, I'm sure mainly about pies, please uh, approach Freddie in the break, uh, which is coming up soon. 
Um, so next, we are going to be introducing our hackathon. Oh, wow, look at the number of people entering the room. <laughs> I feel like everyone's, everyone's been outside. Now they're coming in. Lovely. Um, so we have a hackathon. And this year, our hackathon is about hacking your carbon footprint. Uh, and it's sponsored by Beasley. Now, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a hackathon. Um, I've seen a lot of comments on social where people are like, oh, why should I get involved in a hackathon? What's the point of it all? Um, even worse, I've seen so some comments saying, oh, they're just there to kind of steal all my great ideas. Well, the <laughs> I saw a laugh in the audience there. Um, the hackathon that we uh, had last year, we had a big data challenge. Uh, and that was with R2 Data Labs, sorry, R Squared Data Labs, Rolls Royce, and the Emergent Alliance. Um, and massive levels of data sets were analyzed by the women involved um, in that big data challenge. Um, and what they discovered <coughs> through that challenge was actually so groundbreaking, uh, it was even published by the likes of the Emergent Alliance. So, the ideas and uh, what, what, you know, what was, was thought out was absolutely un unbelievable. And what the women discovered, the winning team, what they essentially discovered is that we consume far less energy working from home than we do at the office. So when people say, what's the point of these hackathons? You, know, you can actually uh, stumble on something that's actually quite amazing. It gets you noticed. It does give you some level of notoriety. And on top of that, the level of teamwork involved is absolutely fantastic. So the, all the Code First Girls team here, when they put hackathon teams together, what they're doing is they're sifting you to blend your skill sets. So we do sift in front-end engineers, back-end engineers, people interested in data, people interested in product, sometimes even people interested in brand. We would do exactly the same as we, if we were going to create a startup. So what we're doing here is we're bringing to get you together as a team we're getting you to work as a team to come up with something brilliant. And what you're doing there is quite unique, and it's unlike any other job interview in some senses, because you're collaborating with each other in a real-world environment to actually apply your skills to a real-world issue. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today, and that is my argument for hackathons. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our sponsor for today, which is uh, Beasley. So Beasley have a very ambitious target to cutting their carbon footprint by 50% in uh, 2023. And with this new culture of hybrid working, which you know, did really dominate a lot of our discussions yesterday on day one, uh, Beasley are challenging the Code First Girls community to build a product, app or website that will empower employees uh, and freelancers to slash their carbon footprint. So this is quite a challenge that Beasley is laying down at the community of uh, Code First Girls. So what could your projects focus on? Um, so I've got a couple of examples down here. You can look at something like carbon accounting offsets. Uh, you, look, you could look at how to raise awareness. You could look at transportation or even potentially education and how we can educate people more about cutting their carbon footprint. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce the representative from Beasley, uh, Chris Illman, who was head of responsible business. Chris. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Good stuff. I'm delighted to be here. I think it's my first in-person event in about 18 months, so it's nice to see a room of faces as opposed to just a blank screen. Uh, ahead of me and uh, a small person in the corner of my, my screen at home. So in terms of Beasley, I've put the challenge statement right at the end, but I wanted to provide a bit of context for what we do. We're an insurance company, first and foremost, and we, we are based in the London market, which gives us huge opportunity for collaboration. Let's just try and slip back to it. There we go. So we've got a broad range of products, everything from property to cyber, and the important thing about an insurance company is we not only provide insurance products, but we also invest a lot of our premiums into other areas. So we've got our own, um, as part of our responsible business strategy, which I'll go on to talk about in a minute, we've got our own res um, responsible investment strategy, which looks to promote 
um, startups, looks at promoting good performing businesses from a, an environmental, a social and a governance perspective, and looks to essentially to, to encourage collaboration and to aid everyone in the challenge to, to address some of the fundamental issues that are, not address, that are issues not just for an insurance company, but also for the, the wider global economy uh, and individuals such as myself and, and you. The insurance industry as well is hugely different. So for example, yesterday I spent the first hour of my day talking about satellites, spent the second hour of my day talking about cyber risks and the impacts on things like climate change and how that might impact, which provides further context to why we've set our challenge statement and how it builds into our bigger picture. From a responsible business perspective, I was came into a brand new role that was created um, for the first time last year. So I started in, in lockdown and I've spent uh, slightly more days in the office now than I have for interviews, which is a relief. And um, as part of that, we're building a team to basically take our company and to demonstrate that we want to act as a spot, not only as a responsible employer, but we also want to, to support clients and other stakeholders, so they, for, for us, are regulators and investors, as they progress against their targets, um, whether it be carbon emissions, inclusion and diversity, um, more charity and community engagement um, in the surroundings, whether they be around our offices or whether they be around the, the, the locality of our employees. So we've got a huge raft of, of targets. As we've already mentioned, our target for, for this year for carbon emissions is a reduction of 30% uh, on our 2019 emissions, so kind of pre-COVID. Um, beyond that, we're kind of 40 next year and 50, 50 the year after. When it Become, starts to become challenging is the fact that we can we can start doing the easy things, but actually there's a huge amount of value we think in in tech solutions to to drive change not only from a business perspective but also for our individual individual employer. And in this kind of two things are key: one, data and having information to be able to analyse uh, what we're receiving and, and to determine pathways going forward. And secondly, awareness and how individual actions can can be changed or altered to, to basically have a combined uh, great effort going forward. From just going around the wheel, which is our, our graphic for it, um, we've got a number of kind of targets for this year. Inclusion and diversity is one of our huge targets. We've got targets for, for both gender and employees by colour over the next year. We want to really push certainly female staff into senior roles uh, and demonstrate that we're, we're, we're pushing the boundaries in that. and. At the moment, Beasley, we're delighted to say, is kind of ahead of the market on that, that perspective. Also, we see our supply chain, so the people we work with, people that supply not just our offices, but when we go to um, provide building materials following perhaps a natural catastrophe event or whether it be tech solutions following kind of cyber events, we want to understand how our supply chain is and use our influence there as well to, to encourage responsible business. Likewise, um, our underwriting is a huge area of influence. So what changes can we make and influence to, to our policyholders to, to encourage this transition um, to improve both from a, a climate change perspective but also from a responsible business perspective? So is that allowing them to understand the risks of climate change and therefore allowing them to adopt their businesses accordingly? Is it providing them tech solutions to help them drive down their carbon emissions themselves? Is it building back better following the the impacts of perhaps a flood or a hurricane. So we can all kind of go to demonstrate that we're all on this, this correct path to, to the, the policy guidelines that have been set to date, which is net zero by, by 2050. This is, and I admit, is, is rather a complicated uh, slide. And it's, it's trying to illustrate how climate change and ultimately the challenge we've set fits into our business. So we have as part of our responsible business strategy, which is the stuff on the left, our climate responsibility. So what can Beasley do? What can we do to reduce our own carbon footprint? What can we do to, to influence our own employees? What can we do around the kind of charity and community piece? If we take climate change as a prime example um, and play it through, for example, you know, the community effort, efforts following floods or natural disasters are significant and we want to be able to contribute and help where we can. Likewise, from an underwriting perspective, what can we do to reward the best and encourage and push 
the rest along the way in their, in their common pursuit. On the right side is um, something that's been driven predominantly by a combination of regulators and also um, voluntary kind of market forces. And that's looking at what are the final financial implications. So I think the general consensus is if we act now, we, we help to kind of preserve the economy. It, it's more of a steady state going forward. We don't have any kind of knee-jerk reactions required down the, down the line. Uh, and helping to, to encourage and work with our, with our clients to, to deliver that as our solution. So being able to kind of map through the financial implications as decisions are made is also equally important for, for us as a business, but also as our clients, for them to, to kind of maintain their business going forward. Also, I just mentioned it, the kind of TCFD, so the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, is a voluntary disclosure that a number of people do. It's becoming regulated. And we're also driven by our regulators. So the CBES, which sta stands for Climate Biannual Exploratory Scenario, is a number of stress tests we need to do. As part of those both, we need to demonstrate as a business and get to very much demonstrate the stuff on the left of the hand of the screen that what we're doing to drive and ultimately lead by example. From a carbon emissions perspective, just going into technical details for, for a moment, um, you have what's called scope one, scope two and scope three. Scope one uh, for a financial services is relatively low, so that's, that's limited to kind of our company cars and our, our uh, internal operations. Scope two is our electricity, which goes to, to buildings uh, that, that we're, we occupy. Uh, and then scope three, which is our biggest, is everything, everything else. So at the moment, that's representative of, our, of mainly our travel. But as we've talked about previously, it would be great to start taking into account people's commute and the offset between home working and office working, for example, uh, our supply chain, um, other areas of carbon emissions that we can track and start to, to use tech solutions to, um, to go forward. So just to kind of conclude, our challenge statement is there on the screen. Um, we've kept it really broad because we think there's loads of avenues where this can go. We've got a great group of mentors internally at Beasley that will be able to support going forward. Uh, and we very much look to forward to, uh, to seeing what the outputs are at the end. Gentlemen, everyone. Thank you, Chris. So every great hackathon has a great set of judges. That's a, an absolute prerequisite. Uh, and I'd like to invite those judges to the stage. So um, could I please have um, Lisa Everett? Wonderful. Uh, oh, great. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could sit over there by the mic. Wonderful. Um, Martin Gettings from the Canary Wharf Group. Caroline Bartlett from Emmett Wise. And Emma Walker from Accurex. Wonderful. I'll, I'll go in the middle. You can see me all. Um, a very warm welcome to the judges. Um, first and foremost, what's it like being a judge? What, what attracted you to this? Why would you want to do it? Is it are the mic's on? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, I've always admired Simon Cowell, so I kind of <laughs> want to feel the footprints in that way. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I, I love the X Factor feel. Um, no, I think uh, generally, like, on a serious note, I think this is something we're really passionate about at Beasley. It's obviously something that is, is you know, all in the press, in the media, but I think it's something that we want to action and we want to do. Mm -hmm. I think it is silly to think that one person can do it themselves. We need to provide a community and awareness. And I think the knowledge is best here, right? So there's new people, new ideas, new perspectives, and that's what we want to gain. Emma, why is this important to you? Sorry. Um, so for me, I come from um, AccuX, which is a startup in the medical space. Um, for me, we wanted to be closer to Code First Girls. We've done a bit of partnering. We want to increase um, our partnership in this space. And also, we're a tech company, we're a startup. We love this type of stuff. We actually run hackathons within our own company to come up with new ideas, make sure that people's voices are heard. What if you're a back end engineer but want to contribute to a data space or a front end space? For us, it's all about collaboration and making sure that we support that team collaboration to get really good outcomes. Caroline? Yeah, so I've, I've worked in climate change um, space in consulting for a very long time, for over a decade. Um, and 
technology of the way forward. It's all about being able to access the data, being able to innovate, and it's really exciting to just be involved and, and see some of the ideas. Martin. Yeah, hi, so we're Canary Wharf Group, and in the words of the famous song, we, we built this city, not quite on rock and roll, <laughs> but we did build it, and we did use a lot of carbon. Mm. We've been building Canary Wharf for the last 30 years, and we've probably got another 30 years of construction. But things are changing, and um, we need people like you to help us. You are the bright minds of the future. So I guess that's why we're here, to kind of inspire, but also to learn. And um, the, the, other, the other reason why we're here is because we absolutely recognize that we've got to show up, we've got to get involved. If we want to solve this problem, we've got to do it together, and we've got to participate. And that's really what it's all about. Tackling climate is about participation. So we're really pleased to be here. Thank you. I really want to say Canary Wharf was built on sausage rolls as well. Well, I am, but maybe not I, Canary Wharf. I feel like I feel like I skipped breakfast today. I feel like I've talked about pie and sausage rolls. There is a theme going. But back to hacking your carbon footprint. <laughs> um, so, Martin, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, climate change is such a, a massive problem. Uh, what are some steps that businesses and individuals like yourself are currently taking? to mitigate uh, the impact of uh, your footprint? So um, to drive action, you really can't beat um, publishing um, targets and ambitions. Uh, we've signed up the science-based targets. We are one of the first um, districts in the world to have achieved plastic-free community status, which is, again, something that we, we set out with a public commitment. Um, We've aligned ourselves through the science-based targets. We've aligned ourselves with the, the Paris commitments. We're really excited to see what's going to happen in COP26, and we're absolutely ready. You know, that's one of the strengths of Canary Wharf. We've been really agile and really receptive to change because we're quite a, quite a, a, a young real estate company, actually. So we're, so we're ready to, we're ready when, when, you know, because this agenda is changing so fast. People are talking about 2050. We're already saying that's too late for zero, you know, for net zero. So we've got to... We, we know that that date's going to come in. So expect some big changes in COP. So businesses like Canary Wharf that are leading the way on, on climate and carbon, and, but not just that, biodiversity and, and well-being as well, they're all interconnected. So coming back to the city, we see this as an ecosystem, and it's this place and this culture that's enabled us to think like that. So we're doing an awful lot, actually. Um, yeah. And what about in terms of Accurex? So for AccuraX, um, and I'm going to be really honest, I'm not a climate change expert like probably the rest of the people up on this panel, but for us, AccuraX is a five-year-old startup. So we wanted to make sure that we were understanding our impact on climate change from the start at both an organisational level and an individual level. So what can we do as a company, which for us is about where do we invest our money? So we use things like Azure because we know that they are much better for um, the carbon emissions than other providers in terms of cloud. So we make decisions about our business based on who we want to partner with and what their values are. But not only that, we're trying to encourage our employees to be able to make choices as well. So we run things like clothes swaps, um, we're a pescatarian office, we provide pescatarian lunch for people every day, um, and we're really trying to understand how we can make or empower our team members to also make those choices and support them doing it. Um, Caroline, we had a fantastic tech talk yesterday from Emmett Wise. This really goes to the heart of your business, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, I think Historically, we've worked so much in the climate change space in a very slow manner and very backwards looking. I think in order to actually be making these changes, be making these decisions, which are really important to run a, a climate neutral business, you have to have data far more quickly, far more accessible, and in a way that you can really break it down and understand it at every level of a company. And you do have special specialities, right, in terms of your, the industries you particularly look at, you think that, that, that there's big wins over. Definitely. Um, I think there's, you know, packaging, for example, is an area that just influences so many areas of, of business all across the, uh, across the globe, and so much is associated with things like transportation and sending packaging, you know, in empty freight containers and things like that. There are so many efficiencies you can gain in that. Um, I think there's, you know, there's, every industry needs to take steps, but there's always about focus on, on where you can begin. And Lisa, obviously Beasley are the, the lead sponsor of this hackathon. Um, 
you know, Beasley's an insurance company. What is it? What, what, what is it about this that's so important to Beasley? Why is this front and centre? And why do you want the Code First Girls community to get involved? I'm, I think, and um, I'm not being paid to do this, but like, <laughs> as in Beasley are actually different from an in, any other insurance company. I've worked at a few. And I like that because they want to actually openly challenge what they're doing, not just with how they're writing business, but in the way they're actively doing their business. You know, as in, how are they modifying their offices environmentally friendly? How are they? And they're asking us as the employees, they're asking their vendors, their suppliers, everyone, what can we do to do better? How can we work with you that's more effective and environmental? And they don't hide anything that they're doing. They are so, they're promoting it so widely to say, how will it work for us as a business? How will it work to sustain what we need to, like to, to help the earth, basically? And I really enjoy that because everyone's included. So I feel it is very collaborative um, and such initiatives like this, I think we've got an aggressive 50% by 2023, but it needs to be aggressive. We need to see that change. If we sit still and we don't do anything, there's not going to be any change. So I'm really excited. And what are you going to be looking for as a judge? Um, new ideas, any ideas. No idea is silly. Don't think it. I, I think about a million ideas all the time and evaluate them in my head. And that's what we're asking for you. There might be something that we've missed because we might have slightly tunnel visioned what we're seeing. Data is power. That's what I think. I love data. Um, it's my absolute passion. And I think you can always see new avenues and new solutions from it, or even ideas for new solutions. So I would say open your mind, um, just see what works. And Caroline, what about yourself? What's really going to stand out here for you? Um, I think one of the really important factors is just usability. I think actually, you know, the data is key, but if people don't understand that data, then it it's loses all its value. So really getting into kind of means to actually use the information and how to, to make decisions with it. And talking about usability, I mean, Accurex is a company that's absolutely exploded during the pandemic. I mean, if we're looking at a company that's got usability, Accurex would probably tell you a lot about that. Yep, I definitely back up usability. But I guess I'd also put accessibility, right? So climate change is about everyone. How do we make data accessible to all? And also, there's a lot of privilege wrapped up in whether you can take climate action. So how do we ensure that we're allowing everyone to maybe make the choices that are right for their circumstance? What can we kind of brainstorm to allow climate change action to be accessible to all? So that's what I would be really looking for. As part of this hackathon. Is, uh, uh, if anybody wants to rewatch from yesterday, there was a whole segment on accessibility in products uh, delivered by Typeform um, and also about how to crunch data with um, Palantir as well, uh, particularly NHS data. So I'd encourage you to maybe watch those uh, segments back. What about yourself? What are you looking for as a judge? So really, really keen to see things that trigger people to get involved. You know, really sort of echoing what, what the previous judges have said. But for me, um, the whole sustainability agenda, it's something that, that, that you know, I've, I've been involved in sustainability for the last 20 years and it's kind of just become a thing in the last two years. So my wife calls it me sort of like 20 year overnight success. Everybody wants to talk about ESG and sustainability right now. I've always been excited about it and it's just brilliant to see other people getting excited about it as well now. So what I'm looking for are ways to excite and ignite people's imagination to get involved in this because we can solve this. Data is kind of boring, really, isn't it? But if we can find ways to make that data exciting and cool, make data cool, that's what I'm looking for. And we, want to, we, we really want to use that because absolutely everybody is on this right now. Everybody wants to get involved. Everybody wants to help change the world. And together we actually can. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, looking, to, I'm looking for you guys to make data cool, I think. And, Martin, how important is diversity of thought in this? And when I say diversity of thought... I'm talking about intergenerational differences. I'm talking about people that might come from neurodiverse backgrounds. Why is that so important to tackling a, a world issue? Well, that's absolutely where the, the solutions are going to come from. I mean, we were talking about this just outside. You know, um, 19th and 20th century thinking is, is what's got us into this pickle in the first place. We've got to rethink the way we think. And the only way we can do that is through... You know, through, through diversity, through involving different people with different ideas, because that's where the answers are. We, it, it, who knows what's untapped? We, you know, we, 
we know what we know, but it's what we don't know that, 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 that we need to find out. And the only way we're going to do that is by thinking differently. So I'm quite ruthless, mate. I don't care which avenue I go down to, to find these sustainability solutions. And you should be ruthless as well, because that's the way we're going to solve this. I challenge you to um, assault people's thinking, to really challenge them to make them think differently, because that's the only way that we're going to see, we're going to see change. Um, can we talk a little bit about some of the innovations that you think have been most exciting in this area or that have really stood out uh, to the rest of the panelists around um, climate change? Yeah, um, I think there are, there are so many innovations, but I think something that's really just boomed recently is, is ideas that have been around for a very long time. So things like electric vehicles. They've been around, the idea's been there for a long time, but making them accessible, making them affordable, and actually taking some of those steps to ensure that you know, the, the batteries are, are effective and efficient and, and those kind of extra steps. It's, it's not always about brand new thinking. There's a lot of great ideas already out there. It's just taking the extra step to make them feasible. Lisa. Yeah, I think, you know what, one that actually I thought was a really big impact was the supermarket's not giving out carrier bags anymore. Because I'm sure we would have had that cupboard at home, right, where mum's got it and she's got 500 of them. And then you don't need them. And now everyone's got their reusable ones, wherever they're, like, whatever they're made of. And it's just made such a difference. You don't go in expecting now, oh, 10p for a bag. You don't want to pay that. So get the ones out of the cupboard. And I think it's little ones like that. People, we've all got... Pretty much a lot of us have got reusable bottles here as well. And I think it's thinking these minor changes actually gravitate to be something massive. Oh. I was always buying like a new little avian bottle every week. And I'm not saying that I don't, but I carry this everywhere with me because I'm like constantly hydrating. Um, but also at the same time, it is a little change. And if one person does it, then you've got 10, 100, 1,000. It equates to a lot. Oh. So I think that's really recognisable. Now, I know with uh, Accurex, they've actually transformed the way people uh, receive healthcare, and I'm guessing reduce things like journeys. Am I right in saying that, that you're actively involved in helping to reduce people's carbon footprint? Absolutely. So instead of someone having to go to the GP's office, they're able to actually communicate with their GP via text or via video. So that has its own carbon footprint, but we're reducing all that transportation. Um, and even we're also helping save time for that GP so they can focus more on the cases they really need to be focusing on more than just saying yes you've got your regular prescription thanks for traveling in an hour to the office and an hour back just for me to sign this to give to a pharmacy so we're really looking at things like that which help save those transportation costs and really help also the NHS help reduce their carbon emissions. I was commenting uh, yesterday I actually think after Emmett Wise's talk about what, what gives us hope and my comment on this is that uh, the new generation coming through, I think that the sense of social movement around climate change is seriously to be admired in a way that I was actually commenting wasn't really even felt in my generation. Uh, and I'm seeing this almost like as a social movement now. What gives you the greatest hope for the future? Um, you guys, um, and this whole purpose, this whole, this whole notion of leadership, right? We've had enough of leaders. Um, who, who is going to lead this? Don't look anywhere else than who's in this room. You are the leader, right? Stop seeing leadership as an external thing. We, we've, got, we, we've got to drive this forward. Uh, you know, a wise man, wiser person than me once said, you know, um, if, you know, if you want to change the world, you've got to show up. And you guys have showed up today. I mean, we've all got day jobs, right? But we've chose to come here today to be a part of this. That's what gives me hope. People want to be involved in this. And now, through tech, through events like this, through networks, this is the way we can, you know, this is the way we can solve this. That's what gives me the most hope. People want to be involved. I think we've now got the means and the tech and the confidence to use that tech to connect, as you said, with, with, the, with the JP. But we can connect in other ways. That's what gives me the most, the most hope. Lisa, what gives you the most hope? Um, I, it echoes, right? We're getting a voice. I think, you know, I think maybe years ago, you know, if you start talking about climate change and people are like, oh, okay, yeah, she's going to go off on one of her rants. And I continue to do so. <laughs> but then more people started to, and people start to listen. And, it, and again, it just explodes into, 
Oh, we're a community that are thinking the same. We're thinking what we want to achieve is the same, but how to do it. And like you said, it's saying, rather than the dictatorship of, you're going to do this to change climate change, it's what can we do? Like asking that question, because we all need to be involved. And I think it's promoted more. It's, it's a hot topic. People want to know what to do and how to get involved. I mean, you see people coming together, even on the beaches, to clear them up. And I think there's a lot of communities that want to make that change. I was reflecting uh, with Rolls-Royce on the last big data <laughs> challenge that we had. Um, and I sort of said, what, what, what made this so important? And it was actually the difference in perspective. Never, ever underestimate how important it is to have different people, different lenses looking at a problem in different ways. Because the types of solutions that can be created uh, are incredibly unique and they never would have been created uh, usually. Uh, Caroline, what gives you the greatest hope for the future? I think it's echoing everything that's been said, really. I think the collaboration and the, the kind of unified approach, I think there's a lot more open source information companies. When I started in the space, there was a lot of proprietary data being held behind you know, screens that no one else wanted to share because they wanted to be the leader. But actually now, as an industry, I think as a, you know, a multi-sectoral industry, everyone's keen to share this information and build these platforms that we can actually communicate and take things forward together and do you think there's going to be a balance so i know i know your product has absolutely exploded during the pandemic and and you know fantastically so but do you think that there will be a balance in the future where we can actually find that balance of maybe being more face to face again uh, but equally being able to offset our footprint absolutely and you know, as we said before, enabling GPs to see the most, the patients they need to rather than the patients they don't, that to me is where the balance needs to come through, that we're focusing on the right things. And I think even um, with this room, in terms of giving me hope, um, we're hiring at the moment and many of our applicants are asking us, hey, what's your carbon footprint? What do you do to make sure that you've got um, that as one of your main priorities? So. Um, we're getting those questions from our candidates. We're, they're holding us accountable to make sure that we've got something that's transparent and that gives me hope that, again, those questions are becoming more commonplace, which is fantastic. So I'm going to ask each of the panellists now, what's the best piece of advice that you could impart to anybody that wants to take part in this and apply to this hackathon? Okay, so here we are on the 31st floor of one kind of square, which is like a 30-year-old building, and, and that's pretty amazing as it is. But what I think is, as people and human beings, we've, got the, we've all got the capacity to do incredible things. And I, I can only draw on my experiences from the, the teams and the people that I've worked with in the, in the built environment. And um, what inspires me to, to keep driving forward on the, the, the sustainability agenda and to sign up to these, these really challenging commitments is because I've, I know the culture that's, that's got us here to level 31, right, has built this building and built this estate. You know, the, the construction sector is one of the best kept secrets um, in, in all industries. Nobody would think of going into construction, but it's a brilliant career. I was a Lego kid. That's what got me into construction. And here we are, as I say, the, the, you know, the character and the tenacity and the, and, and, the, and the culture and the challenge of building things, that's the same um, tenacity that we need to solve the climate crisis. So I think we've all got that inside ourselves. We just need to find it and tap into it and use that because we, we can use that to solve these immense problems. And that's kind of what I think we're all here to do. We're, we're here to inspire and, and to work together. And I think, I, I, think, I think we're good. I think we're in a good place. Some quick, quick fire advice. What, what advice would you give anyone participating? Um, don't be afraid to look at something a different way. If you're not seeing a solution one way, change your angle. Open, like, open your mind, open your imagination. What about if the data is not looking at it a certain way? Use, use your imagination. You've got great minds, so we want to see the best of them. I think just, um, yeah, be brave to put things forward. I think some of the best ideas, it's, Mitwise is the first startup I've, I've worked at. I'm so used to ideas coming from the top and being implemented, which are not necessarily the best ideas. But uh, Mitwise, it's great. Everyone has this voice. Everyone, every member of the team, regardless of their role, is equally heard, and it's really powerful. So from a tech delivery side, know your user group be able to get feedback from those users to test your ideas as you're going along. Um, 
and just have fun with it as well. Try new things, try new technology if you want, um, but try and keep things as simple as possible. There you go, have fun and don't use pie charts after Freddie's <laughs> advice. If you see a pie chart, it'll get frightened. Um, right, we're going to go to some Q&A now. Um, does anybody have any questions from the audience? Lady in the front. Also, can we get a mic to the lady in the front before she starts speaking so we can hear? Love your jumper. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for um, introducing this amazing challenge. I, um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about the choice to focus on individual carbon footprint because, you know, as, as a person, you sort of see on a corporate level things from oil spills to masses of packaging in supermarkets. Why is it important for us to understand our own carbon footprint and what can we as individuals do? Oh, powerful question. Who would like to take that? I think, you know, if you're in the media and you want someone to listen to your report, they might choose an oil spill over me sitting in my desk maybe having a light bulb on that I shouldn't. And I think it's what, what they want as a headline, right? But individually, we can contribute. And it's like I said, with the water bottle, we're using the plastic bag. It's what we can all do. Because you're not going to be just one person doing it. You're going to ask the UK. You're going to ask the globe to do it. So it would be amazing to see what that can contribute to our reduction. Would anyone else like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, we're all consumers. And again, coming back to this leadership piece, I think we, we, we kind of need to... Un uh, we are individuals, but collectively, we have enormous influence and purchasing power. Um, it, it really does... Um, you, you do feel daunted when you, when you see what's happening out there and you think, well, how can I affect that? But, but you really can't. I mean, going back to the, the, the water bottle piece, we've got seven water refill stations in, in the malls. And every time you refill your water bottle, the little ticker goes over. And I just get this amazing feeling every time I see that going over because you, you're part of something built, something amazing. You know, we're up to like half a million refills now. So that's quite, a, quite an impact. You can make a big difference. But it, it, to take your point about it's then the media, you then use that to scale your influence from half a million water bottles is great, but our plastic free initiative at Canary Wharf tr triggered us and gave us the confidence to go for science-based targets, which is where the real impacts are. So think of scale as well and think of doing something small to inspire others to do something bigger. And, and that's where we really can make a difference. Anybody else got any questions? Anything from social? Oh, sorry, one at the back. Do I have one at the back? No, no, it was social. Oh, we do have, we do have one there. The lady in... Yes, it's coming. Um, hi, uh, I think one of my questions is, um, so when it comes to reducing carbon footprint sustainability, sometimes I feel like it's almost a privilege to be able to do that because, um, for example, if we go to supermarket, uh, if we go to Aldi, where like you know students tend to go to, um, you don't really have a lot of options when it comes to like you know packaging. Like it's almost always plastic. But if you go to say Waitrose or m and you know you have a wider range of uh, options. But not everybody can afford to do that. Not everybody have the privilege uh, to to be able to you know sort of do that. So how, what do you think? How how to make sustainability? Uh, more accessible to individuals maybe are not, you know, um, currently uh, be able to afford that sort of um, lifestyle or that sort of have that choice or, yeah, can be able to make that decision. What a wonderful question. Is this a luxury? Who would I'll like to take that? Happily take yeah. that. Um, I think it's a really, really important point. I think absolutely um, it shouldn't be about trying to make people feel bad either if you know, if there's um, not the available opportunities for, for certain purchases, for example. But I think it's all about identifying what you can do. And everyone has means to, to make different steps in different directions. It might be, you know, rather than where you purchase your food, it might be on how you purchase your electricity. It might be on how you, um, whether you use public transport rather than, you know, taking uh, more energy intensive vehicles and so on. There's always elements that you can get involved with, um, and those things are, I think it's important to recognize a privilege, but there's certainly opportunity everywhere. And I think it'd be great for an innovation idea. <laughs>
Anybody? Yeah, I'll, I'll back that up, I, that I think it definitely is a privilege issue and it's about how much money you have to be able to make some of these choices. Um, I think we all saw with single plastic use for um, straws and getting rid of them, that actually impacted people that needed those straws to actually hydrate and, and nutrition, right? So that decision didn't take into account people with disabilities that relied on it. So what I'd be having the challenge with this hackathon is how could you provide a solution that takes that into account, that accessibility, that people don't feel shamed, as we said, but feel like they could make a difference, but they're not being forced into making that difference when you know they've got accessibility needs that they're also weighing up at the same time. I'm going to take one question from social before we wrap up. Yep. So, when can we watch the presentations of different teams? Um, I guess technically I can help with that one. I know <laughs> no one can see me, but I am doing it. So the very final presentation will be on the 3rd of November, still at TBT, if that's going to be public or private, but we'll let everyone know. Wow. Okay, fantastic. And if you want to get involved, you can apply on our website on Monday. So I hope to see a lot of you there. Thank you very much to our judges uh, and panellists. Um, we're going to take a break right now. Um, there are lots of networking tables. Um, Accurex, uh, Emmett Weiser back there, uh, Balsamic as well, and Avast, of course, our lead sponsor for today. So please go and network, have some coffee, and I'll see you at 12. Thank you.
good? Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? I know, I know, I know, ladies and gentlemen. It, it's, we haven't spoken to each other in so long. I'm excited to. We, we just can't stop. But we have to because we have another very exciting segment coming up. So we're going to be talking about applying for tech jobs uh, and what companies are really looking for in the process. Now, uh, when we ask the community what they most would like to hear about, a lot of women come back and say it, it's really about what employers are looking for. How do I demonstrate that? How do I come across an interview? What do I need to do? Well, you're going to find out some of the secrets today. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome on stage uh, Elwyn Chan, Head of Engineering at Clio. Uh, Hannah Clark, Software Engineer at Vago. Uh, Megan Chundley, Principal Talent Consultant at Few and Far. Claire Mark, Head of Engineering at the Intellectual Property Office. Um, we have uh, Ji Ang Gu, Principal Engineer at NatWest. <laughs> Woo! Oh, there's some fans of NatWest in the audience, I see. Who is wooing NatWest? Yeah, let's hear it for NatWest. You've got some fans. Check that out. No one's wooing for JP Morgan over there, then. <laughs> Someone's wooing for JP Morgan. <laughs> I feel like, what have I started? Um, Okay, fantastic. So, um, it would be just lovely if you could introduce yourselves uh, one by one. Uh, let's start off uh, with yourself. Um, Great. Hi, everyone. It's, it's very exciting to be out and about, I must say. And so, my name is Jane Gu, and I started my career as a research scientist in semantic web technology. And that's actually where I really got into software development. I did engineering for my degree. Um, at Cambridge University with an ex international exchange program at MIT. Um, and that was really general engineering, and I really got into it um, really when I was at work. So I think having that internship experience and that work experience is, is really important. And then I progressed on to um, work at different organizations. I worked at Goldman Sachs, HSBC, and now I'm head of engineering at NatWest in retail banking Digitech. So really excited to be partnering with Code First Girls newly this year. And uh, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Safe to say you might know Canary Wharf quite well. Yes, I do know. <laughs> Despite knowing Canary Wharf very well, um, having not been here for over 12 months, I did get a little bit lost. <laughs> I got completely lost. It took me 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and also, I was taken in by the shops. Um, <laughs> uh, Claire, can you just introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Claire Mark and I'm from the Intellectual Property Office, which is a civil service department. Uh, I've worked there since I left uni, which was a very long time ago. I came in a different route. I came in via the business, started off in, as an admin assistant, and then kind of worked my way up. So I'm now head of engineering in our existing systems department, um, which basically looks after our existing systems. And we've got another transformation program ongoing at the moment, which is quite exciting. Uh, but we're also, this is our first uh, time with Code First Girls, so very excited and lovely to see so many girls in one room for IT. Because since I've joined, you know, it, it hasn't changed much in the last 30 years. We're always kind of a minority, so it's lovely to see all you girls. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Megan. Hey guys, I'm the elephant in the room. I am a recruiter, but don't worry, <laughs> you're all safe. <laughs> Um, so, hey, I'm, I'm Megan. So, I've worked in software engineering recruitment for the last five years. Um, literally live and breathe it. Um, so, yeah, really, really happy to be here. I'm honoured to be here. And, yeah, in front of all of you, you're going to be the inspiration for, like, the next generation of women in tech. So, just remember that. So, yeah, really happy to be here. And great to see you. And Hannah from Vago, who... You're an alum, aren't you, of Code First Girls? Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I'm a software engineer at Vago. We're a temporary car insurance company, which is, it sounds super glamorous, I know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I uh, have only been a software engineer for the past two years. Um, before that, I was a project manager. Um, and I very much got into it from doing the Code First Girls web development course back in 2018. Um, and just kind of rekindled my love for programming and decided maybe I could do this as a career. And it turns out I could. Um, so I've been working full stack for the past two years, and I really love it. Um, and yeah, a lot of that's down to Code First Girls. And Elwyn, 
Hi everyone, I'm Elwyn. Um, I actually never intended to become a software engineer, but I came out of university 20 years ago uh, with an engineering degree and it turned out that you have to do software to do anything these days. Um, I've worked in medium-sized companies, I've worked in humongous companies, and now my current company is um, 25 to 30 engineers in size. So applying for your first tech job, what was that like? What, what, what were you feeling? And I'm just trying to get a sense here of a real sense of honesty because a lot of women in this audience potentially looking at, you know, some of the amazing achievements that I've just heard might feel, hang on, I could never do that. How did you feel when you first went for it? Who would like to take that question first? Okay, I'll, I'll start this one off. Um, so I remember um, getting really excited about going into technology and also knowing nothing about how to do it. <laughs> And, and really, it's just about starting and getting that experience. And I remember very, very clearly one of my first interviews was with Microsoft. Um, and they asked me lots of questions that surprised me. And, um, and that's because that was one of my very first interviews. And from that, I didn't get that job. So that was really a first experience of rejection. Um, but it was just such a great learning experience because I learned all of the kind of questions that... Um, employers wanted to ask me, and I thought that they, they actually made a lot of sense. Um, but I actually hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about them f f for myself. So with each interview I went to, um, it was just really more of a learning experience. Obviously, you know, sometimes um, one approach of um, going through, through lots of different interviews, it can be easy to fall into the trap of um, having that knock your confidence. But just remember that you're really doing the right thing by applying for different roles, because um, it's not just the inter it's not just the employer interviewing you, you're really interviewing the employer as well. So you really want to take advantage of that to learn from that employer about what kind of roles do they have, what do they do, what industry do they operate in. So I think it's really important to have a really good mindset when you sort of approach approach interviews. Um, and you know, it's, it's just such a great learning experience. And there are going to be ups and downs through it. But just remember to take um, all of the opportunities that you get from meeting new people as well and just learning from their career experience. I, I, one of my favorite questions in interviews is I always like to ask them how did they get started and what, ha what, has, their, what has been their learnings through, through their career. Can I ask, what was the most surprising question that you were asked in that Microsoft interview? I mean, my curiosity has been piqued. Oh. So that, I think that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Um, I, think it, I think it was actually about my motivations. He actually asked me, um, the very first question was, um, why are you here? And Which you're just getting and straight to the I was nub, like, right? At what level <laughs> are you asking me this? You know, it's a c c really philosophical here. And that was just so self-reflective because I was so focused on kind of cracking the, the technical part of my, the interview. I found it really difficult to actually articulate my m motivations in words. I knew I was really passionate about it. Um, but it was just, uh, I think it just shocked me. Have you, had you had pra practiced it before? Had anybody ever asked you that before? Um, I think mainly actually at the time, a lot of the support I got was all on CV writing. So it was all on the CV writing, but no one really sort of sat down with me and asked me you know, some really reflective sort of self-awareness questions. And I think that's what sort of took me um, by surprise in that first interview. But because that was my first interview, that definitely prepared me for my second one. So prior to our nano degree um, and prior to interview with our companies, all of our candidates actually go through interview prep where they get asked these questions and they can practice them and they can talk very openly and very honestly. And the difference is absolutely amazing before and after, just through the opportunity of being able to practice and talk to somebody out loud. Because maybe how it sounds on paper, and how it sounds in your head, is very different than actually being able to articulate it in a really convincing way, an authentic and passionate way. What was your first experience like? So mine, like I say, was, was a different route in. So I was already in the organisation. Uh, back then, you had to go and take an aptitude test to find out if you were suitable for IT. If you were, mine was actually like a really informal interview with the head of IT at that time. So it's, it's changed quite a lot now. But I, I would echo your. Um, thoughts that preparation is key I think we've got an IT academy in our uh, works now and they help everyone with interview prep and also record yourself and watch yourself back because you don't realize what you do or what you say and, and how many times you say um and, and things like that and just 
the more times you do it, the better you get at it. Practice makes perfect, isn't it? So that's what I'd say. Keep practicing and be prepared. That's the other thing. You know, you can't prep enough. Find out about the company that you're going to work for, about the role that you're going to be working in, and kind of just relax. You know, try and look confident, even though you might be really, really nervous. But try and kind of listen to the questions. That's the other thing. People get so nervous they don't actually listen to what you're being asked. So listen to the questions. Try and answer the questions. Um, but and most of all, people aren't kind of trying to catch you out. They're just trying to find out a bit more about you and you about them, like you say. So, Megan, what are you looking for in a candidate? Um, what Come on, like we're <laughs> recruiter in the room. We'll get, we need to address this. What are you looking for? What 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 really stands out to you? Good question. Um, there's there's so many variables. Like it, dep mm -hmm. it depends on the situation. Obviously, obviously what the com what that company is, the size of it, what the standards are what they're looking for um uh, what, what we're looking for i mean in general like it's for, for me it's like translating the the individual mind of that hiring manager into like what they want and going out for that as a as a general like what do most people look for uh, phrases i hear often from hiring managers like attitude and aptitude like of course the cv is going to get you the interview but when when you're there you know speaking to someone i i always say to people like be yourself like that's the number one thing like be authentic like they're wanting to see who you really are um and yeah for, for the most part you know if you don't hold all of the skills like that's when it comes down to the attitude you know do you have the potential are you willing to learn like you know what what examples have you got that that shows that um so yeah that's that's what i'd say is like a sort of general general advice and hannah coming from being a cofest girls alum to getting your first software job how did you feel going into that first interview what did you do what was that like? I I had a lot of interviews because I basically applied for everything I could find <laughs> on the off chance that someone might want to hire me. Um, so it was a really good learning experience because I didn't for a second expect that I would be getting, you know, 20 odd job offers. Um, and some of them were quite different as well, uh, which was really good in a way because it gave me a chance to figure out the kind of place I wanted to work for as well. So some of the interviews were very formal. Um, you had to do sort of a video recording with just yourself answering questions and you had like one shot to do it and then you had to submit it, which was just a horrible way of interviewing anyone. Um, but then I had some really good companies and one of the best ones that I had was um, probably similar to the Microsoft story was a company that rejected me, but I gained so much from that and I was able to reach out to someone on the panel afterwards and say, okay, what would you what do you suggest I do better next time? And then the next interview after that, I got the job. So having those experiences, while it was really daunting to go into that, really helped me then in future to kind of be as polished as possible to get the job that I actually wanted. And when you're obviously the head of technology, uh, head of engineering, sorry, when when you see uh, new women coming through, what's what's the biggest piece of advice that you could offer? in terms of what you see at Clio? I would say be yourself. Um, nobody's looking for a walking textbook. But we're looking for problem solvers, people who can think on their feet, people who know how to unblock themselves when they don't know what to do. And so in that interview process, think aloud. Tell the interviewer what's going through your head when you don't know the answer, because that can unlock a conversation that you weren't expecting to have. And that's where the chemistry piece of interviewing comes in as well. You know, you, software engineering is not a solo sport. You're there to work in a team. And if you don't have that chemistry, and if you don't have the chance to demonstrate that chemistry in the interview, then your chances are gonna be a bit lower. Very good advice there. It's, it's chemistry. It's <laughs> um, right, so we're gonna talk about CVs next. We're going to talk about CV, then we're going to talk about interview preparation and the actual interview itself. So in terms of CVs, we constantly get asked, what should be on a woman's CV? What are you looking out for? How should a woman, for example, we get asked this all the time, how should a woman put their Code First Girls experience on the CV? Any advice about that? Um, so yeah, I think for CVs, you really want that um, to represent yourself, you know, everything that you're interested in, all of your experience. Um, and it doesn't have to be, when you're applying for a technical job, it doesn't have to be totally just exclusively focused on your technology. 
Um, you might have had roles in other industries, um, locally, volunteering, um, and that's also really valuable as well. So it's something that you, know, you feel proud to sort of present to someone and show someone, this is all the experience that I have to bring to the role and really open to sort of learning um, and being part of that organization as well. So um, a little bit of a personal description, a personal statement at the top um, can also uh, help you stand out. Um, and I mean, Code First Girls is such an amazing organization. You know, put that loud and proud like, right at the top of the CV, um, all of the experience and learnings that you've experienced through that um, and what you think that you can bring to the role from your Code First Girls experience. You know, put that down. Um, and employers read the CV. So in terms of how you want to um, present that and, and put that forward as well, um, it, it is sometimes very challenging for hiring managers to read through lots of um, lots of CVs when they're hiring for a role. So definitely making it making sure that it's presented in a way that's really readable. So there's a balance between sort of making it stand out from a stylized perspective, um, but as long as you can make it really clear and really quick to read, uh, that's that's really um, a great way to approach it, um, and make Co Code First Girls really stand out because it's it's such a great organisation to to work with, and really excited to be here and see all of you. This is great. <laughs> Love NatWest. Um, <laughs> What about the intellectual property office? What do you think the intellectual property office are looking for in a CV? So we do recruit slightly differently. So we do get a CV, but we also ask for normally kind of um, 500 words on experience and to, to kind of a bit like a personal statement, but it's additional to CV. Our CVs are actually anonymous, so we don't know whether they're coming in from, you know, male or female. So actually, if you put cold first girls, we're going to know probably that you are female. So that could be a, a positive. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, the experience, if you come in just out of uni, you might not have kind of a load of jobs to kind of refer back to. But if you've done stuff at uni, you know, where, even if it's volunteering or anything at all, the more we can see a kind of a rounded personality, someone's kind of enthusiastic and like we said, the right attitude, that's the kind of thing that we look for, even if you haven't got the, the necessary technical skills, maybe, you know, we are we've got training programs in place. We, we can almost train the technical side, but it's, it's your attitude and, and kind of general behaviors that we're looking for. Megan, you must've seen a fair few CVs in, in your time. One or two, one Wait, or two, yeah. Is that, <laughs> is that a positive thing or do you feel like? I dream about CVs. <laughs> um, Drowning in CVs. What stands out? I mean, what, what's that one that brings you back from the, the sea of CVs? Um, so I'd say uh, similar to, to what yourself said about the aesthetic, like when you open it, you, you're going to want to just, I always say like you all know the principle of like KISS, right? Like keep it simple. So, but, um, and, you know, for software engineering, that is if, if you're a designer, it's going to be slightly more like stylized, but make it e yeah, easy to read. Like you want to be able to understand it, you know, and have it make sense um, uh, as well as that. So yeah, make sure you do have, you know, a little personal statement on the top of that about who, who are you um, as as a developer, for example, what are you passionate about in it? What are you learning? You know, what are you looking for? A little bit about, um, yeah, about yourself, really, like, like I said, be, be yourself. Um, don't want them to, like, yeah, for, for them all to say the same thing. And then when it comes to your experience, I'd say um, it's not just about, you know, putting every... <coughs> language framework and, and tool under the sun on there but it's it's most important about what have you done with that so you know what was the like company a little a little sense on what the company is that you've worked for is always good a little bit on the project like what what did you build you know what impact did you make and then using what um in technology um and anything else on there as well you know maybe you um made a contribution to the team you did something or you you know mentored some juniors or something else like that but yeah get that on there um as well as that like personal projects if you've got something on github or if it's a, a website or even if it's not linkable but something that you can write about that you have worked on you know write that on there as well they're, they're, they're all like really important things to have um so yeah i'd say say that's like the core advice really and this is why hackathons i think are so important as well if you haven't got much experience to talk about it actually gives you a fantastic thing that you probably feel very passionate about 
um, that you can bring to the table. Um, and probably the interview is gonna feel quite passionate about as well. Um, Hannah, how did you prepare your CV? How did, how did you stand out? Did you talk to people? Did you go to CV workshops? What, what did you do to, to hone that? Um, it was quite tricky because I, I'd been in my job for quite a while, so I hadn't really tweaked my CV at all. Um, so I was essentially starting from scratch. And I think the mistake that I made, first of all, was to basically try and discount everything that I'd done that wasn't related to tech, um, thinking like it's not going to be relevant. So I spoke to a few people. Um, I spoke to some of the people who interviewed me who didn't give me jobs and said, what would you want to see on this? And they essentially said, don't downplay the other skills that you've got just because they're not coding languages. Um, so I kind of retweaked that first opening paragraph to make it so that even though the jobs I've been doing weren't in tech at all, that it was still relevant because those skills were transferable. And I think I'd sort of thought, well, it's not in the same industry, so therefore it's got no relevance to this. But actually, you can use those skills in other ways, in other places. So I think that was kind of the biggest piece of advice I got to do that. And then after that, it then became easier to, to get further in the interview process because I wasn't getting filtered out immediately because I just put, oh, I taught myself Python and I did a web development course and that was kind of it because I thought that was the only relevant thing. Um, so I think making the most of, of your other skills as well is, is really quite crucial. And Elwyn, um, what are you looking for here as head of engineering? What would you say to somebody that might not come from a hugely technical background that really wants to move into tech what would what would you look for and say? Yeah, that's someone that's got real potential. I, w I would echo, echo, you know, include your transferable skills because the language you code in is only about for five or ten percent of the job. The rest is teamwork. The rest is problem solving. It's talking. It's knowing how to collaborate, and that's those are things that you can pick up in many many other jobs. The other thing um, I think is I've seen quite a lot of CVs where it's just feels a little bit like a shopping list of, I did this, I did this, I did this. No, tell me, um, use the STAR model that you've probably come across in interviewing. Tell me what the situation was, the task, the action, and the result. Because that tells me a story. That's, that's not just a shopping list then. That's, that's speaking to me um, as the kind of person you are. And the, the, the STAR model is, is what we train in as well. So if you are prepped for a nano degree uh, position through our graduation schemes, what we do is we basically prep you in the STAR model so you'll be, have the opportunity to respond and practice your answers in that model with somebody role playing the interviewer. Quite intimidating as well. So after that experience, I mean, I'm sure it'll be incredibly easy. Um, <laughs> I want to turn now to um, technical assessments and technical interviews. For people that don't necessarily have a hugely technical background that are first moving in, this can be very daunting. What do people do? What, what's, how can they prepare for this? Um, so for um, technical interviews, if you've not had that much experience in sort of hands-on technical development, um, I would say still have confidence going into the interview because ultimately the technical skill is, is a skill set in order to solve a problem. So it's really important to understand and also ask questions to make sure you really understand the problem that the interviewer um, is setting you. And then really talk out loud, think out loud and talk through the problem. So um, applying a logical approach to it and, um, and really have a good go at it. Um, also from a non-technical perspective, there are still lots of technical knowledge that you can bring into the interview as well understanding system architecture, system basics, you know, how different parts of the system hang together, even if you don't have the experience to code up each component yet. So really look for the various, again, various different transfer transferable elements that you can bring into the interview. And that's especially problem solving and that logical thinking. Um, and then looking at all of the different factors around the, and the different angles that you can approach the problem because interviewers really want to see that flexibility. They really want to see, and to echo um, one of the answers earlier, they really want to see that you can uh, manage through ambiguity. If there are things that you think should be actually on the table that you've spotted, um, really say that out loud. So all of those different approaches and don't just think it's really narrow, um, narrowly focused on just, just, the, just the coding elements. 
And if you do want to get insights as to how organizations think about different you know, tech, technical aspects, a lot of our massive open online courses, like we did one recently with NatWest and one Product Management 101, have an insight, actually see from that perspective and, and then be able to relay that back. Uh, Megan, what about yourself? What do you think in terms of preparing for a technical interview? As somebody that's non-technical, that's why I've, I've brought this to you. I thought that would be quite an interesting segue. Cool. So, utilize the internet 100%. <laughs> um, like, me, me as a recruiter, yes, the hiring managers, we do prepare candidates. So, even ourselves, you know, we'll get, like, interview questions and like help people as much as we can but you have to go out there and do your own research as well and to be honest I think like you're not gonna you're not gonna pass every interview you're not gonna pass the first one it might not be the first 10 but when you get to the 11th if you've taken something from every one of those that you didn't know you've gone away and you've learned it then that's how you're gonna progress um yeah like a, a phrase I say all the time is redirect um, rejection is redirection and that's that couldn't be more true in that in that respect you know like yeah, just um, learn from who you can as well. You know, use use your network. Um, get, yeah, there's loads of help out there online. Like, follow people. So many people on LinkedIn that, like, offer out that advice as well to, for passing tech interviews. So, so yeah, that's what I'd say. Um, be, be patient and utilize everything that you have. Before we go to audience Q&A, I just wanted a quick-fire top tip from each of you as to how a woman can prepare, especially if she's going for an interview with your specific organizations. So there might be many women streaming in or in the audience that would really like to interview for your organization. What is your one top tip for interviewing with your organization? Start with NatWest. Um, go on the NatWest website. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and look at all the things that we're passionate about. So the kind of people that we want to bring in are people who really want to be part of the NatWest team. And, um, and I love working for NatWest because it really resonates with my personal values. So we love digitization, technology, and ultimately to create products and services that help our customers and our communities. So when we look for software engineers um, that come in, we want them to also have that passion yeah. for helping our communities. And, um, and we're really proud to be sponsoring COP26 this year. We really want to be the leaders and at the forefront of um, sustainable engineering as well. Um, so yeah, to kind of get to know the organization and see if it's the right fit for you. And if it is, come and speak to any of us because we really want to speak to you too. So I, I give me a call um, <laughs> and I'll chat you through. Um, so, so yeah, it's really to find people because we are, we are all really um, approachable and we really want people to be sort of become part of our team. Um, so do basically the main thing is assume that the organization is approachable and don't hesitate in approaching anyone, even if it's um, a message on LinkedIn to someone who looks like they work for NatWest or in your area, you know, at the bare minimum, don't hesitate to, to have a go and, and get, get in touch. Your inbox is going to be inundated. <laughs> um, intellectual property office, top tip if someone wants to apply to you. So I would say get to know the company, as you've said. Not a lot of people know a lot about intellectual property, so it is a bit of go on our website, find out what it is. Um, and also then just someone who is passionate and enthusiastic um, and who just has got a really good attitude. Like I say, that that is more important to us in a way than the actual technical skills because we can put training in place, but it's having that right attitude. Few and far. What what a, what was your top tip? If someone wants to apply to you, um, well, if they applied to us, they wouldn't. Would they be a recruiter? But um, in t in terms of like general general top tips, like you do yeah, do your research. You know, like um, make yeah, like follow the tips on on what a good what a good CV looks like. Like use your social media. Like I like said already, LinkedIn is my life. Um, but you 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 know make like a a sort of personal brand and like like you said you know connect with people to the company you're applying for that goes a long long a long way um, and if not now then the doors there are open for future and you've made like a new connection in in your community so that yeah that's what i'd say and hannah if if someone's applying to vega what's your top tip um well we've actually got our interviews for our nano degree places next week so hopefully if any of you are watching this might be a bit of a cheat sheet um <laughs> We, um, we're looking for people who have an interest in learning and who are 
sort of demonstrating that they've got, got the commitment to do that. We're, we're less focused on whether what you've done previously matches our tech stack. It's more that, that drive to learn um, and showing that you're, you're really willing to, to do that and you're willing to, to do that yourself. Um, having sort of a self-starter personality is really useful. Um, so yeah, don't be put off if the things that are on your CV in terms of tech don't match what we do, um, because we can teach you that. But having the attitude is something that we want you to come to us with. And Elwyn, if someone wants to apply to Clio, what's your top tip? My top tip, um, don't self-select yourself out of the process. Put the application in and don't underestimate how valuable you are as a female applicant. Because every company, not just Clio, is looking for more women to come into their tech organisations. So you've got a head start from that. Use that to give yourself some confidence and get that application in. Fantastic, inspiring words to um, end the panel on. But we're going to go to Q&A now. Does anybody have any questions in the audience? Straight up. Let's go to the lady in the, uh, the, the stripes, the lovely stripes. Hi. Hi. Um, you were talking about CVs just now, um, particularly of the personal statement that at the top of the CV. Um, since there's not much room for you to write in that section, what are your top uh, topics that we should include in the personal statement? What is the key element in it? Who would like to take that? Cool. Hey, so... Um, I would say, like, who, who are you as a person? And also, like, how do you think as someone in technology, you know, like, or sort of use those words, you know, are you quite analytical? Are you pragmatic? Are you, you know, what, what are you, what you're passionate about within technology? Um, whatever that may be, uh, whether that's about learning about just, yeah, so, you know, certain industries or something like that. But, yeah, just something that's going to make, make it about you, like, show your individuality. Um, that's what I'd say, and it only has to be, you know, it can just be a sentence, two sentences, you, you can do, do more than that, but, um, but yeah, just show how, like, w what you're about, um, with, yeah, within your, like, career path, really, uh, maybe long-term aspirations, like a long-term goal on there is, is sometimes nice to see, um, so yeah, th yeah, things like that. And if you're struggling to do it yourself, something that I found, like, a really good trick is ask a really close friend to describe you. And then what that does is it, it, it takes you outside of yourself. And actually, that's a really, really good trick. And you'd be really surprised how much your friends like you. Ask a friend that likes you. That's important. That's a really important one. Any, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow, we've got lots. Um, lady lady uh, with the glasses. Hello. Hi. What Hi. a great panel. Um, I had a recently interviewed with a company and it's, I was talking to a hiring manager or whoever, the director that was interviewing me. And he, it was a, a male, uh, you know, a white uh, man guy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> how do you navigate around hiring managers when you asked about diversity, they don't seem to bother, they didn't seem to have any good answers. Is it red flags? Is it worth challenging them? Even though maybe the company is great, but the team is, I don't know, maybe questionable. How do you navigate around that? <laughs> I mean, so, uh, yeah, so I, I think that's a great question to ask in the interview. And actually, one of my previous organizations, um, I, um, I actually I, I got offered a really sort of big role. Um, and I wasn't very familiar with that organization, so I actually rejected it initially. Um, and they called me and they said, why are you rejecting us? Um, <laughs> we really want you to join. And I said, well, it's just because in the interview, um, I felt uncomfortable because of the interviewer to ask about diversity and inclusion. And then they actually said, now we want you even more because we're trying to change this in our organization and we need people like you. So um, if it's really important to you, keep asking that question. And and if you're not getting the right response and they give you a role, or, or even if they don't, it may not be the right fit. And that's something as a community we can all do to, to change things um, and to improve that um, equality across our different industries. So yeah, there's, there's still a long way to go. And that's why this organization is amazing. That's why this whole room looks amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes um, you might come across those experiences. And I've certainly come across many of the, them myself as well. It's just keep keeping true to the direction that you want to continue in going. 
um, and, and stick with that. Any other questions? Oh, oh there's so many. This is so hard. Uh, lady at the back, we're going to have one from the back. Thank you for um, the panel. It's been really great so, so far. Sorry, I don't think the mic's on. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, just a little great. bit louder. Um, so thank you for the panel. So my question was really around um, different types of companies. So I noticed some of you are from like really large corporations and some of you are from like startups. So would you say there's a difference in how recruiters look at the type of talent they want or the type of skills they want from like startups compared to bigger companies? Who would like to, who would like to take that? Because we have, we have got many different... Um, people on the panel today we do have startups maybe if we ask well also we've got we've got government as well which is another different um maybe really quickly from a, a startup corporate and government <laughs> so I, i've actually i've got startup and huge corporate oh, experience well, you definitely, yeah. um i would say <laughs> the the big corporations tend to know better what they're looking for because they've done it a million times you're one of a hundred thousand applicants for 100 jobs or something like that. The startup, um, we're going to be a lot scrappier. We've probably put the job advert out before we're completely clear <laughs> on exactly what we want. <laughs> and, and so there actually is an opportunity for you to shape that role. So I would say there's, whilst a startup is going to be a bit less organized, um, maybe a bit more chaotic, you have more potential to influence what it is that you want your role to be. Whereas in the, at least the corporations I've worked in, it's been a bit more clear cut what the process is, what the roles are. Um, you'll still have a fantastic time, but the boundaries are going to be a little bit sharper. Government? Do we have a government perspective on that? Yeah, so I would say it, it would depend which government department it is. Um, I would say we're, we're somewhere between big uh, corporation and startup. Our IT department is 250 people-ish and increasing at the moment. Um, we have kind of all the different roles and skill sets. And like I said, we have got our own IT training academy. So we do train people up. I think that is the kind of maybe the difference that we're not expecting to people to come in and be fully trained. We have everything in place. You know, we've got all plural site training and... Uh, we kind of got a partnership with QA, so we've got plenty of training, and there's also lots of opportunity to kind of move to other roles. If you come in as a, as a grad, there's a two-year program where you'll see different areas of IT, um, and there's also opportunities to move out of IT if you did decide that that actually wasn't what you wanted to do. So, you know, there's a big organisation, and actually the government civil service is even bigger, so it's, it's quite easy to move between, well, easy-ish to move between departments if you think, oh, actually, I don't want to work in the intellectual property office, I'd rather move to, uh, we've got Companies House, it's quite close to us, DVLA, so it's kind of lots of opportunities to move about and, and network with other government departments as well. We're going to take one question from Social. Do we have a question from Social? Uh, yeah, we've got one from Rachel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about career switchers. What is the best way to present non-tech experience? As a career switcher? Yeah. Who would like to take that? Is anybody... Oh, go for it. I could probably take that because I did that. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the best way to do that is to try and, um, try and tailor what you've done. So uh, if you've done something completely different, like, I mean, for example, when I was doing project management stuff, it was very specifically in education but I was able to, to tailor what I'd done to sort of say, this shows an example of my problem solving ability or this shows an example of my teamwork ability. So try and use those examples to match what the job application is looking for and just don't worry about it not necessarily being tech related because it's still applicable. So just try and tailor it to what you've got in the job spec um, and use those examples to just say, this demonstrates this skill. Amazing. I feel like we could have loads more questions. And I know that I feel like there's at least 10 women in this room that wants to, that want to ask more questions. Is everyone going to be here at lunch by any chance? Everyone's going to be here at lunch. So I think you might have long queues of people asking you questions and emailing you. Um, so please do ask your questions over lunch. But thank you very much to our panellists. So please give it up for Clio, Vago, QMPAR, IPO and Nat West. 
Amazing. So up next, uh, we have a very exciting session with one of our long-standing partners uh, at Rolls-Royce. And this segment is called Taking Flight at Rolls-Royce. See what we did there, everyone? <laughs> yes, we did it. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> we talk about airplanes. We don't talk about cars. Um, so we've got four very exciting uh, people from Rolls-Royce here. Um, can we please have uh, Manisha Mystery, Portfolio Director uh, of Digital Culture and Collaboration. <laughs> the wonderful Caroline Gorski, Group Director of R Square Digital Labs, who has got the best t-shirt on ever. <laughs> Uh, Isabel Scavetta, product manager uh, and also CFG alum, uh, Nano and Rolls-Royce intern. <laughs> and Rebecca Hallows, junior technical engineer and CFG alum and Nano degree student. <laughs> oh, do you want to start on the end there? Amazing. Well, it's lovely to have you all here. It's very nice to be here. I mean, you did you did Code Fest when we were back in Twitter. <laughs> how, yeah. mu how much bigger is it? How, what has happened since since you did Code Fest at Twitter? Uh, well, it's certainly very odd to be doing it in a, in real realness as opposed <laughs> to in virtualness, which is you know, uh, and it is so much bigger. Um, uh, and and uh, um, I remember rocking up actually at Twitter because that that's where I used to work years and years ago when I worked for Telefonica because their offices were in the same building in Air Street. And we took a photograph of ourselves, didn't we, with the, with the Twitter sign? Because that was relatively early on in R2 Data Labs' um, sort of trajectory itself. And uh, it was just so exciting to be there and to be in this digital community and to be talking to, to all of you and talking to you about your futures. Um, uh, so, so it's really, it's amazing now to see how it's grown. It's superb. Well done, Anna. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Well done, team. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. um, it would be lovely to just have a quick round of intros and just a little bit more about what you do to, to orient every, everyone. Um, so, Isabel, should we, should we kick off with you? Sure, absolutely. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be with you here today. My name is Isabel Scavetta. I am a previous Rolls-Royce intern in R Square Data Labs, and I'm now a product manager at a startup called Ocular Technologies. I do a lot of work with the CFG community, so the fellowship, mentoring, classes, etc. So really excited to be here today to talk about how all those things intersect. Caroline. Hello, everybody. I'm Caroline Gorski. Uh, thank you very much for the build-up, Anna. I'm gonna, I can only disappoint from here. Um, so I am the group director for R Squared Data Labs, which is Rolls-Royce's data analytics and artificial intelligence business unit. Um, and the joke I made about the cars before is when we say Rolls-Royce, we are talking about the power systems business, the aerospace and uh, large-scale global power generation business and not the luxury car brand, which we sold to BMW about 40 years ago. Um, but that's still the most frequent question I get asked is, do you get a company car? And I'm like, well, yes, but not the sort you think of. <laughs> um, well, what company car do you get? Well, actually, I don't have one. I take the allowance like instead. Like a Peugeot or something? <laughs> no, I have no idea what's on the list. I mean, there are some electric ones, thankfully. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so not that Rolls-Royce, this Rolls-Royce. Uh, but what we do is we look at how emerging data technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, are transforming the industrial world. Um, and this, for me, I think is uh, fascinating in the challenges it opens up for software engineers and coders and ML experts, because here we really are talking about an interface between the digital and the physical. So everything that we do in R Squared Data Labs potentially shows up in real physical products, real physical services, and many of them are safety critical. Uh, and that, I think, sort of raises the bar in lots of ways in when we think about the skills we're looking for and also that the passion and the drive and the ingenuity that we're looking for when we're thinking about y you guys and the sort of population that we can bring into our organisation. So we're thrilled to be major supporters of Code First Girls. We've been working with you guys for a number of years um, and, uh, and we've uh, this year not only taken a number of internships but also hired directly from the Code First Girls community and indeed transferred, transformed some of our interns into direct employees. And I'm sure Rebecca will talk a little bit about that later. Manisha. Hello. 
So I'm Anisha Mystery. Um, I hold the job of, rather than looking at the tech, looking at the people um, within our Squared Data Labs and really thinking about that diversity that Caroline talked through. I think I started this journey probably in terms of connecting with Anna, worked out what she was doing and when I like a lot, I think we should bring that in. <laughs> <laughs> and we went from there steadily onwards and upwards and it's been fantastic. So bringing in mindset, capability, skills, and then really transforming our organization from what, what is a wonderful and really important engineering company to actually a digital first, future orientated business that focuses on data. Amazing, and Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Can you my things on? We can hear you. OK. So oh. I'm a technical assistant in our Square Data Labs um, growth category. And my main role is that I project management for all the admissions frameworks. Oh, I think it is on. You just need to yeah, we, Hello? we can hear you. Oh, yeah. oh it does work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. So like <laughs> <laughs> the power of technology. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I project manage something called the Elithia Framework. as Rolls Royce's ethical toolkit for trustworthy AI. But then alongside that, I'm quite busy completing a lot of like the amazing Code First Girls courses that they offer out to everyone. Rebecca, tell the lovely audience where you were on Wednesday and who Ooh. you were talking to about the Aletheia Framework. So on Wednesday, we were invited to Westminster and we got to do like an event to basically showing, showcasing all the amazing projects that Rolls-Royce has to offer. And one of them was our project with the Aletheia Framework, basically just engaging with MPs and talking to them about what we're doing with to make AI more ethical and trustworthy. How many members of the House of Lords do you now have on your contact list? I think I've got like five really interesting <laughs> business cards. I, I love how you said stuff just. in my backpack. <laughs> it, was, it was the way she's just talking just to. Yeah. Yeah. Just I just No big deal. <laughs> Bossed five lords. <laughs> all, in, all in a day's work. All in the day's work for a Code First Girls al alumni. Um, and it's not ju just the British guests. Now, uh, you may or may not know that Code First Girls has started to work internationally as well. Many of our clients have international needs, like yourselves. Um, and uh, this, uh, sorry, this year and next year, uh, we would have worked in the USA, in uh, Poland, and also in France. And what we're starting to do is construct global nanodegree cohorts so that organizations like R Squared Data Labs and Rolls Royce can actually hire consistently, both in the UK and in the USA and all be learning together. And by magic, we have some pre-recorded introductions. Ooh, ooh, come on guys. <laughs> Go. My name is Nawase Tembo. I am currently working for Rolls-Royce as um, the operations manager in the R Squared um, Data Labs team. My name is Stanislava and I am the software engineer at Rolls-Royce. Code First Girls connected me to, first of all, the role. I was looking into finding a program that would um, support my interest in data science. And in doing so, and pursuing the information on Code First Girls for the nano degree, I came across this operations manager position. The nano degree, software engineering nano degree, was very important for the career at First Voice because. Uh, Mostly we were learning Python, APIs, algorithm design, and uh, we actually used, uh, we were actually building our own API at Rolls-Royce, and the technology stack was very similar. So the math degree is extremely important for everyone, I think, who wants to start a career in technology, uh, whether it's data science or software engineering, because uh, it covers not only coding part, but some very important industry concepts. For example, we covered agile methodology, we covered um, all the tools you need to, to work with when you are becoming a developer. My experience with um, the Nano degree at Code First Girls has been instrumental in exposing me to different tools and putting it together to um, tell a story of some sort. And I learned about APIs um, through um, this, this nano degree program. And it, interestingly enough, in my first week with um, our Square Data Labs, we were talking about um, APIs. So it very much did match a lot of the stuff that I needed to know. I would advise a woman who was looking to develop a background in tech um, to just go for it. Um, I think 
there, there are so many reasons that we will hold back because it sounds like another technical skill that you might not have. But I think just like a lot of the things we learn along the way, you can learn this and you can make it to be a lot of things that you want it to be. For example, like I get to be um, a data scientist and also still work in operations management. So it doesn't exclude your possibilities even if you started. Um, look into a more technical background in, 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 in terms of data science or software development. Just go for it. It's uh, like nowadays, it's, I wouldn't say it's easier, but it's much easier to do because there are so many programs out there. And uh, with those programs, you can just start your career and uh, yeah, just make your dream come true. It's not like 20 years ago anymore. So I would definitely say go for it. Amazing. Some of our US candidates. Um, Isabel, can you give some perspective on your background, how you got into this? You know, because you studied with Code First Girls to, to help you. And what was the experience like? What was your journey like? Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind year from my end. So I graduated last summer uh, from UCL, where I did a degree in Spanish and politics. Absolutely love that, but still had this big curiosity in tech, but I had no idea how to bridge the gap. And I think what CoFest Girls and R Square do so fabulously is help you make that jump. So um, I started off with um, a Python course with CFG, and that kind of introduced me to a lot of core concepts. I'm a product manager now, so I don't code in my day job, but it's really helpful to have an understanding and appreciation of a wide variety of technical concepts. And most importantly, kind of doing the course with Code First Girls really made me more confident that this was a place that I could step into. And I met so many amazing women, lots of people I've kind of seen around the building today as well um, through that journey. And that was in part what made me apply for the internship at R Squared. I'd never applied for anything like it before, but um, read about what they were up to, thought it was really exciting, watched a couple of, I can tell you now that we all know each other, watched a couple of your interviews on the website. <laughs> and I was like, oh, they look really cool. That would be awesome. <laughs> so um, yeah, and that was that. And then we all met kind of on the interview days. I was still very new to a lot of the concepts, but I had that kind of base level understanding of what I was interested in. And I joined the team as an Agile enabler intern. Yeah earlier this year, um, absolutely loved it. And I just happened to notice on my way into work one day that, that you were featured on the BBC because of this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty crazy. So um, that was a couple of months back, I think. Uh, BBC News picked up on that story. I think a really to a hot topic for a lot of people right now is there's so much growing potential in technology. It's one of the most exciting spaces to be. How can we get the right voices in the room and how can we empower people to make that jump? So BBC reached out because they'd heard about a lot of the work that I'd done kind of on this journey in terms of my volunteering with CFG, um, the position at Rolls-Royce, and I got to speak to them about my experience that I'd had um, and how we can get, why events like this are so important, how we can help more people make that transition. And Rebecca, what, you're, what about yourself? How, what's your journey been? Can you describe how, has it been tough? Did you enjoy it? I Is it fun, challenging? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> so I have more of a traditional Rolls-Royce background because I studied aerospace engineering at university. But if anyone that does engineering, there tends to be kind of two pathways. You either take the kind of control systems, kind of technical, digital side with coding, or you do what I did, and I did the more kind of a traditional mechanical and um, physics side of engineering. So I like, massively lacked coding skills. So then during COVID, I'd finished uni, I started working in the world and industry as like a temporary thing. And I was like, oh, I want to learn something new. And I was like, it's a perfect time, not, 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 not much else is going on. And I saw Code First Girls advertised um, for doing a Python course. So I did an introduction to Python course with them. And it was great. And it was from off the back of doing that, that the, I got an email advertising for this role at R Squared Data Labs the project management called the Aletheia Framework. And it was quite a quick turnaround. Like that was like earlier this year, I started joining in February, and now I'm like seven months in to that. Um, and it's been great. So kind of like Isabel, my role doesn't really involve necessarily doing coding, um, but I've actually just been given a permanent position in R Squared Data Labs, and hopefully gonna start picking up some, maybe some technical projects now. Um, recently, just this week, I was like talking to her, someone that I work with, and she showed me kind of like a Python notebook that she works on. And I was like, three months ago, I would have no clue what the hell I was looking at. But I've just finished a nano degree, which I'll be graduating from today. Oh. Yes. Woo. Woo. And I graduated with a what, Rebecca? A distinction. <gasps> oh my God. 
Yeah. And then I was looking at it and I was like, oh my God, like, what a great cause because now I know exactly what I'm looking at. So the, so nan totally the nano helped you understand yeah. your work and get it. Three months ago, I'd have looked at that and pretended I knew what I was looking at, but <laughs> not actually had a clue. And I now mean, I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, I could totally do this now. I mean, I love the confidence. Like, I probably would have done the same. It. But it's great that you actually know what you're doing now, especially 100%. if you're hanging out at the House of Lords. Yeah. Yeah. You need to know your stuff. They don't know how to code in Python. I don't think they know. Oh, I shouldn't say this. Do they know. <laughs> Should they know still what code is? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, um, some of them. Yeah. <laughs> Carolina Minisha, you have got some incredibly talented women that you have found. Tell me, what are you looking for? Why is this so important to you and the future of what you're trying to build? Do you want to start? That's rare. I mean, normally you start and then. No, I know. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> no, it's a rare. This is rare. What happens here? But, um, <laughs> uh, no, the, I mean, surely what you've just heard tells you why it's so important. This is a changing in the tide. We need to make sure that as we move forward, and any organisation, to be fair, I speak beyond just Rolls Royce and R Squared, are looking at that diversity of thought, of practice of bringing new innovations in. And the only way we do that is making sure we're reaching in new channels and extending the way we do things and giving opportunity. Because actually, when you listen, Spanish was it? Spanish? Isabel? Si. Si. <laughs> yeah. I so, thought you were talking to me. No, sorry. No. I'm definitely Scouse, Manisha. <laughs> yeah, no, you're definitely Scouse. Um, but when you think about some of the pathways, I'm from an arts background. Carolina Arts as well? Shh. We didn't start in tech, is my point, but that does not mean the doors are not open. And what we need to do is show that anyone from any background, in any position, can come through. It doesn't matter age, gender, colour, ethnicities, all of the above. It's like, how do you make sure you culminate that group? And for me, that's what this journey with Code First Girls has allowed us to do, but it's also allowed us to test ourselves, to say, are we an organisation that can do this, that can adapt itself to make them feel at home? And I think, you know, we can't just look at the how you open up channels. You've also got to look at how welcoming are you as an organisation. So we've had to do a lot of rethink. We've had to reshape, reconsider, stand alongside as opposed to just in front of these wonderful people that are coming in and make sure that we're listening as well and adapting as we go. So I think there's a few bits here that we're still learning, but, you know, you have to take into account on journeys like this. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, everything that Manisha said, plus uh, also. Um, so one of the real challenges that big industrial, traditional industrial companies like Rolls Royce face, right, is that we are we are fundamental to solving some of the biggest problems that our world has, right? But we've spent 150 years contributing, <laughs> let's be honest, to the development of those problems, and the, the practices and the approaches that we've had in the past have tended to be about very long-term, very high capital investment structures into very, very deep, complex technology. And many of the ways that we need to solve these problems that we're now facing require a much more iterative, much more experimental, much more digitally-led, much more data-oriented approach that is collaborative. So we, as Rolls-Royce, need to think really radically about what that means for the way we think, the way we behave, how we, who we bring in, how we challenge groupthink, how we increase diversity. And I don't just mean diversity of gender or race or, or ethnicity. I mean diversity of thinking and diversity of experience. And so working with an organisation like Code First Girls is really, really important because it helps us to... To, to, to really challenge ourselves to think about how can we support solving some of the world's biggest problems by, by asking ourselves how do we continue to be an ethical 21st century technology business, which is what we are uh, and what we always, we always have been a technology business, but we need to, we need to turn ourselves into a technology business that is suitable for the 21st century. And, and I think these kinds of relationships are part of how we do that. Now, I know, because I see the secret stats, there's a lot of women that want to work for Rolls-Royce and Nod Squared Data Labs. How'd you get in? What, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do to impress? 
Isabel, what did you, what the was this, magic. what's the magic? Mm, wish I could know. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll say from my perspective, you guys may think very differently. Um, I think something that I really enjoyed about the interview process at our squad is I think we were really open. I laughed a lot. <laughs> they, I don't, you meant to laugh? It was like a, it was like a four-hour <laughs> thing, and I think we had a great time. Um, I think something that I really enjoyed during my kind of like interview and assessment at Art Squared was it was really varied. So we did a variety of things. I got kind of opportunities to chat one-on-one -on -one with some of the team who I would then be working with. But we also did a couple of group exercises. I gave a presentation about a technical concept. Again, I can now say was very new to me at the time, but it was felt very supportive and engaging and I think being upfront about what I knew what I'd learned but also that most of my learning had been sort of self-led and new and recent and that was okay because I was really excited to learn more I think was a really positive part of that interview experience for me so I would say I think a lot of people with technical interviews or interviews with new firms think that you need to come and you need to trick them into thinking that you know everything. Like, you don't come from the right background, whatever it is, but it's fine, like, you fixed it all yourself, and it's gonna be okay. I think, actually, sometimes the, the converse is true. Mm -hmm. Saying, hey, you know what? I've learned this so far. I've really loved it. You know I'm passionate, because I'm doing this myself. And I think that this could be a really great step for me to apply that, like, resilience and kind of growth mindset is a really positive part of interviewing at any firm. And that was my experience at R Squared. Rebecca, what about yourself? What did what did you do to, to impress, do you think? Well, so on the, on the interview day, I've told it to us before, but Isabel was unbelievable. <laughs> and when I started joining the call, I was like, game over. There's no way I've got this job. <laughs> but then I was like, hang on a minute, competitive advantage. Let's try and fight to get this job. Um, but then it worked out because we both got hired. Yeah, now we're mates. Yeah. So, yeah. So, no, it's totally fine. so what you just said is really interesting. So we, we were talking about this recently, the extent to which sometimes you, you weigh up who else is in the room mm. and you, you self-select out because you say, there's no way I'm going to compete against that. Um, and we, we find it quite a lot with, with women in our community. We go, hang on a minute. You're bringing something to the table that, that could be completely different or complementary. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point of a team, right? Yeah. You don't want everyone that's the same. Yeah, and I was on the flip side being like, you have a literal engineering degree. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have Googled a lot. Like, it was amazing. So I think we all kind of perceive each other differently, right? And so perceive ourselves well, differently. You're both in the room just having girl envy over each other. And yeah. like, I'm going to walk out and get an Uber because I'm know, not going to get the job. Do you know what the funniest part of it all was, right? Because mm -hmm. Caroline, we were all in different rooms because obviously it's COVID, so none of us were actually together. And I remember I'm on WhatsApp with Caroline <laughs> and we're watching this. So we, we were observers in one of these particular activities where this was playing out a little bit and we could see it. And you chipped in because it was mainly the Isabel show. No offence. But uh, <laughs> no then, then, then we heard Rebecca <laughs> coming in. We're, we're both actually deciding what the solution is because that's <laughs> what we were doing. Mm. And, um, and suddenly it was like, oh, I know. Oh, what's this? oh, this is good. I like, you know, and you could see it. But it was brilliant because it was just, that is real life. You know, you're going to get these contests that take place day to day in small amounts or large amounts. And I thought it was fantastic because it just showed the sudden change of confidence that had occurred in this virtual space where they were trying to work out how to get a robot over a fake bridge that they had to build. Mm. And, um, and then there was, there was a couple of glaring errors that they hadn't quite cottoned on to yet. And the time was ticking away and I'm like... There was this amazing <laughs> moment where Rebecca just went in... I don't know if you, you remember this, in the, in the deadest pan voice I've ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's not going to work because of this. And came out with a mechanical, <laughs> with a mechanical principle. And you could see the others go, shit, she's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. And that, and that laughter came through. And it just broke. You know, you could see breaking of that tension, that concern of I've got to try and get a job mm. or somebody stronger than You know, it was, it was really funny. I mean, we tried to show that we were genuinely judging this properly. But at the end, we were like, this is our solution. <laughs> Yeah, we wouldn't let them present their solution until we'd shown them what we came up with yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> exactly as it should be. Obviously, you can't have fun when you're hiring people, then what on earth is the point? Yeah. Um, Caroline, what about, what about yourself? What impressed you? What, what, what do you go for? What are you looking for? Um, the first thing we're looking for is curiosity, to be perfectly honest. And your community has that in spades. Because, I mean, you, know, you have to be curious to, to want to join Code First Girls and to want to, to you know, be part of this community and, and you know, take forward your learning and, um, and, and engage with all of the, the great stuff that you do. So, so curiosity is, is super important. The other thing that we look for 
specifically for R squared, is the ability to collaborate. So these guys may have felt that they were in competition with each other, which they were, but ultimately, from our perspective, we were looking for people who could work well in a team, who were able to not only understand their strengths, but also their weaknesses, and call on other members of the team to complement them. And so it's, I think that team working capability is, is really, really critical, especially as if, if you remember, we were hiring in a pandemic. So that went up the, the importance level, because now we're not only asking for team working skills, we're asking for people who can do that entirely remotely which is really challenging. So, um, so those were, were, were really what we were focused on trying to, to find. I mean, clearly, technical capability is important, but it's not by any means the most important thing. Your friend has a sign. <laughs> My friend does have a sign. Hello, friend Kim with the sign. Um, <laughs> Supposed to be subtle. That's Sorry. Supposed to <laughs> it, is so it was a big sign. It is a sign, though. I get it. It is a sign. I mean, maybe we should have a, a more subtle sign. Maybe bigger next time. Um, that sign's indicating that we need to go to Q and A. Um, who would like to ask some questions from the audience? I can see one hand. I can see you one have hand. To put it up a bit higher. Though. It, you need to put it up higher. Yeah. <coughs> you could stand Hi. up if you don't. If you wouldn't object, because then we can see you. Lovely. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for the panel. Um, I had a little question. So one of the themes today is about like the importance of diversity of thought um, and diversity of background, like uh, specifically from hiring from CFG. Uh, what kind of feedback have you had from managers on like the impact that CFG alumni have had? Oh, good question. Uh, so my managers, well, are they are they are incredibly positive about the CFG alumni that we've worked with. Um, so if I think about Ian, who is who heads up our technology business and is based out in the States, um, he essentially, well, three things. Firstly, he, he came back after the hiring process to say he now had the most diverse team of any of us. So he <laughs> reckons that he should get an award for having the most diverse team of any of us on all measures. So that, that's one thing. We, we, I didn't want him to win out there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I did like to point out to him that I am actually a woman and so is Manita. So <laughs> surely, you know, that, that gives us a little bit of a head start anyway. Um, but yeah, no, he now has this fabulously diverse team. And, and he has been, you know, hugely uh, positive about the, the, both the speed of the response to his requirements, but also the quality and capability of, of, the, of the team members that he's brought on board. If I think here about our intern program, you know, we've hired one of them. We, we offered another one of them, but she turned us down to go and work for a startup. And, uh, and, uh, our, and our third intern ha has also gone off and, and, and you know, qualified herself for, for an excellent job in the, in the external market as well. So I think that's, that's testament to both, well, really to the quality of the, of the, of the candidates, um, but it, it, it's, it's been amazing. We, um, I mean, we would not put, let me just put it in a little bit of context. Rebecca, has been working with us for seven months, and on Wednesday, she stood up in front of members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons and talked about a major piece of work that Rolls-Royce is, is putting out into the public domain as its project manager. We would not let somebody stand up in front of members of the House of Lords as the project manager of a major project if we didn't think she was absolutely outstanding. We just wouldn't do it. So the quality... Uh, of the candidates and the feedback that we have from our managers about the work that they do is 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 really out of this world. I should just add to that, we're doing it again next year, folks. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. sorry, yes, please so, do. So, you know, just adding that one in that we've now brought this into the Rolls-Royce practice and processes of, of how we look to recruit. So we are extending the way we think and seek talent. So Code First Girls is now our champ. Mm. And also, the, on that point, the management team who worked with Isabel on the project that she was leading on were so impressed with Isabel that they asked us, how can they get Code First Girls as girl, girlers? Code First Girlers? Is that how you say it? I, I haven't come up with something yet, girls. but... Uh, alumni. Yeah. Uh, they, want, they want some alumni too. What wonderful. What, what, this is fantastic. We need to get them to diary. Um, any, oh, well, there we go. More questions. Um, this lady here with the... I was going to say with the pink band around. We've all got pink <laughs> bands, haven't I? I know I wanted to ask this before because um, everyone's just been so great, but when you talk about applications and stuff, if someone's been on Eventful, 
is it wise to apply again for the same institution or just keep it moving? Because everyone said, oh, the lady at NatWest said uh, she applied for Microsoft and didn't get it, and then it was a learning uh, uh, to, to apply for somewhere else. But is it wise to apply again and for the same place that has just rejected you? Or should you learn from it and bugger off elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think... You're definitely going to get that rover over the bridge a second time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get um, it a second time. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you've made, if you've done further development, you know, if there's things, if well, okay, so let me just take one step back. A, any decent large-scale industrial or indeed small-scale, any decent hiring organisation worth its salt will keep track of people that they liked but couldn't hire because they had filled their quotient with you know some other candidates, right? So. You, I think if you have applied and had good feedback but haven't got a role, then you should definitely reapply because a decent organisation should be keeping track of the fact that they liked you but they couldn't hire you the first time around. Um, I think to improve the likelihood of you being successful the second time, it would be helpful if you were able to show development, either specific development if they were... If they were if they gave you actual feedback that you can work on, but I am aware that not all organisations are necessarily terribly good at giving structured feedback to rejected candidates. So if you haven't had any structured feedback about what you need to work on, then at least some evidence of development that you know you think matches perhaps what whatever it was that didn't meant you didn't get selected the last time round. But yes, I would encourage you. I mean, unless unless you have the sense that the organisation really has just kind of gone, you know, control alt delete and then in which case, don't waste your time. Um, I would actually say the same for the nano degree. So obviously, we, we've had, we had a massive number of applications. We've only got a certain number of spaces. Actually, it doesn't mean that you're not good enough if you don't get a place. Actually, what it can mean is for whatever reason, it's just not the right time in the right area, in the right region where we have the roles, OK? In fact, there's so many candidates where we think they're exceptional, but for whatever reason, we just can't match them at the time. But you know what? We'll be able to in the next cohort or the cohort after that. Sometimes it's just a question of timing. We also have candidates that, for whatever reason, for example, might not get through the tech assessments. We'll go back and we say, you know what? Go back and do the learning again. You can have another chance. This is where we think that you should you know, go forward. Or equally, in interview, we can say, you need to do this, this, and this, and that will help you get to the interview stage with one of our companies. So it just might not be the right place or the right time, but my advice is 100% keep going. You will, for example, in our scheme, you will get a nano degree if you, if you keep going, and we have the, the time and the, the employer, we'll, we'll give it to you. Um, we had loads of questions at the front. Oh, we had like three, amazing. Mm -hmm. We have a cluster of three. Ruth, lady. Um, thank you so much. Can I just say that the presence of this panel is just unparalleled. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> my question is more related to the AI ethical frameworks that R2 Data Labs has. Um, I just think it's it's really um, interesting that you know like you've also presented or participated in the House of you know Lords. So my question is, what is the relationship that you have um, with kind of like? the public sector, and how does this framework um, contribute to R2 Data Labs and beyond? Um, so the framework was originally created in Rolls Royce to like, solve an internal issue, but when it was kind of created, it looked at it and realized like this could be really useful for like other sectors, for other people outside of Rolls Royce. So it was like released last year publicly under a Creative Commons license, so like literally anybody used it. And then my like day-to-day -day job is just keeping in contact with external stakeholders, and just trying to like help to, so someone I works with has a really good analogy. He calls it that Rolls Royce should be guide dogs of ethical AI and not guard dogs. We shouldn't necessarily own it, but we should, if we've got the capability and the skills and the knowledge, we should be helping other companies and other sectors to help improve their own ethical AI. Uh, lady behind, and then there was one lady here as well. If you want to download it, by the way, it's on the Rolls Royce website, so help yourself. Uh, thank you. I have a question about, you said uh, you're working with data to solve problems that were not solved in the past and that have been created. Um, in the automobile industry, I heard a lot about the fact that, for example, the seats and all of the things were designed for males, um, that you have more risks of uh, serious injuries and death and things like that if you're a female. Uh, is it something that 
you're currently working on using data and these kind of things? That, so you, absolutely, I, I, I recognize the challenge. It's not only a challenge in the design of, um, of components uh, in, in machinery. It's also a problem for the design of military uniforms. Jet, female jet pilots don't have uh, seat belts that allow them to uh, properly sit in jet, fighter jet seats. Uh, it's also a problem for health. Uh, so the, the diagnostic rates of diagnosing heart attacks in women are disproportionately low compared to the diagnostic rates of diagnosing heart attacks in men because all of the research and understanding what a heart attack looks like is based on men suffering heart attacks and not on women suffering heart attacks. And the symptoms are different, which itself is just a fascinating and terrifying thought. So I completely agree, it's a problem. In terms of what our Square Data Labs is looking at, um, our focus uh, you know, for within Rolls-Royce is, is oriented towards questions uh, dominated in, in many instances by how do you look at more sustainable ways of making and consuming power, because that's what we do as a business. But over the last 12 months, we've be been beginning to work with external organizations and take Ask Where Data Labs' capability out to other companies. And with them, we are addressing a, you know, a number of, of industrial challenges. Uh, that would include uh, bigger and more broadly defined challenges around sustainability, not just sustainable power, but also we're beginning to look at questions of uh, human rights, sustainability in supply chains. We're beginning to look at questions of um, waste management from a sustainable perspective. Um, and we're also beginning to look at supply chain risk and resilience. So there are a number of, of, of fields in which we um, we apply our capability, not specifically, as I say, yet to that question of, uh, of industrial design for gender um, and, the, and the sort of discrepancies that occur there. But if somebody came to us with a question that they wanted us to explore, I would be thrilled to get into that. I know there was one front that was really eager to ask a question. So, um, I have a question for Rebecca. I come from like a similar background. Like I did a physics degree, but I focused more on like the theoretical mathematical concepts. How did you find adjusting to working for Rolls Royce and being in the position that you're in? Um, yeah. I think doing the courses of code first girls like really prepared me for like, the digital skills that was needed for my job. Because even if I'm not necessarily using technical digital skills, I'm still in conversations about them all the time. And it's like really useful to be able to like, at least understand like what's going on to be able to like perform your job correctly. So if you haven't done a course with them, then I'd definitely recommend doing one if you wanted to do a switch to digital like I did. Amazing. Lots more women have arrived outside, which tells me one thing, that lunch has arrived. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, R-Squared Data Labs and Rolls-Royce. Big round of applause. <laughs> and you're, sti you're sticking around for lunch, right? Because I think you've got a lot more questions, actually, that we couldn't get sure. to. Amazing. Yes, no problem. Everyone, please go and have some lunch.
more content. So if anybody is outside and has got their lunch, like pre please bring it in. It's no problem at all. Um, welcome back to day uh, two of CodeFest 2021, uh, which uh, is headline sponsored by um, the amazing Avast. Um, how's everyone enjoying it so far? <laughs> Freddie, I'm so glad you got front row. <laughs> leading, leading the charge, fantastic. Um, so to kick off uh, this afternoon's session, we are going to be talking about our research paper. So we launched our hackathon in the previous session, and every year we try to do at least one large hackathon and one big research paper. The reason for that is because not only do we think that, uh, you know, the Code First Girls response and what you think is important, but we're also looking for different trends uh, where we can bring our community's viewpoint so we can shine a light on some of the biggest social issues of the day. Uh, and this year, we have decided to uh, focus on race and culture in the workplace. Uh, and we have produced a research paper in collaboration with Fleur, the wonderful Fleur over here, on how to build a culture that attracts and retains talent. Uh, and I'm really, really happy to say that this year, the research paper has been sponsored by NatWest, which is fantastic. Uh, and a couple of points as to, as to why we did this. And, you might not know this, but um, Code First Girls, if you look at the makeup of the community, 57% of uh, the Code First Girls community identifies being from underrepresented ethnicities. So not only are we one of the biggest groups in terms of uh, gender diversity, but we are in terms of underrepresented uh, ethnicities as well. So um, this is really, really important and a topic that is uh, massively close to our hearts. So I would like to introduce Nat West. We, we've already heard from the wonderful uh, Jan uh, Gu. <laughs> and I will leave you to, to introduce the, the paper and what, why you sponsored it. Do you want to grab a mic? Oh, yes. Right. Hello again, everyone. So I'm really excited um, to declare that Nat West has um, sponsored this paper. It's really been a partnership made in heaven, really, because it's directly aligned um, with our purpose. And um, as a bank, we are a purpose-led bank, which means that we believe that um, all of the communities that, that we operate in, it's really our role as a bank to help the people, our businesses, who are all of our customers, thrive. And also, we believe that if we are also representative, if we are inclusive, that has longer term benefits for our business and our, our communities because that is the purpose of our bank. Um, and in terms of our own colleagues, it's really important to us as a bank as well because to have a really inclusive culture means that everybody can bring their best selves to work. And that's really important, not just for our colleagues' experience and the way they interact with each other and our customers, um, but it really has a tangible effect on innovation and how we can really bring the best products and services to our customers as well. And of course, it's, it's the right thing to do. And so we're really excited to, to um, sponsor this paper and the insights from this paper has been, you know, it's, it, I think it really needs to be spoken more about. And we wanted to support this event and this paper because there are just so many uncomfortable truths that really need um, to be debated further. While we've made really good progress, there's still so much more progress to make. Um, so it's really been aligned with a lot of initiatives um, that we've been starting and we've spearheaded even before 2020 and before this really took mainstream media. Since, since 2018, we've worked with the government to um, be a signatory on the race charter um, for equality. And, uh, and we've also had targets as an organization to make sure that our colleagues are representative of the communities that we work in. So in the UK, there are 14% of people who recognize themselves as BAME. And within our organization at NatWest, we're actually at 15%. So we're slightly more representative, which is great. But for us, that's not good enough because we really want our leadership to also be equally representative. And at the moment, we're at 9%. And by 2025, we also want to be at 14%, and, and we've made those commitments as well. So really delighted to introduce this paper. And uh, yes. Thank you very much. It was an amazing intro. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Daryl and uh, Evie from uh, Fleur. If you could take the stage, please. I think 
Are you presenting, no? Oh, perfect. I can stand up. Yeah, go for it. Listen. I would I would own this stage, Daryl. It is yours. Yes, and do I have the clicker? I, that's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> we do have the clicker. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, just to say it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be working with Code First Girls on this and hugely, hugely grateful to NatWest for being our sponsors for this paper. I think it's really important that organizations across many different industries have a real deep dive into the cultures that they have. And this paper was trying to give an insight into some of the experiences that women across many industries have in relation to race and ethnicity in the workplace. And the findings aren't always comfortable. We looked at different things such as what are the experiences in terms of racist behaviors that are being experienced and in terms of racial inclusion barriers. But what we really want to do with this is to shine a light on some of these experiences so that organizations could take forward some improvements um, and basically make sure that they attract and retain talent going forward. So we on to the next slide. In terms of how we actually produce the report, so we worked with Code First Girls, we surveyed just under a thousand members of the community. Maybe the case that some people in the room today were actually part of filling out the survey. It will click soon. Um, we also gathered the lived experience of dozens of women from all sorts of backgrounds, and that was able to give us a real sense of the qualitative side of things in terms of people's experiences. So you have quotes like the one you can see there in terms of people's experience when it comes to race and ethnicity within the workplace. And in terms of the actual data analysis, what we did was we looked at a few key areas. So the first was around the racial inclusion barriers that are being faced by women within the workplace. We also looked at how frequently different forms of racism are actually being experienced. We looked at what are the factors that matter most to women from all backgrounds when it comes to race and ethnicity. And lastly, we try to give some tangible steps on what organizations can actually do to move the dial and to make a change with some of the issues that have been faced. So what are some of the key things that we found out? Well, the report itself has actually been released right now, um, but I just want to give you a snippet of some of the different pieces of information. So the first key finding was around um, the experience of ethnic minority women in terms of feeling their ethnicity is a noticeable barrier to feeling included at work. And I'll dig into this a bit deeper, but this related to things like feeling it was harder to be themselves, harder to receive promotion opportunities. And that was a piece of feedback and data that we consistently saw within the data from the survey. The second thing we noticed was around racist behaviors. So we did a deep dive on what types of racist behavior, if any, are actually being experienced within the workplace. And what we saw was that by far the most common forms were racial microaggressions and racist jokes. And those were basically reflected in both the lived experiences as well as the actual quantitative data as well. And then the last thing we saw in the feedback around what factors are most important was that having a racially diverse workforce is simply not enough for organizations we really gathered the feedback that racial diversity alone isn't the only driver of whether people are attracted to work in a company or whether they feel that they can belong and whether they feel they want to stay. And there are a range of other factors such as the way that people are treated and the way that people feel comfortable talking about racism within the workplace that actually ranked higher as a factor for actually importance in terms of people's experiences. So the first bit of data was around racial inclusion barriers. And I'll just explain a tiny bit about how this works. So Flair as an organization, we survey people from all sorts of industries and we have a method to basically analyze the different racial inclusion barriers that have been faced by different groups. And the way that we do this is that we've come up with a list of different factors that everyone should have access to. So things like being yourself in the workplace, accessing fair opportunities, accessing promotion opportunities. And based on the responses within the survey, we're able to create a measure of how big the racial inclusion barriers are for different groups. And what we found is that generally speaking, across the people that we sample, 
a score above two out of 10. So it works on an inverse scale where zero is the best and there's no barriers at all. And 10 is hypothetically the worst. A score above two suggests that there are noticeable barriers for that particular group. And what we saw in the survey was that ethnic minority women are facing barriers that are greater than the score of two. Um, and white British women in this particular case were facing barriers that were smaller than this barrier. So this suggests that there are some issues in terms of feeling included that are driven by race and ethnicity related factors. We then dug into this a bit more. So we split things up in terms of the five ethnic groups within the UK census data. And we saw that the experience of Asian women and black women was particularly um, severe in terms of the racial inclusion barriers being faced. And then when we actually dug into why this is actually happening, so when I talk about racial inclusion barriers, what are the actual things that are getting in people's way and making them feel harder to be included? And the main things we saw were around, let's get this working, um, were around people feeling that their ethnicity made it harder to be themselves and also access promotion opportunities. So what we found is that 35% of the ethnic minority women that we surveyed felt that their ethnicity made it harder to be themselves at work, and 29% felt their ethnicity made it harder to receive promotion opportunities. So those were the top two reasons that were flagged. And when it came to things like being themselves, we often heard feedback around things like people mispronouncing my name, people, for example, asking me to go to social events that didn't really relate to my culture. And there was those things that on the face of it seemed small from the perception of the people who were having these issues that were really chipping away at their sense of being themselves. And I think that's uh, reflected in this quote here. So um, it mentions here that mispronouncing names and play on words that is often said in jest has been uncomfortable. So this is the type of thing that I myself, growing up throughout my life, have seen. It can be something that does doesn't seem to be that big, but when someone's name is, is, let's say, constantly mispronounced, that can really chip away at you. And another quote here around, I say, more, more overt form of, of racism, where someone's experienced a range of different things. For example, being told that their braids look like they're preparing for Halloween. Um, and that was another piece of feedback that we got within the quotes. So. The next uh, aspect of the research was around actual experiences with racism within the workplace. And it's not a pleasant thing to talk about, but we've seen with so many organizations we've worked with that it just happens and we need to actually see the data in order to be able to, to, be able to address it. As I mentioned, racial microaggressions came out as the most frequent form of racism. And across all industries, it was just over 30% of ethnic minorities of women feel that they've recently been a victim of racial microaggressions at work. And just below that was racist jokes, which was just under 30% as well. Then racial discrimination and racial harassment was slightly less frequent in the survey. But nonetheless, these figures, it should be zero for every single stat. And as an example, for one of the groups that we looked at, we saw that over half of the black women that we surveyed felt that they'd recently been on the end of racial microaggressions at work. So that in itself goes back to some of the things I talked about before with the things that may seem small but can really have an impact. And again, some of these quotes really bring that to life. So for example, the fact that oftentimes it's the covert forms of racism that can be most damaging in the workplace. And it's often difficult for the women involved in the survey to even know whether it's worth addressing and some people who simply just weren't willing to share their stories. So this woman here basically saying that she's not ready to, to explain what's happened to her and talk about her experiences. And again, you also get the very extreme end of people actually leaving their jobs because of these experiences. So again, this is a quote from the survey of someone who actually left their job due to microaggressions and bullying and in the end became depressed. So the last section was looking at which race-related factors actually matter most to women within the workplace and looking across all the people that we surveyed. And what we actually saw was that the most um, important factor from the survey was around 
people feeling they needed to work in an organization where there was equal treatment of people from all ethnic backgrounds. And the second most significant factor was around people feeling they needed to work in an organization where there's comfort talking about race and discussing race. And I think what's very interesting there is that racial diversity is a, is a very important metric. And oftentimes, organizations see this as one of the key things to focus on. But this kind of shows that it's not the only thing. And there are so many other factors that are important to not just the next generation of people within companies, but people working in companies right now. And any organization that's trying to create a racially equal culture needs to really focus on a range of different factors, such as the top three in this case. Um, and again, this is reflected by the feedback we had from women from all backgrounds. So here um, we have feedback as a white person, find it shocking and abhorrent when they witness race jokes and racist comments. And somebody else as well, again, another white employee who basically brought up some of the experiences that they were witnessing and the complaints weren't taken seriously and then they then left the company. So I guess it's not all doom and gloom and I guess the way to think of things is where can organizations and where can society take things forward and how can we use these insights to really make a positive change? I think the first thing is around firstly having a strategy to actually collect this data as an organization. The thing about issues related to race is that it's very hard to actually understand what's going on unless you do a real deep dive because people's experiences with racism are often held to their chest and I've been in that position myself where I don't feel comfortable sharing what's going on with my superiors or people around me. So you really need to find a way of gathering the insights in order to know what problems there are and what needs to be fixed. And obviously this research paper is designed to help with this, but each organization has its own unique structures and situations. So you really need to have that same process yourself. The second thing is to make sure, I can't quite read that. Yeah, so um, don't just focus on the big audacious solutions. Oftentimes it can be easy to think, okay, we need to make a change, so we need to do something really, really big. But as I mentioned, some of the issues that we spotted in the survey are things that can have a tiny little shift that can make a huge difference. So one of the recommendations we give within the report is around the mispronunciation of names and something as simple as having a tool that helps to um, give an audio version of someone's name, like for example, what LinkedIn recently released, that can make a massive difference to then going into a meeting, meeting someone for the first time and being called what you're actually called. And things like that may not cost any money at all, but it might have a massive impact on the people that are experiencing different things. And then the last thing is just to move the conversation away from purely racial diversity. I completely understand why a lot of organizations focus here and we speak to HR leaders, DNI leaders every single week. And one of the main reasons is because it's really difficult to measure racial equality and how people are feeling. And racial diversity can be easier to measure but we really can't just focus on that as a way of seeing whether we're building a world that is um, inclusive for everyone working there because the diversity piece is just one part of the puzzle and really we need to look at things holistically. So yeah, I hope the report itself is very helpful and as I said, it's now been released. So if you head to both the Code First Girls website and the Flare website, and I'm sure we'll be putting it all over social media as well. You'll be able to then actually read the full report and see all the details um, more specifically. But again, a huge thanks to NatWest for sponsoring this. And also a huge thanks for everyone for actually taking part in the research and being so open with their experiences. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I just wanted, can we, can we move the, um, thank you. Um, just, when I read the report, it actually uh, humbled me uh, in a way that I can't really describe. Um, I wanted to know your initial reactions to some of the findings that. Um, yeah, so, so when I read the report, it's definitely very sobering. And I'd, I'd echo um, the thanks to all of the Code First Girls community for being very candid to supply your real, true experiences. And um, sometimes, um, I personally sometimes find myself in a situation where 
um, one, I'm the only woman in the room <laughs> um, out of, for example, um, a senior leadership team of 12, 13 other uh, men and predominantly white, white men. Um, and sometimes without having the report, you feel like it's just, um, it might just be an isolated experience. So I think the main thing about the report is to really um, provide this wake up call to all organizations across the industry to say this is still a real problem across our industry and it's something that um, bringing into the conscious and surfacing is I think one of the only ways to really solve that problem. Um, one of the elements that I read in the report about covert um, racism or covert microaggression is where individuals might feel uncomfortable and I've been in that situation too where I felt uncomfortable but I'm not exactly sure why. So then raising that conversation again, then it helps everyone to actually understand what's going on. Um, and certainly what's quite striking sometimes is um, when you have a conversation with a manager or a peer about it, um, and even to go as far as to challenge that conversation, I think what's really poignant is all of the quotes from um, the, the members of the um, Code First Girls community who identify themselves as white and are equally uncomfortable by um, sort of behaviours uh, that are seen. So having more of this conversation is, is really the only way forward to start to change the dial um, and really truly bring our entire environment mm -hmm. to be much more inclusive. And it's going to be better for everyone. It's actually not just going to be better for a minority, it's actually going to benefit everyone. Um, if I could come to uh, Eve now. Um, something that got me like a bit of a brain harpoon reading this report were the personal quotes and the personal stories. The fact that this is lived experience, looking at a data set is one thing, right? Drawing out patterns and, and charts, but the lived experience, how, how is that different and, and what's the significance of that? Sure. I think when we collect qualitative data, it really speaks to the human problem that this has, that racism does affect actual people. And I think sometimes if we get caught up just looking at data solely, you lose sight of that there are people behind these statistics. So it's essentially important to really raise awareness that these are people's lived experiences. And I think as well, it helps us to empathize with different points of views from our own. And actually with that empathy drives some sort of action or should drive some sort of action. Yesterday, uh, we, we talked about in one of the, the uh, panel discussions about um, how diversity and inclusion has, has moved on over the past 10 years. And a lot of industry leaders seem to be of the opinion um, that inclusion should lead over diversity now in terms of the way organizations should look at it. Um, and equally, there was some sense uh, yesterday in the panel discussion that it had moved from somewhat of a tick box activity to a sense of we need to make genuine change here for several incredibly important reasons. And Daryl, I want to come to you on this. What are those reasons and are you say, seeing that change within organisations? Yes, to some extent. I think there's definitely progress, but I think a lot of organisations have started at a very early stage and they're gradually moving towards a place where, as you said, inclusion is taken more of a forefront in the discussion. That's not to say that diversity isn't, isn't hugely important as well. I think from a business perspective in terms of why are the reasons why it's important, I, you can look at things in two ways. One is the, the business case, which, which some people buy into around, ultimately, if you're an organization, you don't get this right. We're grown up in a world where people will just start to not come to the company, people won't stay, people won't thrive, people won't progress. You'll be investing a lot of money into talent that doesn't actually stay with you. So that's the business sense. But I fundamentally just think it's it's the, the humane sense, first and foremost, and reading some of those quotes, seeing some of those experiences, and hearing what people are going through, that is in itself enough of a reason for any business leader or person to, to really want to make a change. So. I always fundamentally say that that should be the driving force, but I'm not naive enough to know that that's always going to be the case. I know that some people don't necessarily know the experiences that people are having. So I think that's why it's so important to surface this type of data, because 
when you see the data, when you see the stories, when you speak to people, it's very hard to not feel something. And sadly, that involves people opening up and giving their own experiences, which is very, very difficult. But I also think that that is probably the catalyst for actual sustained change going forward. How do you think success can be measured here? Is it is the first step surfacing some of the results and some of the data? I mean, I'm going to put that out there to the panel. Do you, how do we measure success? How do we think that we've moved the dial and made genuine change? Well, um, when we sign up to, to the race equality charters, um, we're, we're committing to surfacing the quantitative data. Um, and, and initially, that may be what organizations are good at doing initially. Um, so I think that's why the report is really powerful, because it surfaces those true human voices. Um, and from a long-term perspective, it's that connectivity with your real colleagues around you, what's going on, that's really going to sustain more momentum around change. Uh, but certainly, the quantitative side, that is still quite important, because it keeps us accountable mm. for the progress and what's going on. Um, so within our organization, it's voluntary for individuals to declare what their ethnicity is. Um, and in NatWest, 86% of our staff self-declare what their ethnicity is, um, which is above the industry average of 70%. And, and, we, and we find that um, is a really good sign that people feel safe doing that and understand that that's their contribution to us understanding how we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, also, what we monitor as well is the proportion of our leadership who are from um, minority backgrounds or backgrounds where we're targeting improvement. So we both monitor from a gender perspective that we're hitting that critical mass of that 30% target at our senior levels, and, and we've, we've hit that for quite a long time. I, I'm, I'm pleased to brag. Um, and, and like I mentioned, for our BAME backgrounds, we're currently at 9%, and we really, really want to get to 14%, because that is completely um, in line with our purpose, that we want everyone within our organization to be really representative of the populations and the communities that we operate in. So from a gender perspective, um, by 2030, we want all of our employees to represent a 50-50 split across, um, across our bank. Um, and then from a BAME perspective, we're expecting our leadership, because we've already hit the um, wider population target of 14%, um, so we're at 15 now. Um, so, but from a leadership perspective, um, we want to also reach 14% from a leadership perspective. So those things are measurable, mm -hmm. which helps us to keep ourselves in check. But then there are those complex factors around culture that we still need um, a lot more support like through the research to work on. And what's really great about the advice to different organizations, it really helps to be an enabler, not just for us as a bank, but for everyone across the organization and across the industry. And that actually helps all different organizations to move forward. And uh, Eve, come back to you. We've had a lot of organ uh, advice for organizations. There's a woman sitting in this room or on the live stream that read those quotes and said, yeah, that's happened to me. I felt that. What advice do we give to women that have felt that? What what can we what can we say to them today? Do, do you have anything that you feel like you could impart? Yeah, I would say the first step obviously is having this visibility. Is so it can be so isolating when these issues aren't brought to light, and the fact that it is being brought to light shows that there is some intention for these issues to like you know to be reduced. Um, obviously, I'm a black woman myself and have gone through these things. Um, and I think the most thing you can do is just ultimately be yourself and wait for the environment around you to catch up rather than changing or bending who you are to suit the environment. Um, here at Flair, this is what we're trying to do by exposing data. And then from the data, that's being the first step to, you know, creating and cultivating change um, in all the industries that we deserve to be a part of um, and that you bring so much value to. Um, and and Daryl, equally, you know, we saw some quotes there from women that identified as, as white. What, what, what can they do? What can they do to help? Yes, it's, it's a good question. I think it's, it's difficult, um, but I think the first thing for, for everyone is just the awareness piece. And that awareness can come from self-reflection, it can come from conversations, it can come from research, like online research, keeping yourself abreast with 
with different things happening in the world. And that's the case for, for every single person on the planet. And I think the awareness is, is the first thing. I'm, I'm the type of person that when, let's say there's a discussion happening and I don't really understand it too well, I prefer to not necessarily get too engaged in the conversation because I don't want to speak from a place of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And I think the starting point is just getting that comfort level and having those conversations, understanding, proactively trying to understand, and from there, working together with, with everyone else to then come up with solutions. But definitely, I think the awareness piece, as much as the awareness piece is improving over time, I think there are quite big gaps, which is part of the reason why when we work with organizations and we present the data, there is often shock in the room from people looking at it saying, I didn't know that was happening. And I think that's a sign that awareness should be the main focus area. We're going to go to um, some audience questions now. There's a lady straight in the front. I just saw your hand up before I even finished my sentence. Um, there's a lady in the front. We're just going to get a microphone to you. Um, thank you very much for conducting and also sponsoring the, the research. I think it's really interesting to read some of the stats and like quotes, etc. So I think the, my question is, so we're talking about how to build a culture that attracts and retain diverse talent. And I think we see we've seen like sort of the severity of the problem. Um, but I think my question is, what actually works? So whether if it's training or mentoring program, or um, sort of recruitment drive in an organization, what actually you know works to to improve those stats? And also um, how to reach the people that actually need to be reached? Like I think we're talking about those people who are sort of unaware of of the issues. They are sort of not as engaged in like ERG activities or diverse inclusion activities at work, how to sort of get them engaged because they are the sort of the target audience of really, you know, uh, influencing the change, whether if it's top down or bottom up. So, yeah, what works, I guess. <laughs> Who would Thank like you. to take that? To answer the first part of your question, as like to which strategies actually work in to helping to retain talent, I think we're trying to take a very holistic approach. So as you've m mentioned, data, yes, being the first step, but we also include like a bunch of recommendations to organizations that are very contextual to their situation based on the data. So it's hard to give an overall, um, yeah, an overall, I guess, conclusion as to what works, because it's very much dependent on the context of the companies. But even such things that Daryl has had pointed out, quick wins, such as putting a phonetic pronouncing it pronunciation and people's signatures, you know, making sure that you pronounce people's names and using the correct spellings, like, at Flair, like, I'm so, I have an accent on my name, on the E, and, like, there's not one person that has never not used the accent, like, everyone makes such, a, like, such a clear effort to use it, and then, obviously, you, we can talk about more structural changes into policies, reviewing, like, organizations reviewing their policies, making sure there's a clear strategy to people reporting racism, all these things in the long run help to shift a culture that does create more of an anti-racist environment, which does in turn help you know, retain talent. And um, I'd like to add that also at NatWest, we <coughs> employ lots of different approaches because we know that there isn't a single silver bullet that can solve this. Um, and one of our key strategies that we employ, and that, that's why we're here as well, um, we form partnerships with specialists and the experts that really can help us ex accelerate and spike progress. And um, we have many different programs that really target that entry and those pipeline levels, especially when we're trying to change, um, change something. That's really important to do. Um, we have several different internships and we work with different apprenticeship programs um, social mobility programs as well, and many of those actually have 100% FAME participation. Um, we also have comeback programs for women who have, um, who had previously senior positions, but they've taken leave from work for various different reasons. And then we also have special internships uh, for that as well, and those conversion um, ratios are incredibly high, so 90% conversion ratio for, for those different programs. So we know what works is really specialist programs in areas that we're really trying to make a big difference in. Um, and then in terms of uh, our population internally, 
Um, attraction is important, but retention is also really important. Um, and what's really key to retention, and one of the um, pieces of advice from the report, is about making sure that there are equal promotion opportunities for everyone. So making sure that we really communicate very clearly, which we should be very good at doing, because um, we have lots of different communication channels internally, and clearly laying out what are the different levels of pr promotion, what are the support networks around that, and we have personal development plans for everyone, and managers are, um, are expected to um, really support those personal development plans for those people. So we know that we need to support our leaders and our managers um, in that as well. So making sure that we have those opportunities. And we also partner with um, organizations like Google. And um, this week and next week is actually something called I Am Remarkable Week, which is all about encouraging underrepresented groups to speak about accomplishments. And that's an example of a workshop and a skill set we realize it's really important to help our, our people in. Um, and there are sort of so many more programs that we run. And still, again, you know, we, we're always very ambitious. So we're always looking at what more we can do because it just takes that holistic approach to make sure that we just keep that momentum going until, until we get there. And you can see that in, your, your, in the NatWest Nano degree cohort as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Which many, you've got many of the women in here today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward yeah, to graduation. The, the later. NatWest yeah. fans. Um, yes. I was, I was um, just going to comment on the, the last part of the question around... Sorry, yeah. Um, ...what you mentioned around how do you actually engage the people who haven't engaged. I think this is one of the most tra challenging things. I think the first thing is what you said, the fact that you've identified that in order to make change, you need to engage the people who don't engage. That is actually the first step. And having that in the back of your mind will shape the entire way you put together strategies. So, for example, when you're putting together, let's say, a survey, the wording of it should be aimed at the person who wouldn't typically engage. So it might not necessarily be very, very strong wording around anti-racism because that might make them not want to engage. The people who want to talk about anti-racism are probably already going to take the survey anyway. So how can you speak to the person who's on a lunch break, doesn't think they have time, can't be bothered to engage. That's the first step, is really thinking who is your audience, and oftentimes the audience is the 60% the of the audience who don't want to engage. Make it clear why it's important for them. Well, we can take one more question, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, can, we take, can we take the lady at the front, because I don't think you've asked a question yet. I'm sorry. We will come back. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you guys so much for coming in. And um, so I think in this day and age, um, there's a lot going on, especially last year with the whole BLM movement. Um, people are more aware of racism, microaggressions. They know how they occur. And if they're actively not paying attention, it's willful ignorance. Um, do you have any methods or plans in place that allow or that prevent um, people having to relive the, um, the racism trauma or racial trauma that they've experienced in order to educate other people, especially like white people. Um, I know it's a hard question, but one of the quotes that came up was um, someone saying that they can't even talk about their experience because it's still quite fresh and traumatic. Um, I know I've experienced racism. I'm sure many other people in the room have as well. So do you have those methods in place that don't require reliving trauma? I think I got the last part. I don't think I got the question. I didn't, couldn't hear you properly. Sorry. Um, do you have any methods in place or like um, plans to develop methods that don't require people reliving their trauma in order to um, tackle workplace raci racial aggressions and racism in general? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I think one part is it's not the person who's been subjected's responsibility to have to divulge what's happening. So I've been in situations where, like to my own discredit, I've seen something happen and not said anything. And so often we will be in situations where we do happen to see what's going on. It might be someone who's at a party that says something that's not okay, or somebody in a meeting that says something that's not okay, or does something that's not okay. So having more of a dynamic where people who aren't being subjected to those things are coming forward and actually speaking, and in terms of how we do that, I think it's probably events like this. It's probably talking about it and saying everyone has a role to play, that the next time we're in a meeting or walking down a corridor or going to an event and something happens that isn't right, we have the responsibility then to then 
bring that forward and, and call it out or report it or whatever it may be. So that would be my suggestion for how we can uncover the insights without people living their trauma. But as sadly is the case, I do, do think there is an element of that not being enough. Um, and it, it's a difficult kind of mental battle to think, do you want to relive your trauma in order to help solve the problem? It shouldn't have to be that way. Um, but I do think that is where, as a society, oftentimes things really do impact people, but I don't think it has to be that way if others around are calling things out themselves. And um, from an organisational perspective, to extend that, we have diversity and inclusion champions, because I think something that's really important is to have that psychological safety around having those conversations. Um, and we know that sometimes for some employees it might be really difficult to have those conversations in a public forum. Um, so we have confidential um, hotlines and platforms where people can report this to a third party as well. And we have um, RV, which is an employee survey, which actually is run by an impartial third party. So because we know that you know, we might be biased when we re read those results. So again, we employ sort of external partnerships to really support us in that. Um, and then from a leadership perspective, it's really our responsibility to take this really seriously. Um, and there's lots of data out there um, that different management consultancies and research organizations have shared with us. So for example, um, in the United States alone, um, $64 billion are lost purely from employees leaving an organization and then organizations having to replace those employees. Um, and then there's a different statistic where for every individual that leaves an organization due to discrimination, it costs $144,000 for each incident like that. So from a business perspective, you know, not only are we losing uh, a member of staff, we're losing the ideas, it impacts culture. Culture impacts productivity, productivity impl impacts our success. So from all different um, angles and different levels, it's really important to, to all of us to, to really address this. Um, but certainly from a human perspective, um, it's, re it's really important to us to provide these different platforms so we can provide as much support as we can um, for that. I just wanted to ask, is there anybody on social media that has a burning question? Because I'm, I'm very wary. No, right, we've got no on the live stream. I, <laughs> I'm so sorry. We don't have any more time for questions. We've already pushed it too far. But are, are you going to be staying a little bit, a bit longer? Because I feel as though we do have people that would love to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. We'd, we'd love to chat. We'll, yeah. we'll be milling around and watching all the other events. And, yeah, we'd love to have a conversation with anyone. And, yeah. You have plenty of time, I promise, to ask questions uh, directly. I'm so sorry that we actually don't have more, more time to, to discuss this, but a massive round of applause, please, for Nat Weston. <laughs>
So let's take a trip down memory lane. This is 1995, where my timeline of my life began. And um, fun fact, did you know that JavaScript was also invented in 1995? So I'm the same age as JavaScript, which makes me extremely happy. Um, yep, so I was born in Hong Kong. This is me, born like a little potato. And um, Hong Kong is an amazing city. If you have never been before, I highly recommend it. There are loads of beautiful skyscrapers, great food, etc. And I actually met um, Shannon, who is somewhere here as well, um, during our lunch break. And she's also from Hong Kong, so that made me super happy. And um, in the 2000s, I actually spent my early years of childhood in Hong Kong. And um, from what I recall, I attended international school in Hong Kong, which is why I have this extremely weird American-ish accent that all Americans tell me that is not American and it's something else, so I don't really know how to describe it. And um, I also was brought up in a trilingual family, so I grew up speaking English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. And as a typical Asian, I know with sorry, but I kind of also learned the piano and got grade eight in primary school. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I also participated in Girl Guides, where I learned how to care for the environment, um, spend time with elderly and young people, and um, yeah, fun skills for survival, such as learning how to light a campfire from scratch, which I believe I believe we don't need any more fires in the world anymore these time, this weird period of time. And uh, lastly, I also grew up traveling a lot with um, my family just because my parents love traveling a lot and Hong Kong is a really convenient city to live in um, since we're surrounded by loads of cool um, cities. I guess that's for all cities in the world, but okay, anyways. <laughs> so, I actually um, recognize that I had a really privileged childhood and growing up, I really had great support from my parents, but it wasn't all just sunshine and rainbows. Um, whenever I was in primary school, I was actually bullied for being like fat. I mean, and um, there were two stories in my life that I remember really vividly. And this is a moment where you're all gonna be like, aw, you know cue that and um, but yeah so one story was whenever I was in P6 so the sixth year of primary school I was actually chased by a boy in my class with a pair of scissors because he told me that I should cut my fat off and the second story was um, in my final year of primary school um, it's kind of like a tradition where we would all get yearbooks and everyone would sign at the end you know happy messages good luck um, with secondary school etc um, but it Instead of having these nice, happy messages, my classmates actually left me a lot of death threats, telling me that I'm better off, you know, doing something else, and um, that I was worthless because I was fat. Um, so I really struggled to find anyone to talk to because even though I had really loving parents and my family was truly super supportive, I just felt like it was all my fault. Like when you're being bullied, you just don't understand as a kid that it actually isn't your fault. And um, I felt really alone and hopeless and my mind just kind of spiraled downwards. But it's not all sad. This talk has got happy points too. And <laughs> so there was one turning point in my life. And I apologize if you can't really see clearly because of the colors and the tiny text, um, but my sister actually went to study in Northern Ireland one year, and she came back that summer and asked me, you know, Janine, do you want to come and study with me in Northern Ireland? And without hesitation, I immediately said yes, because I was sick of being that girl who was bullied in school. I was sick of having no one to talk to and always crying myself to sleep. And so I packed my bags, don't know what I was doing, where I was going, really, didn't know what to expect from Northern Ireland. And I headed off to um, Northern Ireland in 2007 at the age of 11. My parents stayed in Hong Kong, so I just flew out with my sister. And our destination was Belfast. This is actually where the Titanic quarter is. So if you've seen the movie, the Titanic, this is like, they have, it's like a thing. It's like they build loads of things about that in Belfast. 
And um, during my secondary um, school years, I attended boarding school, as I said. Um, and for the first time in my life, I actually managed to make friends who genuinely just accepted me for who I was. And I actually, okay, this is like a sidetrack and I didn't plan this in my presentation, but I have like a little tattoo here to represent them, um, the four girls who mean so, so much to me. And um, I also picked up my fourth language, which is French in secondary school. And I also um, spent a lot of time discovering um, a passion for music. So because in boarding school, there isn't really that much to do. Like after school, you just go back to boarding and then people just watch TV all day. And I really wasn't that kind of a person because I just get so bored. So I spent a lot of time in um, the music department where I started to self-teach how to play the guitar and the drums. And um, I also learned um, the importance of independence because my parents weren't next to me. So from a very young age, I had to do my own laundry on a weekly basis. Um, all that kind of stuff. And I also built up a little bit of work experience during summer holidays. So I would do tutoring, save up pocket money because um, my dad actually, growing up, he's a super, super strict dad and he never gave us like pocket money. And I remember he told me, my sister and my brother, that if we wanted to buy things, we actually had to work for it and they're not just gonna give it to us so easily. So from a very young age, I was so used to the idea of making sure that I worked for something if I wanted it. And so through these working experience and this upbringing, I um, slowly felt a lot more comfortable in my own skin. And I managed to develop um, six main strengths. And if you can't really read it, because I can't either. So um, I developed um, in terms of my interpersonal communication skills. I was pretty good at analyzing and studying business studies and case studies. I picked up several new languages, of course, and I adapt to new environments. Um, I felt comfortable showing empathy towards others, and I spent a lot of time developing new hobbies and skills. But then uh, towards the end of secondary school, um, I'm sure you might have experienced this as well, the, the time of A-levels and thinking about, you know, what do I want to do when I grow up? And growing up, I was never super academical at school. I was not that straight A student, as you might expect. And um, I honestly didn't really feel like any topics in STEM were made for me. Um, a lot of my colleagues or classmates at the time, and um, they were talking about a career in finance or studying medicine to become a doctor or becoming a lawyer. And to me, none of it really seemed that exciting just because I felt like it wasn't what I had a passion for. But all I knew was that I love traveling. I love meeting new people. I love talking to people, learning about different cultures. And I wanted a career path that would give me options. And um, so I decided to do a double degree in French and business studies. And I applied to UCAS, um, to five different universities in the UK. And I got five conditional offers. Great, right? Like that's kind of what you want. But uh, an abrupt change happened in my life whenever um, I was 16. I actually, in 2012, I moved to Canada, Vancouver, and I did a summer job there working as a program assistant for an English language school. And um, at the time, I didn't really um, know anything about Canada, but because I was in a completely new country, I thought that I would do my absolute best, give it my all. I have literally nothing to lose. And my manager at the time really liked me because um, I was so hardworking, even though I wasn't paid anything. And so she told the CEO of the company and the CEO of the company got in touch with my mom and asked my mom what my plans were for uni. So she told him business studies and French at a school in, uni, uh, in the UK. And um, he asked her, well, why wouldn't she consider doing business in France instead of doing a double degree in England? That way she can learn French with the locals and learn more about the culture. And so my mom came back to me and she asked me, well, Janine, is it the UK or is it France? And I thought to myself, would I rather have baked beans on toast every day or like pain au chocolat and croissants? I mean, is that not an easy decision? <laughs> so I moved to France and I decided to do an international business development and marketing degree, a bachelor's degree. And so, yeah, at the age of 17, I moved to France and the destination was La Côte d'Azur, which is the French Riviera. 
And during my time in France, I attended university, and I was um, really active in extracurricular curricular activities. Oh my gosh, my English is so bad, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I participated in a lot of extracurricular activities, and one of my favorite was definitely the music association, so I spent lots of time there. I also had to do a French 2.0 beta version, because apparently in secondary school, like when you spend six years trying to learn a foreign language, it actually isn't anything like the actual language itself. So when I moved to France, it was a major shock to me because I thought I spoke French, but no one else in France thought I spoke French. Um, so yeah, I made friends in school and they all were so patient and kind to me and taught me how to say um, French words and yeah, all the slang words and stuff like that. And because I was so active in the music association, I also developed a new hobby, which is DJing and mixing techno music. And um, I also uh, was able to build up on more work experience. So because at the time I was working um, or studying luxury marketing, I actually had several um, internships within luxury industries, such as fashion industry, hospitality industry. And um, upon graduation, I actually did a six month internship at a yacht company um, selling yachts. Hey. And um, this allowed me to build a really, really cool network um, and meet really interesting people from all types of backgrounds. And honestly, when you live in the south of France and you have a job in the yacht industry, life is great, you know? Like you got the sun there, you got the beach there, the sky is always blue, unlike London here. And there's, you know, fancy yacht parties. What is there not to love? I truly thought to myself at the age of 20 that la vie est belle and I really, thought that that was it, like this is what my life would look like for the rest of my life. But after a couple months of working in yacht marketing, I slowly started to feel like uninspired and a bit bored of my job, to be honest with you. I mean, yachts are fancy, but once you sell one yacht and then another yacht, the same parties, you kind of get sick of it, you know? And I just felt like I wasn't intellectually stimulated enough. I wanted to do something more in my life. and. Really, I feel like I don't really want to help rich people spend more money. I kind of wanted to do something that actually made an impact um, in the world. And so I decided to learn how to code, like that pushing right there. And um, it started off with something small. So because in my marketing job at the time, uh, I also helped out with the website. So I did um, have a little bit of exposure to HTML, CSS, really, really, really um, kind of beginner level coding that kind of um, made me intrigued. You know, It made me think, is there potentially an opportunity in the tech industry? Is this something I can do? Um, this was always something that I never thought I could do. I mean, I was never great at school. Who am I to think if that I could code, right? But um, I started with free online resources um, through, for example, Code Academy, Free Code Camp, hashtag not sponsored. And, um, you know, looking at YouTube tutorials, things like that after work on weeknights and also um, during the weekends, instead of spending time on the beach with my friends, I would lock myself up in a dark, dark room and decide to code instead. And, um, yeah. After um, understanding, you know, actually this is potentially an area that I could explore, my life timeline became more like this. My life before I learned how to code, and my life after I learned how to code. And honestly, I'm still learning how to code. So like, I'm like on that line right now. <laughs> um, so yeah. And in 2017, I moved to England here in London. And I uh, was still working in marketing, but it was uh, an e-marketing role. And I moved to London with the intention and determination that one day I would build a career in tech working as a software engineer. So now it was more just about saving up, working hard, so that I could eventually fulfill that goal. And um, when I was in London, I also discovered one of my favorite dance studios. If you're into dancing, come talk to me after because I would love to see you there. And um, it's, yeah, I love dance so much and I spend almost every single day, even now, um, training at the studio. And um, once I started working at that marketing job, a year and a half later, I saved up enough money to quit my full-time job, which was crazy to me, and attend a 15-week full-stack software engineering course. 
And my friends thought I was crazy. My parents thought I was like insane. And they asked me, why would you quit this perfectly great job to learn something new, to join something that, to be honest with you, I think that they think I just like fix computers at work. Cause I don't think they really, um, I don't think I properly explained to them what I actually do for a living. But anyways, and um, during my time in London, I actively attended tech events just to hear more about other people's experiences and um, get to know other people who were also um, hoping to do the same thing as me. And eventually, um, I met my mentor at one of um, women in tech tech events. And um, she introduced me to the world of ethical hacking and secure development practices. And this is where I truly thought I was like in the matrix. I was like, oh my gosh, you can do what? You can earn money from hacking, but like for good. And it was just something that blew my mind. Um, and so I started spending time on um, Try Hack Me, Hacker One, doing like capture the flag um, challenges and yeah, just like messing about um, and trying to break things pretty much. And so in 2017 and 2018, I actually, went through a lot of challenges, um, physically, mentally, emotionally. And um, I honestly thought that there were so many days and nights where I really wanted to give up. Um, sometimes I would cry myself to sleep because I might have um, really found it super difficult to fix a bug, which actually sounds really pathetic, anyways. Um, and I also maybe would get so stressed about um, passing a particular technical interview or an exam that I would get insomnia. I'm sure a lot of you can relate, right? And so every day, even though I might have gone through ups and downs, one thing that was constant in my mind was that progress is so much more important than achieving perfection every single time. So I made sure that to remind myself to take small incremental steps every day. So if I had a busy day at work and I only had 15 minutes, use that 15 minutes. 30 minutes, use that 30 minutes. Because even if it's only 15 or 30 minutes, that's already increasing the baseline of what you're doing. And so, um, you know, with the surprise of people around me and also myself, I actually graduated from that 15 week software engineering course. And on the day of graduation, similar to today for a lot of you nanodegree graduates, um, I actually got my very first uh, interview with a tech company. And um, after a week and several technical interviews, I was offered a job and so I started working. And you might be thinking, where did you get hired? Well, ta-da! <laughs> So I joined Avast as a software engineer um, in the Avast Secure Browser team in 2019. And honestly speaking, like at the time, I was so grateful because my hiring manager gave me an opportunity despite me not having any computer science background. I didn't even have any technical working experience. I didn't even know what recursion was. I was like, huh. like you kind of just like do things over and over again, right? Until it doesn't work. Um, but he was like, I'll give this girl a job, you know? Um, and it was truly a great um, achievement for me because everyone around me wasn't really sure if I would actually succeed. And um, even myself, there were so many points in time where I doubted myself, but um, I was able to um, join the company and there were so many great initiatives to help me continue my training, my learning to help me grow. And um, in 2020, Avast actually announced that it would heavily invest more in improving DNI um, initiatives. And so I volunteered immediately as DNI ambassador. And the reason for that is because I came from an unconventional background into tech. And as an intersectional Asian woman in tech, I actually went through, you know, as mentioned in the previous talk, there are so many challenges that we go through that people don't really talk about, or, you know, people might not even be aware that they're doing. And so it was super close, and it is super close to my heart to really make sure that I give back to the community as much as I can, because without the help of my mentor, people that I met at tech events, I would not be here, standing here, talking to you about this journey. And so it's super important to me to give back and to try and use the privileges that I hold to amplify the voices of other people around me and also to try and encourage more and more people to learn how to code, even if it's just to give it a go, um, even if they don't decide to work in a tech role or whatever, it's the actual action of giving it a try that matters so much. 
And in 2021, I actually um, set up the employee resource group for women at Avast and took on the role as chairwoman. And this has been such a pleasure because it meant that I have so much more control over um, which partnerships we want to establish, what companies we want to work with, um, really try and hear and listen to what the women at Avast are trying to say and their feedback and their opinions and how we can improve as a whole. And so working at Avast and in general, I think like the transition of moving into tech has really given me so many opportunities that I never would have thought would have ever happened. And, um, okay, I wasn't paid to do this. This is generally something I want to share, okay? <laughs> so I want to share with you why I enjoy working at Avast. And the purpose of this is not to tell you, oh, you know, you have to come work here, whatever. No, but it's more like things that maybe you should consider whenever you're applying for jobs, questions that you can ask, things that you can have to think about. Oh, is this something that actually, um, you know, the company can work around? And so the very first thing is um, flexible working arrangement. You probably really can't see because I'm also struggling to see standing here. And um, so first one, flexible working arrangement. Out of us, um, we're like really, it's really great company for organizing um, kind of whether if you want to do a full work from office, a hybrid role or a work from home. Um, for example, for me personally, when I'm coding, I much prefer working um, at home where I can really focus on code because I'm a very extroverted and sometimes overly chatty person. So when I'm in the office, I get super distracted and I want to go and have coffee with everyone and it's just not very great for productivity. But um, whenever I have meetings and stuff like that, I'll head into the office and yeah, it's just super flexible and great for that. Secondly, I'm so glad that I can have a hybrid role. So on top of being a full-time software engineer, as I mentioned, I'm also heavily involved in diversity initiatives and making sure that um, we improve in DNI at the company. And so I love that, you know, I can come to events like this. I can make suggestions to our senior leadership team to talk about how we can improve things and also why we should work with organizations like Code First Girls to try and improve things. And thirdly, um, there's plenty of budget for training and conferences. So um, a lot of times, like I was fortunate enough to move, to, um, go to Paris, for example, for conferences or work on um, improving my ethical hacking skills, which is completely separate to what I actually do at work sometimes. And fourthly, I'm able to um, business, uh, go on business travel as well. So as you might or might not know, um, Avast headquarters is actually situated in Prague. So um, I get to travel to Prague before the pandemic, but hopefully soon as well. And it's one of my favorite cities in Europe. And lastly, I'm really glad that um, this is a perk because we have unlimited pay time off. You heard me right. We can take as many holidays as we want to, as long as you get the work done. But it honestly is so great because how many times have you sat there sitting in front of your computer screen trying to count how many days off you have left? Like this is not an issue in my life anymore. <laughs> so I'm so grateful for that. And so I want to explain to you that whenever you decide to start learning how to code or considering um, a role in the tech industry, um, it's not just so you know um, singular. So I know that I already mentioned to you that I work at Avast as a software engineer, but this career transition has allowed me to take on so many more roles. So it might be really tiny, so I'm going to read it out. But on top of being a software engineer at Avast, I also work as DNI ambassador and chairwoman of Women at Avast. But on top of that, because work-life balance is so, so amazing, I also spend loads of time working as a musician, a DJ, a dancer, a content creator. I speak and um, you know at conferences and I can attend as panelists. And I'm a mentee as well as a mentor. And I've also had so much more time to take on more languages. So actually, currently, I am learning my sixth language. So that's really amazing. And um, on top of these six initial strengths that I mentioned to you, from transitioning into tech, I also managed to increase those skills. So this encompasses explaining technical concepts in a um, more understandable way, uh, logical thinking, debugging, time management, events organization, establishing corporate partnerships, amplifying the voices of others, financial budgeting for business, and also dealing with freelance contracts, which is something that I never thought would have happened. And so, honestly speaking, now, I really think life is beautiful. La vie est tellement belle. And so, on that note, I want to say 
if there's only one thing that you remember from this entire talk, which was a very bumpy and long journey, um, what you do today affects all your tomorrows. So make sure that you spend your time mindfully and do this for you, whether that is only 30 minutes of your day that you can sacrifice to learn how to code, make the most out of those 30 minutes and know that you're investing towards your future. So thank you so much for listening and um, yeah. I mean, I wonder what that boy that chased you in your playground would say now. I How'd mean, you like me now? Uh, I know. How'd you like them apples? <laughs> I was actually just reflecting on what you said, what, what your parents said about you working in tech. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to share, that, I ha share this. I was down the pub a couple of weeks ago and um, I said, oh, what, what is it that you do? And I was like, oh, I work in tech. I really don't like going into detail because I, I want to switch off, just have my drink. Yeah. I was like, I work in tech. And they were like, oh, you fix printers. Yeah. And I, no, I embraced it. I was like, yeah, yeah, I've got a full printer industry. <laughs> but it's only the in inkjets. I'll only do inkjets circa yeah. 1996. Yeah. So if you ever need your printer fixing, the yeah, I'm the one. You've okay. got my number. <laughs> OK, we're going to open up to uh, audience Q&A. Anyone got a, a question for Janine? Or that one, that, you put your hand up first. I feel like we need to come to you. Hiya. Um, so I'm actually um, coming from a marketing background as well. So I wanted to know like, what skills you felt were transferable from having a marketing background into software engineering. 100%. So the transferable skills from marketing to software engineering was the question. So I guess in terms of a lot of the times, it's a misconception that when you work in tech, communication skills isn't like super, super important um, and presentation skills, etc. But actually from working in marketing, um, it has allowed me to feel a lot more comfortable, for example, when I'm presenting in front of different people. And I think um, as well, whenever you're trying to communicate really technical ideas to maybe other team members who might not be as like technical, then it allows you to understand their perspective as well, because you were once probably someone like that, right, where you didn't really understand code as much. Um, so I found that super, super useful. And on top of that, I found my networking skills was something that I found really great. So um, I like rarely feel nervous or anything whenever I go to um, social events or tech events and meet people. Whereas I do know that, um, for example, some of my friends who work in tech who might come from a really traditional um, computer science background, for example, because they're, they might not be as used to, you know, ad, ad campaigns or large um, events and social events, then they might feel a little bit more nervous. So I found personally, for me at least, these were things that I found super um, useful from marketing. I have to say, with the nano degree students, some of the um, career switches, oh, just back into the chair, uh, some of the career, career switches, some of the skills they have is just absolutely unbelievable, particularly in terms of their communication skills and the ability to articulate themselves. It's actually a real strength. So, so I'd use it. I'd 100% use that. Uh, any, any more questions for, for Janine? Oh, this lady in the front. Thank you. Can I just say your presentation was so good and the slides are absolutely oh, beautiful as well. Um, so my question is a, um, a bit more generally about like other skills. So you mentioned you have lots of hobbies and you do lots of things outside of your day job and you said time management was a skill that you developed. So I'm really curious how you managed to develop that like any tips you have because it seems like you, you do like a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, actually my friends would disagree with that because every time I hang out with my friends, I'm like always late, but I'm never late to like, um, like work related things or things related to my hobbies like dance, music, etc. And I think what I find really helps is um, kind of like see yourself as like, how do I say? So I would always book my time slots in advance. So for example, um, on the Monday, I would book for the next week exactly what I want to do with my time. So if I know that um, every day I will spend two hours doing dance and then one hour, whatever, doing a DJ session at a music studio or whatever, then I'll make sure that these are things that I prioritize, for example, as, as well as work, of course. Um, and I will block out my time. Um, and within the work context, for example, speaking um, in a perspective where during work, I'll definitely have 
times where I have to code and then meetings and et cetera, right? So I always make sure that, okay, I have to work on this ticket and I estimate that I'll need this amount of time. Then I would block out two hours, three hours, four hours in a day where I have solid um, focus time and make sure that no one books any meetings during those times. And um, in order for me to be super productive, I also use the Pomodoro effect. I don't know if you're familiar with this, where you work 25 minutes, five minutes, and et cetera. So um, that's kind of how I deal with my time management. But definitely, there are going to be many times where you're going to have to you know, think what's more important, prioritize things, and you know, give up the opportunity cost of doing something else. Um, but ultimately, it's up to you to manage your time. So yeah, thinking mindfully of how you can make the most out of it, um, and potentially uninstalling social media apps and not scrolling on Instagram. I highly recommend that, because it'll probably give you a confidence boost as well. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend. Great, so everyone got their phones out and delete Instagram. Throw your phone into a fire. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> I love, I'm looking at our social media oh, media people sorry. in the room. They're like, it's no over for me. I'm off. We've just told the community to throw away their Instagram accounts. Uh, don't get me started on TikTok. Right. Um, <laughs> any more questions for Janine? Uh, gentlemen. Oh, we're running down. We're leaping down to get your microphone. <laughs> Hi, you precise before that you uh, were into ethical hacking, try hack me, uh, hacker one, and everything. And I wanted to know if your experience at Havast actually uh, make it more helpful in also your career, I guess, freelance, as you said, uh, continuing like try hack me, uh, or more like, sorry, hacker one on or different uh, companies that provide ethical hacking to different clients. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, you're asking me if. Um, I don't think I Sorry. understand. Sorry, I mean, like, uh, as you're working at Avast as a um, software programmer right now, uh, I guess you, so just a wild guess, but I guess you're uh, probably cybersecurity, so protecting against uh, signature, like meta exploit and everything. Uh, so I was wondering, because you said you're also freelance uh, on the side and you precise hacker one before, so I guess you continue in career also as uh, ethical hacker, providing services in the meantime. So I wanted to know if your career at Avast mm -hmm. is actually beneficial to a career also at Ethical Hacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually. It's on. No, no, you're, you're on. OK. Um, actually, for my freelancing work, you might be surprised, but it's nothing linked to tech. Um, a lot of things are related to dance, music, et cetera. I like to diversify my income a lot. Um, but in terms of working in the security industry, it definitely helps to ha understand the perspective of an ethical hacker, because a lot of the times, as a developer, we build apps and programs without thinking like actually um, in this, you know, there could be SQL injection, et cetera, and we don't talk about these things. So I think um, working with people who try and break things definitely helps me to understand how I should um, try and improve how I build things, but not only for me personally, but acting as a security champion for my team and working with the um, security engineers in our team to try and improve the app as a whole. Um, yeah, so I think it definitely helps, but a lot of the times as well, I feel like whenever I do um, capture the flags and stuff, it's kind of more isolated issue. So for example, there's like, you're trying to find a hash or something, right, for capture the flags. And a lot of the times in the real world, it's not just trying to find a hash. And so it's, it's quite complicated to try and navigate around a really complex code base and work with team members who might not be as passionate about security, for example, or who might not have the time. Like a lot of the times whenever you're working on projects, project managers might just want things pushed out as quick as possible. They're, they just don't have time to make all the necessary tests and et cetera, all that kind of stuff. So making sure that um, I try and push for these things and um, try and, you know, for example, I organize lunch and learns on a fortnightly basis for my team. So making sure that I can invite people externally or have people in the team to share this knowledge um, so that people know that this is not an extra, this is something that is necessary and something that we should include as part of our daily jobs. So, yeah. I think we've got one question coming in from the live stream. Yes, yeah, so Sarah says, how did you prove your tech capabilities to the company in your interview? Did yeah. you have a portfolio that you created to show? Mm -hmm. So the question was how I um, showed my skills to the company to 
I'm really bad at reiterating questions, I'm sorry. But yeah, how I showed my skills and proved that I was like capable of taking on this job. So whenever I did my bootcamp course, we actually um, had to do group projects. So there were 15 weeks, and throughout these 15 weeks, we did five, well, four group projects and one personal project. And um, these were all great ways for me to showcase my skills and use the um, languages and technologies that I learned. But on top of that, I really have to shout out to my mentor because um, whenever I applied to Avast, for example, um, I did the technical, um, like, quiz, not quiz, like a technical task that they asked me to do. But on top of that, and this is something I would recommend to everyone here if you haven't checked it out yet, my mentor told me to check out GitHub Marketplace and use um, open source tools such as Sneak or like Codacy and things like that to try and improve um, my code quality, as well as um, remove any insecure dependencies, et cetera, and update them. And these are all things that I think really put, what is it, the icing on the cake? <laughs> English. <laughs> yeah, like me, really made me or my work stand out a little bit better than um, other people, maybe. I guess that's why I got hired. But it's not just about um, doing what they ask you to do or just achieving the bare minimum, but it's going that further mile. How can I improve it? What can I do to make this secure? Um, how can I make sure that whenever people use this or users use this, it's gonna be a seamless experience and really making the most out of the time that you have to try and yeah make it the best as possible. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for Janine, please. Um, right, we're going to have a break now, uh, and we'll be back at 4 p.m. Uh, for the really, really exciting stuff. Uh, we're going to be back for the Code First Girls Awards Ceremony, and also, thank you. Can I have a bigger woo? <laughs> What's going to happen when we all have a drink? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know about you, we're talking about Canary Wharf swaying already. Um, and, and, and I want an even bigger woo for the um, nano graduation ceremony. Uh, I will see you back at 4 p.m.
I feel like you can't hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be time, there will be a place, it will be after this ceremony and there will be plenty of alcohol. And soft drinks for those. So let's, 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 let's get the atmosphere now. It's, a, it's an awards ceremony. This is, this is serious and brilliant in equal measure. This is designed to celebrate our community. Um, I think let, let, let's all like share this. How fantastic have the women been today that, that you've met, you've come across? <laughs> you've seen on stage so this is a real opportunity for us to annually recognize those women in terms of how we decide who's going to get these awards Code First Girls get this we have 35,000 community members now oh, oh do you know what like we have those stats all the time I need a live audience every time I read stats out it's it's great it gives me a real sense of purpose keep it going so yeah, we have 35,000 uh, uh, community members distributed all over the world. So in every region of the UK, and we've got pockets uh, of women globally. So we decide um, eight women that are going to receive these awards, awards out of 35,000. And we do that in combination with our team, what we know has been achieved uh, through learning, and also um, through career opportunities, and also in terms of women that have really stood out to our partners as well. Um, for the award winners in the room, we'd love for you to come up and collect your award when uh, your name is called. Not all award winners are, are with us tonight, sadly. Uh, and not all companies presenting awards are with us either. <laughs> Apparently there's been something called a pandemic, <laughs> and that may have affected attendance. So let's go to uh, the first award, please. So the first award is the FinTech Future Star Award. Uh, and this is sponsored uh, by some of our long-standing partners uh, at Bank of America. This uh, is the message we've received from uh, Bank of America. So this candidate is currently founding a company off the back of her team's involvement in the Financial Conduct Authority's tech, tech sprint idea. She has completed every Code First Girls course possible. <laughs> that was a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? <laughs> as well as joining Bank of America's FinTech mentoring program and really standing out. So um, I would like to announce that the winner of the Bank of America FinTech Future Star Award is Shannon Ewan. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, do you have a few words? So have we got a mic? Sure. Fantastic. Um, I, I feel okay. we, we... Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Anna, for and also Bank of America for, for giving me this award. This is like a really, really important moment to me today and also for the past year for me and my team um, because the reason why I'm interested in FinTech is because ever since um, the PSD2, Payment Services Directive 2, has been into legislation, um, FinTech companies and startups have also like integrated into the forefront of the nine large incumbents banks of the UK and now they're given a you know level playing field to join for a competition to be more of a customer centric um, you know approach and I really think that fintech should be a space for inclusion for equality and diversity and this is a shout out to my team uh, from the Code First Girls Financial Conduct Authority mini sprint um, and also the mentors that really helped us along the way. We're really, really glad that, you know, we're still developing this product um, for, you know, the better of society. I, I can't believe you, you, so you went into our hackathon with the Financial Conduct Authority and you are still developing the products because the idea was just so successful, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I guess. <laughs> right, so can I come back to why get involved in a hackathon? Like, 
get involved get in the song. Yeah. Like, you're now developing your own business off the back of it, right? Yes. And it, you know, we talk about, like, businesses taking ideas off the back of hackathons, but you're launching your own business potentially off the back of this. Yeah, I think it's not for, you know, obviously it's not for profit, it's for um, social impact. Um, and I think, you know, like joining a hackathon not only creates more opportunities, but it really like does let me learn a lot more from like my teammates as well as, as, well as the mentors. So yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. We have uh, a couple of words from Bank of America as well, who sadly can't be here with us today. I said, congratulations, Shannon. We are so proud to sponsor this award and support such a worthy winner. We hope that you take this award in your stride and continue to pursue your goals in fintech. Also, we hope that this award gives you greater confidence to realize your ambitions, as well as to inspire others to follow, you, uh, follow your footsteps and to do the same. Let's hear it for Shannon. Amazing, right. The next award is the Pay It Forward Award, uh, and this is being sponsored by Torstone Technologies. I'm delighted that we have Torstone Technologies with us today, and not just anybody from Torstone Technologies. Wait for it. It's not only, it's just the CEO. <laughs> so, please, let's have a big round of applause for uh, Brian Collings, the CEO of Torstone Technologies. Thank you. Do I need to switch this on? And I'm FinTech, <coughs> so I don't know whether that is working. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Sorry. So I'm not in my FinTech gear, I'm afraid, because I've just come from uh, talking to a client. Um, but uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come here today, see a fantastic, uh, a fantastic audience and fantastic uh, numbers. I mean, those are crazy numbers. 35,000 is absolutely crazy numbers. Um, so Torstone Tech, I won't go on because I know you're all waiting for uh, alcohol at the end. Uh, <laughs> Torstone Tech is a software company, it's a software as a service company. Um, and I'm really proud of what, what we've done over the last 10 years, <coughs> and in particular, proud of our, our diversity. Um, unfortunately, there's one bit of that diversity that is a problem. So in the traditional uh, marketing, finance, uh, lots of areas, we, we have a, a fantastic ratio of women, if not uh, a higher ratio. But in the development software side, um, we are practically appalling. <laughs> so uh, we do have female developers and we do have people in the, in the business, uh, but we don't have uh, half enough women in, uh, in the development side. So I, that's why I'm here. That's why we're sponsoring. We've got to change that. And, and it's great to see uh, an audience like this that sounds like it's really very much changing as, as I speak. Uh, so with that, I think I wanted to uh, thank uh, Code First Girls uh, for allowing me to, to come here. Um, but I wanted to uh, announce the winner of Pay It Forward. Um, I'll talk a little bit about her first. And then uh, she's been involved in uh, I Am Remarkable, hashtag I Am Remarkable, in workshops. And she's rec regularly given back to the community uh, through coaching sessions to other uh, CFG members. Uh, so I'm very proud to announce, uh, if I get the pronunciation right, I'm afraid, uh, Loni Sabag. Well done. Congratulations. It's here. I, I don't think she. I don't think she's here All today. Right. Okay. But that's okay. <laughs> I will metaphorically pick up the award for her. <laughs> you can shake my hand as well if you want. <laughs> well done. Well done. Yeah. I picked it up for you. Amazing. I do you have we'll a get. Um, do I have a stitch? <laughs> no, that would be that would be really bad, wouldn't it? Um, we'll pop this in the post to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Torstone Technologies. Right, so uh, the next award is um, for the Team Player Award. Uh, this is sponsored by Waterstones. Um, we do have the uh, following comment from them, that, which I'm going to read out. Um, this candidate is the true definition of a team player. As well as being a career switcher instructor, she is always enthusiastic about volunteering, more of her time to mentor and develop aspiring instructors, and she inspires allies of women in tech at every possible opportunity. Uh, this lady always delivers lessons with passion and enthusiasm and goes above and beyond um, for her mentees 
giving up her own time to impart her knowledge and expertise. And the winner of the Waterson's Team Player Award is Mary and Nola. <laughs> Mary couldn't be with us today. That's okay. Again, we'll do a virtual pickup, but um, a big, a big well done to Mary. <laughs> Okay, so the next award is the Resilience Award. Uh, and this award is being sponsored by the Admiral Group. So Admiral couldn't be with us uh, here today, so I'm going to read on their behalf. Um, we are delighted to be sponsoring one of 2021 Code First Girls Awards, as it's in line with our continued commitment to increase the number of women working in technology roles in the UK. We want to inspire more women to play an equal role in the tech landscape by providing an environment where female talent can flourish, which is vital to our continued success. The winner of the 2021 Resilience uh, Award has shown ongoing dedication and commitment to Code First Girls, teaching the community and career switcher courses, as well as assisting in the training and teaching of volunteers. She often runs extra sessions outside of Code First Girls classes spending time into the late evening to teach students extra tips. She has shown incredible resilience this year with endless positivity despite difficult personal circumstances. She's an absolute star and totally deserving of this award. award. Will you please give it up for Emily Flynn? Congratulations, Emily. Can I say a few words? Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't really prepare anything, I'm afraid, but I've um, got a lot to be grateful for in the Co First Girls community. I've met some really amazing people. Um, over the, I think it must be five years, I've been part of it now. Um, been a huge part of my life, um, especially this past year when um, last year quite a few things went wrong for me personally, um, all at the same time. But we're back in the game now. Um, and just like to thank everyone who I've worked with and who I've taught um, for all their support, basically. Thanks so much. It's okay, it's okay. Amazing. So the next award is the Tech Disruptor Award. It's being sponsored by Incredible Labs, uh, who are present with us here today. Fantastic. Can I invite... Oh, again, it's not just anyone from Incredible Labs. <laughs> It's only the CEO again. <laughs> Please welcome Graham Sutar to the stage. Graham. Thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here. Um, thank you for inviting us. Um, and it's been a pleasure meeting some of you earlier on today as well. Um, we are a recently formed private investment group with a vision to be inspirationally different in all that we do. We're frustrated with much of the old ways that just keep getting churned out by the same complacent companies. So our mission is to be innovative, yet collaborative. Our mission is to add value to our communities and to be diverse. So we aim to be disruptive and ethical. We've created a team blended with experience and passion in what we do um, to, uh, to what is a cognitively diverse group, easier, easier said than uh, written down than I said, actually, <laughs> right um, who've worked across Asia and the UK in private, public, and the third sector, um, investing and building businesses. We've also got a structural commitment to improving the mental health of our stakeholders and our wider community. And we need passionate technology talent to help us unlock real value from our investee companies. And we like to have a bit of a laugh along the way as well, a bit like you guys seem to do here as well too. Um, you are all, uh, all the Code First Girls, the 35,000 we've, we've heard about earlier on here, already all on the path to creating the world you wish to inhabit. You are all tech leaders with a vision to play a strategic part in a team like ours to build technology tools that better address the wider needs of your communities. You are all potential leaders for our software development group that will add real value to our investee companies and other companies around the UK and, and beyond that. But enough about us. So for the 2021 Tech Disruptor Award, we have the pleasure of working with Code First Girls to identify an amazing recipient. 
and I've already met her earlier on today and had a chat with her, and she's got her seal of approval as well. <coughs> she's an active Code First Girls member, having completed two courses, uh, Web Development and Data, and no doubt to assist with her very own startup project. And she's about to advance her career in technology with her role at Publicis Sapient as a Junior Associate Product Manager. The candidate has also demonstrated her strength as a tech disruptor, which we are seeing um, as someone who is a bit of a visionary, someone who can identify a problem and see a novel solution, but more practically also put her thoughts into action, so executing as well as actually thinking about it. So it's like unlocking new value and upsetting the traditional way of addressing a market sector or segment that may be a little bit too old school. Old school being what you see in front of you. <laughs> <coughs> and this is exactly what our award recipient has done with launching Unimate during university, leading all aspects of the research, design, initial coding, product management, business and finance, building a small team, can I say it's more than a CEO, <laughs> and continue to, um, to build up the offer. It's a great idea born out of frustration with existing methods of calculating grades at university. Quite an impressive career so far, and she's only just started. So the tech disruptor has also won this year's 2021 King's College London Idea Factory competition and has grown the app to over 13,000 customers since November 2020. So she's catching up, catching up here. The winner of the 2021 Code First Girls Tech Disruptor Award is Charlotte Gray. The mic, I think you should say a few comments. Um, so I just want to say thanks to Code First Girls. When I took part in the web development course last January, I had no idea what coding really was. And after doing that, I was like, oh, you know what? Let me try app development. And then a few months later, launched my own app. So yeah, Nate, thank you for doing what you're doing. And also thanks to, they're not here today, but my two other co-founders, all female teams. So yeah, we're trying to change the education industry, but also show that girls can code. <laughs> so and, thank you so much. And the entrepreneurs and business owners, Exactly, right? yeah, 100%. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my mic runners. Come on, guys. We need more Coca-Cola. <laughs> Unlike Ronaldo, I won't send stock prices spinning. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the next award. <laughs> oh, the next award is not sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> it's actually, uh, this, I, I love this one. Um, <laughs> this is the Future Leader Award. Um, this is sponsored by GCHQ, MI5 and MI6. Ooh, oh. <laughs> uh, you may or, or may not know uh, that Code First Girls um, started working this year with GCHQ, um, which, you know, is, is an incredibly important relationship with us. Um, <laughs> and incidentally, it actually says on, on my notes here that I've just been given, um, if you don't know, MI5, MI6 and GCHQ are collectively known as the intelligence agencies. So if you didn't know that, and you didn't have Wikipedia or Google, you've heard it from me. <laughs> like, that's as much as I can give. Uh, due to the secrecy of working for them, unfortunately, they cannot join us in person today. <laughs> but that's okay, because they've got me. <laughs> and you know what I am? I am a conduit for GCHQ, MI5 and MI6, all three wrapped into one. Um, and they've sent some really, really kind words uh, about the winner of this award. So MI5, MI6 and GCHQ are really excited to be sponsoring the Future Leaders Award as it is one particularly close to their hearts. Technology has a crucial part to play in helping us protect the UK. So we are really pleased that Code First Girls are recognising someone who has excelled in developing their own technical and leadership capability and someone who has contributed to the wider cyber community, which inspires others to develop new skills, skills which we recognize as being critical to fostering a culture of cutting edge innovation and creativity in the UK. The winner of this award has demonstrated passion, enthusiasm and dedication to helping others and is a true role model for many. 
We wish them all the best and congratulations again on inspiring so many as a future leader. So the GCHQ MI5, MI6, by the way, whoever gets this on their CV, <laughs> like, uh, talk to me. See, I, I want to know what this does for you. Uh, future Leader Award is Catherine Jackson. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. There you go. Wow. You're safe, you're well. Thank you so much, Anna and everyone. Um, I'd just like to say such a big thank you to Cope First Girls. I think I took my first course in 2018. Um, and it's just so wonderful to see the organisation grow from strength to strength since then. Um, and I'm also here today graduating from the nano degree. So I'm so excited to be graduating from that and also onboarding to the cabinet office um, with the role that um, I got through Covers Girls and the nano degree. So. I mean, could you, could you be the, the Catherine? Could you be any hotter property right now? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well. So just uh, casually, the cabinet office, you know, it's fantastic. How, are you, how do you feel about taking on this role? Because uh, the feedback that we got from the cabinet office about you is that they were absolutely raving about you and other fellow candidates that got uh, placed at the cabinet office this year. Are you excited to take this on? You're a little bit nervous. Well, I've been speaking to my um, future team leader, um, and I'm actually joining an all-female team. Um, I think there's four or five of us. And just how amazing is that that just a random group, or, well, not random, but you know, a sort of selection of four or five people from working in the cabinet office happen to all be female. Um, and it's about time, right, how many teams have been all male in the past. So I guess, yeah, I'm just really excited to get started. I think I'm starting in a couple of weeks. So. And you got an amazing grade, I'm guessing, in the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you did, yeah. yeah. So. You, got, you got a distinction, didn't you? Uh, so yeah, 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 you yeah. did. You got a distinction <laughs> as well. I mean, yeah. um, but amazing. <laughs> any, any more words? Any more last? No? Um. <laughs> but we'll let's hear it for Catherine. <laughs> oh, who is going to follow that? Oh, I know who's going to follow that. And she is going to be absolutely amazing. Janine is going to follow that. <laughs> yep, yep. Janine from Avast is going to be sponsoring the Tech Mentor Award. And I reckon, I reckon you can, you know, you can do this one. Come on. I mean, I'm not a CEO of the company, <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, it's such an honor to present this award. Um, the winner of the Tech Mentor Award this year has joined Code First Girls as a fellow and continued to mentor Code First Girls community through teaching, the Kickstarter and Career Searcher course, and much more. Um, she's currently a mentor for the current fellowship cohort and is sharing her experiences as a Code First Girl fellow alumni. So teaching Code First Girls courses and her career as a creative technologist. She's a very impressive leader in the CFG community and certainly one to watch. And I would love to present this award to Rihanna Sultan. Is she doing it? Well done! Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, thank you very much uh, to you as well, to Code First Girls. Um, I also have no speech prepared, but um, a little story. I took my first ever coding course three and a half years ago in this exact same location, level 39, um, three and a half years ago. Did I mention that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wrote my first Hello World. Um, and I was super proud of myself, so I'm very happy to be standing here and thank you very much uh, for having me. Where are you today? What are you doing today? Um, so I teach coding to kids and to adults, um, but I, um, I combine different disciplines. So I teach robotics um, and coding by making a random art generator and um, all these kind of um, creative things, I guess. Uh, so musical technology by creating a gesture-controlled glove. Um, so it's like it's, it's very it's very much educational, very much creative, and very much technical. And it sounds like you get so much from giving back. Yes, I do. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. That's <laughs> Thank you, Janine. Cheers. Okay, we have, we have one last award. This mic is driving me mad. We have one last award. And it is the most important award of the night. <laughs> can, I, can you just come with me? <laughs> just everywhere I go, just like getting on the tube, just make those sound effects. Wonderful. Um, this award is uh, Outstanding Contribution to Code First Girls and Technology Education. Now, this award has been decided by uh, the Co Code First Girls team uh, and with all the feedback uh, that we've received along the way from many, many candidates and also partners. Now, a lot goes on at Code First Girls. A lot goes on behind the, the scenes, uh, and I'd like to actually thank the team today because so much has gone on behind the scenes. But I think this award in particular does recognise some behaviour that happens behind the scenes that's incredibly important to what we do. In terms of the amount of time that individuals give back, I mean, really, it is absolutely astonishing the number of women that give time back to our community. And you know what? They don't want to be paid for it. You can't put a value on it. They give back their time, and that is something that we should be forever grateful for. Not only is this woman one of the most talented individuals I've ever met, she is also the most creative and one of the most humble. Without this person, the nano degree would not even be possible. Can we please invite Olia Nichols on stage? for the most outstanding contribution to Code First Girls and technology education. Does Alex want to come on stage? Yeah. And a Ale her husband's here, so I think Alex should come on stage as well. Come on, Alex. Whoa. Let's hear it for the husbands. So, um, oh my gosh. Um, Olia, we have for you and, and for Alex, um, right, you. this, don't worry, we'll get you a better certificate. But by the way, uh, Olia's daughter, who's an incredibly talented designer, also designed your nano degree certificate. So that's a mock-up. We'll have a proper one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this is for you guys to have a holiday. Oh, oh <laughs> Hotels.com. Oh, you. Okay. You're welcome. Sorry. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. I think my heart is really, really racing right now. But um, it's so amazing to meet all of you tonight, the students, the instructors. Um, I really hope that your careers would just, you know, develop and took you to all the places. Um, we, I guess, together, it, sorry, I'm, I haven't prepared the speech. <laughs> you didn't even know you were getting I the award. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I just remember it, it was a little bit more than a year ago, um, myself and the team and Anna were discussing that it would be fantastic to create and write the nano degree and all the content and get the students and get an opportunity to different women from different backgrounds to study coding, engineering, data science and um, get, you know, fantastic employment. And the past year, it was quite something. Um, I guess my family didn't see me. Our kids didn't see us. They were saying, oh my God, mom is still working, still after, you know, till 1, 2, 3 a.m. sometimes with um, <laughs> red eyes. And, um, but I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that um, uh, it all worked out. Um, you know, we're always there. Many more fantastic projects uh, to launch, and we we always can give back um, to share the knowledge, share everything that we know. I'm happy to talk to all of you tonight, and you know, hear your stories. And the CFG team is truly like like a family now. <laughs> but thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, and congratulations to all graduates tonight. Well done, guys. Well done. Sorry, we had to surprise you. So um, I love the fact that so I, I phoned earlier up about a year ago, and I was like, well, I've got this idea. Hear me out. It's going to sound crazy. <laughs> I want to get like a 1,000 women into jobs. 
like over the next 18 months. And we're going to do it, and it, it's going to be fantastic. How are we going to get 1,000 women into jobs? What type of education programs do we need to put together, and how do we align this to industry? And before we know it, everything's born. The nanny degree is born. All of a sudden, we, we uh, can get partners buying in, and we can get job offers for you, and we can actually start making a tangible difference, which is, let's be honest, getting you into your first role in technology. Not talking about it, not you know, telling you like the, the tips, which has been fantastic, but we actually want to get you in. We want to make an actionable, tangible difference. We want to stop talking about the problem, and we want to do something about the problem. And that's what Code First Girls represents. It's about action, and it's about doing, and it's about collective action, and all of you are involved in that, whether it's the community or our partners. Which brings me on to the Nana Degree Graduation Ceremony. <laughs> break. Right, we're going to take a couple of minutes break, because I need some water. That wasn't in the schedule, but we'll, we'll, we'll work with it. <laughs> so give us five minutes and we'll be back for the Nana Graduation Ceremony.
We're really close. We're really close to the end. We're really close to the party. I've just had a look next door. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't been next door yet, it's probably the most, one of the most spectacular views of London uh, I've ever seen. Um, but yeah, next door, there's going to be an open bar. Uh, <laughs> I literally just need this in my life. <laughs> I might just start just sponsoring the whole bar just to get this reaction <laughs> normally. <laughs> so it's going to be an open bar. There's going to be um, food as well, uh, and we've got a DJ uh, through there. <laughs> right. So we had we had like we had pre-booked a DJ, and I'm really sad because I didn't know Janine was a DJ. <laughs> but but hear me out. What I propose is that Janine collaborates with the Code First Girls DJ and just mash it up. <laughs> yeah? Great, all sorted. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I just want to say that it's so nice to see uh, so many people here today for the ceremony. So we had so many requests. Uh, and by the way, you may or may not have noticed there's been about 400 women coming through here today, just through different segments and rotating at different times, uh, which has been a wonderful logistical challenge for us to manage. Um, but what's really nice is we had loads of requests for the nano degree for family members to attend and partners to attend, um, mums, and I can, I can see, I, can, I, I bumped into a couple in the toilet. It's, it's so exciting that we have so many family members supporting uh, the Code First Girls community as well which is great. So, um, our first proper nano degree cohort, there were 11 partners involved in this cohort. 120 candidates won places on the nano degree. Now, you may or may not know this, but we received well over 600 applications for those 120 places. So, we're working on a ratio of six applicants for every one place. And there were some exceptional applicants that we couldn't um, provide for in this cohort, but we want to provide for in future uh, cohorts. Now, as you will all know, because the majority of you have studied it, this has been an intense uh, 12 weeks, 13 weeks now, I believe, with a, with a reading reek involved, uh, where you've specialised in either data or software. And where possible, we have linked all of these nano degree places to jobs. Uh, and a lot of your future employers are here today to present the degree and, and, and talk about why they decided to, to uh, sponsor this. Right, so we'll be announcing the partners in alphabetical order. Um, if you can be ready to come on stage in your cohorts based on, on your employer or your sponsor, to collect your certificate. Um, we did actually really invest quite a lot of money in paying for the amazing certificates to be printed. But apparently uh, DPD, D DPD doesn't know where Canary Wharf is. <laughs> so if you could get your phones out <laughs> and start tweeting that it's the second tallest building in London, just to help them out, that would be great. <laughs> just, just to let them know. Right, <laughs> so as we call out your, your employer, your, your sponsor, um, if you could, if, you, if you've completed that nanny degree, if you could come and line up on the right-hand side of the room near the exits, uh, ready to collect. Uh, and please, from the audience, uh, you're doing great. I'm, I'm loving this energy. But if we could have applause at the end of each partner when I cue you in, that would be great. Otherwise, what you do, what would happen is what happened at my graduation ceremony, which was just continuous clapping. <laughs> and by the end of it, your hands hurt so much <laughs> that you just don't know what to do with yourself. So um, <laughs> we're going to go in alphabetical order to our first sponsoring uh, nanny degree partner that also so happens to be our lead sponsor for today. What are the chances? Now, Janine, I'm thinking about giving you a job at Code First Girls. Do you want to become a member of our team? I think you've become an adopted member of our team. Um, so please welcome back on stage uh, Janine to uh, present uh, the advanced nanny degree graduate candidate. At this point, I'm 
point, you probably think I'm the only employee out of us. <laughs> no one else is here. Just kidding. Olivia's here. Um, yeah, so this has been such an exciting collaboration with Code First Girls. And honestly, whenever we were considering sponsoring the nano degree, this was something that we didn't even have to think twice about because um, it meant everything to us to be able to provide um, that sponsorship and education to help um, five amazing candidates to learn about software engineering and I've met every single one of them and they're incredible and super super inspiring. I feel extremely underqualified to, to even do this and stand here. Um, so yeah, um, that's basically all I have to say. Do I have to say their names or? No, no, you okay. don't. We've got somebody reading okay, out cool. names. Okay. Um, so if we, if Rebecca, could you could you Hi. please? Can you hear me? I'm here to read names. So can they, <laughs> <laughs> can they, can they have asked candidates please come and line up? Come on guys, make yeah. yourself. Oh my God. Okay. Guys, you seem to be going towards the back. It's, it's. <laughs> It's so amazing to see you in person because we've just been like on video calls these past 12 weeks. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. Amazing, so. We'll start with Faiza Malik. She's not here. Well, we'll keep reading, we'll keep Woo! reading, it's all right. Hold <laughs> well on, Heather Cartwright. Yeah! <laughs> Stravia Bettina. <laughs> Woo! Oh, if you wanna. I can't clap, sorry. Congratulations. Yep. We're, a photo. We're doing a photo. Woo! <laughs> Thank you very much. And Zoe Scott. Thank you so much. Woo! Oh, we have to have a photo. I'm sorry. Oh. There you go. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. I can see my continuous clapping thing. Just, just. I think just do whatever feels instinctive. If you want to clap, you clap away. Fantastic. Um, so uh, next in alphabetical order of our sponsoring partners, we have Aviva. Uh, Aviva have sponsored seven candidates this year uh, for their software graduate pathways within Aviva. Uh, Aviva couldn't be with us here today, but can I ask the Aviva candidates to come and line up, please? It looks like we have two. Okay, cool. I don't know which two you are, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> Ange Gakwaya? No, no two, oh. two. Okay. Bosa Kenosi. <laughs> Hafsa Ali. Woo! Woo! Congratulations. Katie Hannah. Najma Hersey and Teresa Diaz Calvo. As you can tell, Rebecca speaks six languages. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, the next uh, set of uh, Nigerian candidates are Bank of America, uh, which is a very large cohort. Like, I'm expecting you all to stand up at this point. Can the Bank of America? Um, amazing, right, so Bank of America um, actually funded 30 women. Oh. <laughs> that was almost as big as the free bar. <laughs> yeah, uh, so amazing from Bank of America. Um, and we've got a message from, from Bank of America, uh, and this, this comes from Selena Pavan. Uh, who is one of our long-standing advocates at the bank. Selena says, congratulations to all the nanny degree scholars graduating today, but especially our Bank of America scholars. We wish we could be there with you to celebrate this amazing achievement, but we are here with you in spirit. <laughs> if anyone sees Bank of America in spirit, <laughs> please tell me what it looks like. I'm sure it looks amazing. <laughs> We're immensely proud that the Bank of America teams across technology, 
data innovation and quants work together to make the sponsorship of 1,200 massive open online course places, 420 uh, places in classrooms, and 30 nano degree scholars in a single year. Thanks also goes to the fantastic CFG nano degree instructors and the CFG program team to make this dream of a nano degree course happen. This effort underlines our investing in women initiative and we're extremely pleased on how the partnership with Code First Girls continues to flourish and opening doors of opportunities for more women. So we are going to read out. I believe the people just starred are here, if that okay. helps. Should I just read the ones that I are think here? so, yeah. Should we not clap for the ones that didn't come? I <laughs> <laughs> I'll read them all. Yeah. All right, we'll clap for the ones that didn't You're come. You're worth it. Okay, ready. <laughs> all right, so, uh, Abena Adu Ofe, data. <laughs> Anisha Shrestha, data. Anushka, uh, sorry, yeah, Anushka Gupta, data. <laughs> Ashley Somondo, data. <laughs> Catherine Phillips, software. <laughs> Chloe Kura, data. Congratulations. <laughs> Greta Mazelite, software. Irina Matescu, data. <laughs> Jumoke Odomosu, data. <laughs> Margaret Onakoya, data. <laughs> I feel like I'm just making you all clap. <laughs> Sorry. Maria Margarita Martescu, software. <laughs> Mayumi Pacheco Hamaoka, data. <laughs> Meg Davies, software. <laughs> Michaela Dmelo, software. <laughs> Mimosa Serge Nulai, data. <laughs> Monica Irving, data. <laughs> oh. Congratulations. Noor Syed, data. Noshim Masood, software. <laughs> Oludare Soniran, data. <laughs> Ola Kramp, data. <laughs> Patricia Pedro, data. <laughs> Shaylee Patel, software. <laughs> Simone, Simone uh, Artistide Oke, data. Woo! Titirat, uh, my, hang on. Mikawe, no, Michao Kunchon, data. <laughs> Wing Ting Mei Ho, software. Amazing, amazing, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Do you need a, do you, do you need a minute? Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, um, so the next, um, the next uh, company that we have that uh, sponsored Nano Degree Places this year uh, is BT. Uh, can the BT software graduates please come up to the right? Again, BT, BT sponsored a lot of places. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, amazing. Okay, so, Amanda Mandiki. Woo! <laughs> Becky Sorsby. Well done. Thank you. Bora Kim. <laughs> Eleanor Briley. Emily Wood. Congratulations. Woo! Oh, nice t-shirt. 
So, very nice T-shirt. Fatma El. Halina Maslak. Nina Krasteva. Ola Ajibola. Robin Seymour Jones. And Shuyan Liu. Fantastic. Right. The next sponsoring company is the Cabinet Office. Um, so the Cabinet Office have, um, again, worked with Code First Girls uh, this year and I think are sponsoring even more places. They were so impressed uh, by the candidates they received. Uh, and the Chief Data Officer, some of the things that he said about the candidates was absolutely unbelievable. Um, so can the Cabinet Office candidates please line up on the right? We have one. <laughs> You all know her. Yeah. Catherine Jackson, data. <laughs> Woo! Woo! There are a few more. But, um, well Mariam Lulat, software. <laughs> Phoebe Fryer, data. Rabia Tanwir, software. And Samantha Martel, data. Right. Um, now we have the Code First Girls sponsored places. Now, the Code First Girls sponsor places are where we have recognised some exceptional talent. And for whatever reason, we just at that point in time couldn't find you a sponsoring company. But we felt you had such high potential that we wanted to sponsor um, ourselves. So, this is the Code First Girls cohort. Fantastic. <laughs> of which we have one representative. But what a representative, right? Two. 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 Oh, I'm so... Do you know, this is awful. So, for, oh, <laughs> so Pat Patricia in our team, by the way, and before she started, she actually did the nano degree. Um, so just, Patricia in our team is also graduating today because code first. Finished. Yeah, and uh, it was good, wasn't it? You enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you still want to work at Code First Girls and don't want to become a yeah. software developer or data, yeah, data woods. Still want to work with us. Great, wonderful. <laughs> so, without further ado, the Code First Girls candidates. Woo. Sorry. Okay. Anna Colbasco, data. Woo. Asha Nair, data. Woo. Woo. Eli Tamasevi, software. <laughs> Amazing. Well done. Faika Haider, software. Well done. Congratulations. Hannah Cannon, well software. Mary Onyarayonwu, data. Monica Chadha, data. Nicole Chan, software. Nina Ma, software. Well done, Nina. Well Patricia done. Perez Simpson, software. Well done. Congratulations, all right? Sally Hughes, well done, data. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Congratulations. Okay. The next sponsoring company uh, is present, which is fantastic. Where is DAZN? Oh, we've got DAZN, amazing. Um, so uh, DAZN um, sponsored, and I believe offered positions for software uh, candidates this year. Uh, and it's my great um, pleasure to invite Cynthia. Uh, is it Cynthia? I'm so sorry. Yeah, Cynthia to the stage. Cynthia from DAZN. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today because my career in tech also started with Code First Girls. I joined Code First Girls as a student, then I became an instructor with the help of Emily. So I'm really happy to be here today. And on behalf of Don, I would like to congratulate our graduates and say that we are 100% sure that the three of you will succeed in your careers 100%.
Congratulations. Okay. Abigail Wilson. Ava Caragosa. Janine Yates. Well done. Well done. And Julie Liu. Well done. Well done. Huge congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Big congratulations. I whispered that, didn't I? But you all heard it. That's awkward. Right. Um, next, we have a, a partner that's growing, going from strength to strength that uh, we really devalue within the community. Um, I would uh, like to invite on stage uh, Mabina on behalf of Deloitte. Mabina. Woo! Uh, and Deloitte this year uh, has sponsored numerous software and degree uh, candidates. Uh, and they will also be sponsoring another cohort, in, literally in the next cohort, and probably the one after, yes. and the one after that for the rest of time. We're in for the long run. You're in for the long run. So, I, I'll give the floor to you. Great, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you here today for inspiring me. I can't remember the last time I felt inspired as an individual, as a woman, um, as I felt coming into this space today. Um, a really big congratulations to every single one of you. I really look forward to meeting and working with those of you that are coming to Deloitte. Um, if you're wondering about the American accent, I am from, or I used to live in New York, and I'm now based in um, London. Um, honestly, you are, um, you're, you're, I looked through the curriculum, and it's kind of intimidating, right? Um, it really is. Uh, so <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> As intimidating as this, or? Um, I think more intimidating Would you prefer this. to do the nanny degree or this? I would prefer to do this. Oh, perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great, great. We want to make it fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Mabina. Am I? No, you can stay and congratulate the candidates. <laughs> okay. So, software. Anissa Suhail. Woo! <laughs> Ana Luisa Hickman Casara. Chidera Onyoku. Imogen Eddings. Isabella Thompson. Well done. Well done. Leondra Kufas Vinei. Melanie Titley. Well done. Well done. Saman Kashif and Yasmin Saim. Well done to the Deloitte candidates and Medina. Thank you so much thank for being you, here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are your hands getting tired yet? You're okay. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Don't worry. The party's almost happening. It's almost here. Right. Uh, so uh, GCHQ. Uh, like I explained earlier, has sponsored a lot of uh, software candidates this year at Code First Girls. Um, as mentioned, GCHQ couldn't be here, uh, but that's okay. Uh, could I ask the GCHQ candidates to come to the right, please? Artisha Selakana Baraja. Alexandra Simon Lewis. Well done. Woo! Thank you. Amelia Burton. Woo! Anna Robertson. Congratulations. Well done. Charu Guerra. Funmilare Fanagan. Woo! Joanna Baker. Woo! Johanna Doherty. Karen Deep Kaur. <laughs> Lana Maroney. Congratulations, very well. Niveta Kam uh, Kamala Turai. Well 
Well Radwinda Bateau. Woo! Congratulations, you. really well done. And Whitney Ikenwith. Done. Okay, we have next Nat West. Another another member of the Code First Girls team. I'm feeling <laughs> um, wonderful. So I'm going to um, pass on to uh, Jan uh, and Nat West. Sponsored oh numerous degrees. Yeah. Oh, look at the representation for Nat West. because this is the first year that we've partnered with Code First Girls. It's the first year that we've sponsored Nano Degrees. And it's, it's hugely exciting for us because, I mean, just looking around the room, you know, congratulations to everyone who has been part of this cohort. I mean, what an achievement to go through that 12 weeks of intensive learning. Um, and I'm really excited for, for you all because uh, I'm going to be seeing you in the office very soon. And we're going to be working together some, on some really exciting projects. Um, and as an organisation, we encourage lifelong learning. We're a learning organisation. You know, the learning journey doesn't stop here. It's just going to continue to be an amazing journey for you all as you get more experience and learn even more courses once you um, come into NatWest as well. So congratulations, all of you. Domicili okay. Mutuma Software. Woo! Heidi Popovic, software. <laughs> Hodan Abdullahi. Well done, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's all right. Kara Howard, software. Congratulations, well done. Lakshika well done. Juneja, software. Congratulations, so well much. done. Thank you. Laura Pennycook, data. Congratulations, well done. Myrtle Lambert, software. <laughs> Nadine Shallow, data. Woo! 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 Rachel Evans, software. Woo! Well done. Rosalind Grubin, software. Sarah Yandel, software. <laughs> Sylvia Sudua Kuruge, data. <laughs> and Vanessa Huerboy, software. much since COVID. <laughs> that, was, that was really nice, yeah. I'm, I'm pro-hugging. Pro <laughs> you're all right, you're all right. Double jabs, we're fine. Right, um, we're going to move uh, to Rolls-Royce now, who we heard from earlier. Um, Rolls-Royce uh, sponsored a range of data and software roles, and as you heard from earlier today, uh, a lot more to come. Um, not just in the UK, but also in the USA as well. Um, so unfortunately, Rolls-Royce couldn't stay. Um, but this is a, a speech prepared by uh, Manisha Mystery, who you met earlier on today. Congratulations on such a fantastic achievement. We know this nano degree will not, uh, sorry, will have not just tested your technical understanding and capacity to learn, but also your flexibility and personal commitment to complete. We cannot wait to hear and see how you will bring your newfound capability into action within Rolls-Royce and beyond, and hope you continue to stay connected to the Code First Girls uh, to champion the amazing community you are now a part of. How many Rolls-Royce candidates? We have one Rolls-Royce candidate here. Fantastic. We have one, but an amazing one. one yeah, one in person, which is Ellie Lilliet, Data. Woo! Rebecca Hallows, Data. Well done. Well done. Mywase Tembo, USA, Data. And Stanislava Kutyepov, 
data, also, sorry, software, USA. <laughs> Fantastic. I think is that we've come to the last of the companies in the in, so. in the roll call. Wow, I'm 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 losing count. You know what that means? <laughs> that, that's that's an open bar. That means it's it's party time. <laughs> yeah? That we've had two Bank America graduates arrive. We've had two Bank of America graduates arrive. Not just in spirit, in real life. <laughs> the Bank of America graduates that, that have just arrived. They want to come up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we need to keep that going. Come on, everyone. Woo! 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 Just point to which one. Okay, so we're going to start with Jamoke Odumosu. <laughs> and Maria Margarita Bartescu. Thank you. Oh, the train was late, no problem. No problem at all. It's London. Those trains. We're almost a step closer to the party now. Um, so I just have some closing remarks. Um, thank you so much to our lead sponsor uh, from day two, uh, Avast, uh, which was fantastic, and all of the speakers that have taken a part, and equally the community for coming along, all of the nanny degree candidates and the award winners. Um, Code First Girls is actually showcasing um, the 2022 product launch which is what Code First Girls will look like in 2022 on the 21st of September. <laughs> I didn't get like a, ooh. <laughs> I know, you can't contain yourselves. I get it, neither can I. <laughs> but uh, this does promise some um, really exciting uh, product innovation, both in terms of the curriculum, so what we can offer you as a community, uh, but equally what we can offer our clients as well. Um, just to remind you all, you know, I hope you've been inspired by the nano degree candidates today and the fantastic jobs they've been able to secure. Um, our nano degree applications um, uh, for spring 2022 are opening at the end of the year. So if you want to get involved, uh, now's the time. A huge thank you to everyone in the room, and let's go and have a party, please. Woo!